际论坛。呃，不好意思打扰您，就是您的头像好像没有开，就是 video 没有开。好，李玲，嗯，你检查一下，开了吗？现在可以了、yes. 是吧 ？Yes， 对对。OK， great， 呃。那我就继续啊，就说呃，声音刚才没有问题、嗯、是吧？嗯，对，声音是没有问题的，对吧？声音没有问题，呃，我很完美，嗯。好，那个呃呃，刚才我讲的是，因为我们在一个过度技术化的这么一个时代呢，我们前所未有的呢，觉得这个就是说需要呢再次的这个启蒙，需要呢就是说再一次的这个唤醒。所以呢，就说是，哎，我们把那个艺术和人工智能呢，就说，呃，放在一起呢，做了一个这么实验室。那么我自己觉得呢，就是说今天呢，我们的这个论坛的这个主题，那非常完美的这个诠释了啊，就说是怎么做。那个，呃，一方面就说是对。这个时代来去讲的话，对艺术来去讲的话，那事实上就是说，我们不停的是需要呢去找到那个新的那个 new motivations of perception. So previously, be it art or design, we were always trying to find our root in design. In the past two years, in 2019, actually, when we were founded, uh, uh, everyone was uh, uh, memorizing. The centuries、uh, anniversary of Bauhaus, and、uh, everyone was trying to find、uh, their own disciplinary route. So I think、uh, this form is very interesting. In that,、um, actually, together with the、uh, celebration of the centennial anniversary of Bauhaus,、uh, it was actually the very the, the, simultaneously the very important founding. Uh, period of uh, relative uh, relativism and quantum mechanics, which were also the、uh, forerunner of physics of the 20th century. So I think、uh, quantum physics, although it's quite advanced, but it's very important for us. Without quantum me mechanics, we can't even imagine that、um, we can have such a online. A、uh, meeting, a virtual meeting, is is something unimaginable. A century, a century ago, when the Bauhaus was founded, we could still remember that、uh, there were many、uh, movements back then, and、uh, we we a group of scientists were trying to discover. The truth about this world, so it has shed much light in our realm of design and art. So I think,、uh, as far as、uh, art is concerned, there are so many turning points that in which we need to、uh, look to、uh, technology for inspiration. For example, in the years of Renaissance, people combined、uh, medicine and、uh, dichotomy. To art and the uh, uh, giving to birth of、uh, impressionism was also、uh, simultaneously with the、uh, development of the new development of、uh, color. People can put uh, their uh, pastes of、uh, color into tubes, and they can bring the color with them, and they can draw it wherever they want. So nowadays, we are looking for. A new developments in art and design. We need to look to art, at technology for inspiration, as before. So actually, this is something quite traditional. So this is also、uh, the theme of our uh, uh, forum: quantum, quantum, quantum. Actually, we are looking to the most mysterious or blurry part to to, to the average person, and to try to discover. Whether it could shed some light or inspiration for art and design, and、uh, second, I think on the one hand we need to look to technology for inspiration for art and design. On the other hand, we, we need to mention another tradition in that in the era of、uh, Renaissance. 
they were saying that they were uh, reviving the spirit and the signs of ancient Greek and Rome. But actually, in reality, this uh, reason or excuse is not, not the real truth of a movement. This is how I understood uh, Renaissance. So he, this time, when we want to use the name of quantum to look for uh, inspiration, but actually that might not be the core of our discussion. We think uh, quantum is really similar to uh, Greece back in the age of Renaissance. Our fundamental uh, theme is the second part, is that uh, the artificial creation or imagination. Uh, I think uh, between technology and human beings, is technology enslaving human? Or is it that humans should, should uh, actively uh, embrace technology? If it's the first uh, scenario, according to what Lao Tzu said, uh, we do not need all these development. We need to go back to doing nothing. We don't need any advancement and go back to the, the, the time when we are children. We are a baby. On the, other, on the other hand, then, we can be more active to treat technologies. Actually, uh, all the technologies, if we can find the positive part of it, and to embrace it, then the disasters we fear won't really come. And actually, we can uh, open up and train different aspects of our potentials and abilities by these technologies. And uh, in a book, it is mentioned that uh, nowadays, the development of technology based on the uh, network of knowledge at least the human beings can have a better idea of fairness and the agriculture can uh, be, uh, have access to technology even in the remote areas in this contemporary world. And we want to train our creativity. We should have a more possibility. We want to coexist with new science and technology and have more meaningful discussions so that our art and design can find a more powerful driver for development. And in this process, how can we find or let art and design to, to talk on behalf of humanity, then it can do a better job. So together, Let's look forward to the wonderful presentations and discussions in our forum. And I hope such discussions won't stay on the level of possibilities and theories. But after the, the, the training of uh, qu quantum training, then we can have the ability to face uh, the variety of problems created by the uh, industrial age, for example, climate change, pollution, and the uh, crisis of humanities, all these have been cre created by the industrial revolution. Then if we want to uh, counteract, to resist all these uh, negative uh, impacts of industrial revolution, and then quantum at least give us a possibility, offers us some space for imagination.
please turn yeah. turn on your yeah yeah <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so good morning. My warmest welcome to the speakers and to the audience. I hope that the audience is going to be a rich audience. Um, I'm glad to open the second edition of the International AI Art Conference together with my colleagues, uh, Professor Costas Tercidis and Professor Gian Jogel co-organized, as Ms. Lee just said, by the College of uh, Design and Innovation at Tongji University and by the AI Art Center. My name is uh, Filippo. Uh, you can uh, call me simply Filippo, I think it's uh, easier. And uh, as I said, I am one of the three organizers of the conference. In our view, okay, when we think about uh, AI, we think about AI as a label standing for artificial intelligence. In our view, AI stands for, at least in this case, artificial imagination. And uh, artificial imagination will be the main topic of the 2022 edition of this conference. We will start from uh, Schrodinger's cat tooth experiment for arriving at the paradox, or better to say, at the paradoxes of quantum superposition. We believe that the power of quantum computation, together with the power of artificial intelligence, will allow us to make accessible the ontologically inaccessible. In this uh, framework, therefore, creating will be, first of all, discovering, discovering, discovering a reality simply inaccessible to us. And uh, as in the case of quantum mechanics, the artist will play a very specific role, at least from our point of view. The artist will be the observer collapsing hundreds of thousands of works, artworks, generated by the AI quantum computing platform in just one work. It's exactly, by the way, what is going to happen in quantum mechanics. But as soon as I make a statement of this kind, a number of questions appear immediately on the background. And I'm sure that uh, my colleagues uh, will uh, uh, talk about these issues. And I'm sure that the speakers as well, the distinguished speakers of this conference will talk as well about all these issues, all these questions that come from a statement of this kind. Our speakers come from different fields including art, design, curatorial practice, and academic words, world. I, I personally wish a rich and creative discussion between the speakers, the moderators, the moderators of the panels, and the audience with the goal of um, having a 2022 International AI Art Conference even more successful than the previous edition. And I will use um, a Latin expression for closing my introduction. Mm -hmm. And the Latin expression is ad maiora. Ad maiora means looking forward for greater and greater outcomes. Thanks to everybody for uh, being here. Thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, You're Kasas, welcome. please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for attending this um, special conference. Uh, my name is Kostas, as uh, 
as she said, uh, together with my two colleagues, uh, Filippo and Danzuzi, we have put together this, um, I like to call it an assemblage of ideas, people, and events under the general title, uh, Artificial Imagination and Quantum. Let me offer you a little bit of a deep thought here. Well, quantum is not only an area in physics, but also it can be seen as a way of thinking. One of the strangest concepts in quantum mechanics is um, that a particle can exist and not exist at the same time. Now, this may sound, this phenomenon may sound very strange to most of you, but in a way, it's something that we experience almost every day. How many times are we split between wanting something and not wanting something, having something but not having it, being and not being? Uh, our recent lockdown that we're going through in Shanghai right now is one such extreme experience. We are and we're not. We exist and we don't exist. We're about to get out and we're not out. We have and we don't have. Now, in the context of art, the same thing would be, how would you feel if you were artist and artifact at the same time? Both being original and a copy together. Being yourself and a reflection of yourself. Subjective and objective together. In this context, art can only be understood through AI. Not AI as in artificial intelligence, but AI as in artificial imagination. Instead of human imagination, can artificial imagination imagine the unimaginable? In this conference, we would like to explore the definition, possibility, and potential of artificial imagination. How can we imagine what we cannot conceive? How can something be capable of imagination and yet not be human? For whom is AI intended anyway? So with our distinguished speakers today and tomorrow, we would like to explore possible connections between AI and art. AI appears really as if it, come, it, it has come out of nowhere, but hasn't it already been with us all the time? Is it possible that AI is the other way to imagine the future? Well, let's wait, hope, and see. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Thank you, Costas. Uh, Zhang Zhongjie, please. Okay, uh, hello, uh, hello, and uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, 大家好, I will speak in Mandarin as well. Uh, 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 AI艺术与人工智能国际会议 还好，我们还有这个虚拟的世界和线上的世界。那么，我们还可以共同探讨未来。那么，当下我们的这个现实世界其实，嗯，特别是物理世界，其实越越来越感觉到一种不变，或者说一种困难吧。啊，呃，那
AI and how to make full use of the intelligent algorithm and the questions they are going to bring us. That is the main purpose for us to discuss and the reason why we organize this event in the first place. I'm very much looking forward to this forum and refreshing our knowledge together with you. Thank you. College of Design and Innovation and the director of the Sustainable AI Lab. He is also affiliated to the National Research Council Italy. Please join me in welcoming Filippo. Filippo, okay. now you can yeah. share your screen. Yeah. Sure. Um. Give me a second. Yeah, sure. You see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So let's enter immediately into the main topic of this conference. Quantum tales means quantum imagination and uh, quantum computing is going to be in the next future the platform on which most of the AI applications will run. It will be a revolution from a political, social, and economic point of view. It will be a revolution because we are going to conjugate or associate two powerful ideas, two powerful concepts, one, on one side the concept of quantum computing and on the other side the, quant the concept of AI. My talk has been inspired by two papers of mine. Um, the first one, you can have a look at the paper, um, together with uh, Professor Tercidis and Professor Lee, has been published on a journal called AI and Society. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, basically a philosophical paper. But let me move to the second one. The second one has been already accepted and is going to be published on a journal called Journal of Neural Networks. Probably the Journal of Neural Networks is the most important journal today concerning artificial intelligence. You can see it's a very technical paper related to quantum neural networks, which are a sort of uh, neural network architecture that can run on quantum platforms. But let me start with my talk. Here you have an exemplar of a crook coin. And uh, I guess it's just my guess, because the coin has been completely deformed. Probably a coin of this kind has been baked in an oven. Yet you can think a cheat might easily alter a coin to prefer one side over another. In this case, a coin, a coin of this kind, there will be a biased coin. Yet, yet, surprisingly enough, a coin of this sort can still be used 
for generating fair results by, and this is the most important point, revising the rules of the game. We need to revise the rules of the game in order to make use of a biased coin of this kind. The next slide shows a physical implementation of the Turing machine. A Turing machine is not a physical device. It's a, an abstract machine. It's a, a mathematical formalism. Even though, as in the case of this picture, it can be implemented physically. The concept of uh, Turing machine is um, a foundational concept in computer science. It's one of the most basic concepts, by the way, affecting fields, very important fields, theoretical fields of computer science, as, such as, for instance, computational complexity. But what was the question that Turing tried to answer when he devised the Turing machine. And the question is, what is a mechanical process? And we need to understand this question in the context, in the historical context of that moment. Um, at that time, Gedel, Kurt Gedel, one of the most influential logicians of the past century, already uh, published his own theoretical results concerning the um, incompleteness theorems. And uh, the work of Turing must be situated in this context. So he devised the Turing machine exactly when dealing with the undecidability problem. Let me say what an undecidable problem is. In computability theory, <clears throat> an undecidable problem is a decision problem. The decision problem is a kind of problem um, which can have just an answer of the sort yes or not. So an undecidable problem is a decision problem for which it can be proved that it's impossible to construct an algorithm that always leads to a correct yes or no answer. An example of an undecidable problem is the halting problem. It can be proven that there is no algorithm that correctly determines whether any, any arbitrary program eventually, eventually halt when running. Now, we said that the question that Turing was facing was a question of the kind, what is the mechanical process? When Turing tried to answer to the question, what is a mechanical process? He provided a very simple answer, something that can be done by a machine. And this answer brought him to explore the general notion of computing machine. So a Turing machine, as the one that you can see here, I said that it's a, a mathematical model, an abstract formalism. A Turing machine is a mathematical model of computation describing an abstract machine that manipulates symbols on a tape, like the tape that you can see in the picture, according to a table of very simple primitive rules very simple primitive rules a very simple device yet despite its obvious simplicity a device of this kind is capable of implementing any i'm saying any algorithm humans might devise including algorithms working on a quantum platform an abstract model of this kind, in other words, 
is able to implement any algorithm humans could devise. But now let me quote Turing himself. A computer would deserve to be called intelligent if he could deceive, says Turing, a human into believing that it was a human. And Turing basically is well known today to the most thanks to the famous Turing test. Um, I want to say something more. Turing uh, has been always exercised a powerful fascination on my person for a number of reasons. First of all, because yes, I am a computer scientist, but as well because I am a philosopher. And uh, I guess that Turing was both a computer scientist and a philosopher. And moreover, I must add that he had a strong connection with one of the philosophers that I love more, one of the two most important philosophers, most relevant philosophers of the past century, Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was a student of Ludwig Wittgenstein in Cambridge University. Now, let me spend a few words describing the Turing test. There are many versions, to be honest, of the Turing test. Broadly speaking, the Turing test is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to that of a human. The original Turing test requires three terminals, each of which is physically separated from the other two. One terminal is um, operated by a computer, let's call it A, while the other two are operated by humans, let's call them B and C. During the test, one of the humans, let's say C, is asking questions, while the second human, B, and the computer, A, provide the answers. If C could not reliably distinguish the machine from the human, the machine would be said to have passed the test. Therefore, the Turing test is a method to verify if a machine talking through a computer interface would pass as a human. But do we really know Turing intentions when creating his machine? What was Turing? goal. So we said that, that uh, the main question that Turing was facing was the following, what is a mechanical process? But actually Turing uh, attempt was to, was to substitute the question, can a machine think with the question, is there any computer, is there any computer which will pass the Turing test, the test that I just described. But if we think about the test, well, the evaluator is going to judge just the behavior, the um, exterior performance of the machine. Is not comparing uh, the processes going through the human mind or the human brain with the processes going through the machine. And therefore, most of the scholars think that basically Turing was a behaviorist. Now, my main thesis is that the standard view here, therefore the thesis that Turing was a behaviorist, if not even a supporter of the strong AI paradigm, is just wrong. And again, we should go back to the historical context. And 
if we go back to the historical context, then we should think that Turing abstract machine, together with Ch Church Lambda calculus, both of them, have been invented specifically to generalize the limits of any formal approach, including math. And I'm referring here, obviously, to the work of the guy there on the top of my slide, the incompleteness uh, results, the incompleteness theorems coming from Kurt Gödel. But if my thesis is true, then the other thesis, the thesis according to which Turing was a behaviorist, is totally misleading. My point of view comes exactly from the discussion between uh, um, Turing and Wittgenstein. In my view, Turing's main point is that our limited computational architecture continuously forces us, as, as humans, to offload mechanical, sorry, to offload cognitive tasks to mechanical routines. So what we are doing constantly is to offload what we are not able to support in terms of computational power. I'm talking about here, I'm talking here about speed and memory to offload um, cognitive tasks to mechanical routines. Yet there is a, a residual that cannot be canceled. And this residual is common sense. And as the expression, as this expression says, common sense, common sense is a, a common knowledge, a sense that is shared by all humans. And I can bring forward some example. We always think that, well, it's, it's common sense that an object is identical to itself. It's common sense to believe that objects do not change dimensions suddenly. And it's as well common sense to think that in between true and false, there is almost nothing. It's called the law of the extruded middle. Well, if there is something that Turing machines cannot do, is exactly this. They cannot emulate or simulate human common sense. So let me go to this picture. Here in the picture, you have a team of highly skilled ladies working, we are around the 1936, for the jet propulsion labs. And these ladies have been known as human computers. They were responsible for the number crunching of trajectories, fuel consumption, and other details that actually helped make the US space program a success. Well, Turing's ideas and Wittgenstein's ideas as well were certainly inspired by people of this kind. Um, in uh, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigation, we find uh, a sentence regarding exactly um, his own student, Wittgenstein's student, Alan Turing. He says, I will read the quotation as it is, Turing's machines, these machines are humans who calculate and one might express what he says, what Turing says, also in the form of games, linguistic games. In this sense, a Turing machine is a, a specific subset of the very large set 
of language games human beings can play. Okay? So, we should never forget something that actually is totally obvious. Proofs are used by humans. Algorithms are used by humans, even as, uh, as Lev Manovic said during the last, the first edition of our AI art conference, even as consensus art and design. Art can be a mechanical algorithmic process. Design can be a mechanical um, algorithmic process as well. And what Turing did was exactly to analyze this specific language game. Turing analyzed what the step in a formal system is by thinking, by thinking what it is for, what we are going to do with it. And now let me go back to Turing himself. A second quotation from him. These results, he's speaking about Gödel's results, the incompleteness theorems, may be regarded uh, as going towards a demonstration within mathematics itself of the inadequacy of reason unsupported by common sense. Here you have a key sentence, really a key sentence, showing the main point I already stressed. Gödel's incompleteness results, together with Turing and decidability thesis, show the limits of any purely formal approach, including math. If we take seriously the statement mentioned in this slide, then we should conclude that an artificial intelligence, an AI grounded on a purely formal system, has nothing to do with human intelligence. Besides the fact that uh, the expression artificial intelligence is totally misleading. If there is something that AI is missing, it's exactly common sense, a statement about which any scholar or at least most of them would agree. But now let me move to a third paper. This paper has not been published, has not even been accepted. We have submitted this paper recently. And the title of this paper, as you can see, is Finally, the Death of the Author. In this paper, Costas and I have summed up a number of metaphysical implications coming from the advent of artificial intelligence. Our main thesis is that AI art is disruptive from a metaphysical point of view to the extent that the human centrality is dispossessed by the recognition of forms of creativity different from our own creativity. In our view, the power of an artwork, and I should remember here for reasons that will be clear in a while, an artwork is an object, an object among other, other objects. Could be this boat, this table, an image, a cloud, whatever it is. An artwork is an object. In our view, the power of an artwork consists in allowing us to discover structures, patterns of reality, relations between beings that are mainly inaccessible to the most. But if we speak about the structure of the reality, the structure of how things are, we are speaking about ontology. Therefore, as I said just during my introduction, in this view, 
the artwork makes accessible the ontologically inaccessible. Now, if we take into account seriously the Turing test, together with its conclusions about the limits of any formal system, we should say that the power of AI art goes far beyond the mindset of the artist, its own intentions, its own goals, or the message he or she, whatever, intends to convey as conceptual art pretends. What matters is the outcome of the artistic creation rather than the process leading to that outcome, at least in the case of AI art, where the intention is measured as the output of actions, regardless of where they come from, whether they are human-based or not, to the extent that they show an intellectual accomplishment. The AI artist, in our view, disappears in the background. In this sense, the implied author of an AI artwork must not be understood as the mouthpiece of the AI artist, its spokesperson. And it's easy to show this. Think about the introduction of randomization techniques as it happens in the case of genetic algorithms or the emergence of unpredictable behavior, behaviors as it happens in the case of neural networks, both disrupt completely the relationship between the output embedded in the artwork and the mental process the artist is following. Whenever a neural network generates an unexpected outcome, maybe in an unexpected fashion, well, by definition, the neural network is going behind the intentions of its own designer. Um, it's not by chance, therefore, that the title of our paper is finally the death of the author. But now let me come back to the case of the crook coin, because I didn't finish to comment about the relevance of a crook coin of this kind to this topic. I think it can teach us something really interesting. Now, usually we assume that tossing a coin, right, mirrors a Bernoulli distribution with approximately probability 0.5 of success. We toss, we toss the coin and uh, we expect, let's say, head with a probability around 50%. But uh, we said that a cheat can alter a coin to prefer one side over another, transforming the coin into a bias coin. However, as John von Neumann has shown, the coin can still be used for generating fair results by changing the game slightly. How? You toss the coin twice, and then if the results match, you start over, forgetting both the results. If the results differ, use the first result, forgetting the second. Now, the reason this process produces a fair result is that the probability of getting heads and then tails must be the same as the probability of getting tails and then heads, as the coin is not changing its bias between flips. And the two flips are independent, important, and identically distributed. I'm just mentioning a common sense sentence, a common knowledge in, in, in statistical learning theory, in probability theory, I should say. Um, yet, 
von Norman expedient is changing the rules of the game. The practice itself of tossing a coin for deciding who is the win, who is the winner and who is the loser. We are, we are simulating a fair coin by using a biased coin. We are simulating a game by using another game. And yet, I should remember, simulation is different from emulation. We can simulate to be in pain. I can do it even now, maybe without any success. However, we cannot emulate the pain of someone else, reproducing, copying the pain of someone else. Um, in the case of AI, the situation is similar. We are simulating human intelligence by making use of a completely different logical mechanism. And as Alan Turing said, it's different to the extent that this mechanism is not grounded on the common sense, as in the case of humans. In this sense, the nature of the, of the intelligence exhibited by AI and the nature of the imagination exhibited by AI is ontologically and epistemologically different from human intelligence, whatever, whatever the traditional vulgata proposed by the mass media about AI pretends us, pretends to make us believe. Let me move to the conclusions of my talk. And I need to introduce the work of a philosopher, very well known, Immanuel Kant. And you will understand why in a few minutes. The influence of, by the way, all of this, you can find all of these, you will find all of these, my remarks, our remarks in the paper that uh, uh, hopefully will be published soon. But I want to say the influence of Kantian philosophy has been huge along the last two centuries. I remember that a few months ago, a colleague of us, Michael Lissak, talked about, delivered a talk about constructivism. Well, the first one introducing a form of constructivism was exactly Kant with his own Copernican revolution. He introduced a form of constructivism according to which, even though things in themselves, the so-called noumena, exist and contribute to experience, they are nonetheless distinct and separated from the objects of experience. Therefore, the objects of experience are mere appearances, the phenomena. And the nature of things as they are in themselves is unknowable to us. This is the Copernican, Copernican revolution that Kant introduced. In this view, the world, the reality, uh, needs us, the humans, for coming into existence. Whatever entity is in the world needs to be generated and needs to be guaranteed by the human mind. As soon as thinking and being can never be considered apart from each other. Isn't it a very powerful form of anthropocentrism. Um, the most powerful rejection of anthropocentrism and the most powerful rejection of the philosophical ideas embedded in Kant's Copernical revolution comes from 
a philosophical school of thought named object-oriented ontology. And the main uh, idea of object-oriented ontology is that, uh, let me drink one second, is that uh, objects have an existence independent from the human subject, with the consequence that their ontological nature is not reducible to the relationship that they entertain with humans. According to the school of thought, if we define the objects only through the relationship that they entertain, that they entertain with the human subject, the essence of the object is reduced to those relationships. What is the therapy here? The philosophical therapy consists in avoiding the dualist division between subject and object for accepting a landscape made just by objects. We become objects as well, and the subject disappears. An ontological approach of this kind is a form of radical, very radical realism. In particular, the influence of Kantian philosophy, I want to stress, is the main cause of an unwarranted anthropocentric assumption that some of the distinctive features of human beings, whatever it be language, reason, speech, automatically make humans ontologically different from everything else that makes us beyond thought. Thus, all other beings become objects that can be accessed only through the human subject and therefore cannot exist without humans. It's the most powerful form of anthropocentrism behind the contemporary thought. Now, let me arrive the last two slides. Um, here you have a quotation from uh, a book still unpublished from um, Manovich and uh, Arielli, and I will comment about this quotation. What AI art is showing is that an AI system can exhibit, can show a creativity alien to human creativity to the extent that simply it knows how to make use of the speed and memory characterizing computational systems. And the use of uh, quantum computers in the next future could further scale up those possibilities. Now, a variety of studies have emphasized that most humans are not able to distinguish between an artwork generated by machine and an artwork generated by a human. And the recognition of this kind brings to a conclusion, paradoxical, that uh, in its own attempt to create a better human, humans have self-defeated themselves. By creating a machine, and the machine is an object, in the sense in which object-oriented ontology speaks about objects, that proposes modes of creativity in many contexts superiors, superior, sorry, to ours, by exhibiting as well an artificial imagination different from the human imagination. And yet, the artwork produced by this object an object itself, can act on us by generating a variety of aesthetically pleasing feelings. And it's obvious that a remark of this kind is consistent with the object-oriented ontology school of thought, insofar as this object characterizes itself as an active object with its own private life. At the very end, the AI artwork 
the artificial outcome of an artificial intelligence doesn't need its creator as much as a better me doesn't need me. And I'm sure that my friend and colleague Costas will illustrate um, tomorrow afternoon a couple of experiments which show how very primitive, very simple, very elementary mechanism, such as, for instance, the use of permutation techniques or the introduction of randomness, can bring surprisingly interesting outcomes. As Wittgenstein, the philosopher that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, noted, maybe human creativity is supported and finally shows up thanks to very primitive, simple mechanism of this kind. And then I can arrive at the quotation from Manovic and Darielli by saying, if simple, primitive, non-human processes can generate an aesthetic object, perhaps we are giving too much weight to the notion of human. Conclusions. First, the intention behind Turing's abstract machine is to show the limits of any formal system by carrying out an analysis of the meaning of what a mechanical procedure is. Second, yet, Turing analysis shows as well how much humans tend to offload cognitive tasks to mechanical routines because of the constraints coming from their own cognitive architecture. Limited speed, computational speed, limited computational memory. Human intelligence, including artistic creativity, as Manovic stressed during the last conference, I mean the conference, the 2021 edition of this conference, human intelligence, including artistic creativity, therefore is much more mechanical than what humans prefer to assume. Third point, what AI art is showing is that an AI system can exhibit a creativity alien to human creativity to the extent that it makes use of the speed and memory characterizing computational systems. And in this attempt, in the attempt to create a better human, humans, we must conclude, have self-defeated themselves by creating a machine and therefore an object that proposes modes of creativity, as I said before, in many contexts superior to ours by exhibiting an artificial imagination, different, totally different from the human imagination. Fourth point, the contribution of AI art therefore consists in removing, in deleting the role of the human genius from the artistic scenario by substituting the genius, sorry, by substituting the genius with its own product. Besides, even more important, providing an empirical proof of the philosophical assumptions behind the object-oriented ontology. Um, this awareness, if we accept it, is supportive of an ontology in which the anthropocentric vision is finally defeated by the charisma emanating from an object that human beings traditionally call an artwork, and yet in this case is not a human product. And if you prefer, you can look at AI art and at my own speech as a call for sustainability, maybe something more than a call. AI and AI art 
are already a fact. And an event of this kind is going to change our position, the human position in this planet. Finally, I want to say an object-oriented ontology of this kind brings us to claim that rubbish at the very end is as much important as any human being. And this can appear a trivial statement today. It should appear as a trivial statement today if we think about the conditions of our planet today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Filippo. Now you can turn off your PowerPoint, yes. Sure. Now let's have our next speaker. The next speaker is also keynote speaker of session one, Rafik Anado. Rafik is a media artist, director, and pioneer in the ethics of data and machine intelligence. Please join me in welcome, Rafik. Hello. Hello, Hello Rafik. Yes, oh, wow. perfectly. The video is interesting. I think it's blocking the video. <laughs> great, to, great to see you. Hello, everyone from Los Angeles, California. Uh, excited to be here. Thank you for inviting. I'm, I'm really excited to share my journey with the wonderful um, people here sharing. And as we see from Filippo, such a deep and, um, deep and meaningful context of AI and art. Thank you very much for the inspiring talk. I would thanks, like for being, thanks for being here. Oh, we, please. Tried, we tried during the past edition. We didn't succeed. I'm very glad to have you here because I really admire your works. Deeply, deeply honored, deeply honored. Uh, so I would like yeah. to share my journey in maybe half an hour with you uh, in my session. Um, yes. And I'd like to share my screen with the optimized okay. video. Okay, so I'll do my best to quickly go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hello everyone again. Uh, I'm a media artist and director uh, currently joining from Los Angeles, California. Uh, I've been also teaching at University of California, Los Angeles, last almost eight years, where I got my second Master of Fine Arts degree, uh, and, and I was very honored and, and very fortunate to work with one of the um, most inspiring pioneer media artists, such as Casey Rias, Christian Moller, Jennifer Steinkamp, and during the architecture part, Greg Lynn, uh, Frank Gehry, and Tom Main was also during my time, was at the, uh, UCLA. I originally from Istanbul, Turkey, where I started my journey. And this is a beautiful city where the West and East connects, where the Silk Road connects, where the culture travels through the centuries-long information. I found this to be very inspiring because it's like kind of a West and right, left and West and contemporary, West and East, left and right, contemporary and modern. And history is kind of like emerge in the center of the city. But things were not designed, of course, because when you have entire culture coming together, you have every kind of potential to fill the entire empty spaces. But also it was very inspiring. To, I was eight years old when I got my very first computer. And thanks to my mother's, I guess, birthday gift. And this Commodore 128, a machine that I think completely changed my mind because I was completely inspired by the idea of a space in the mind of a machine. And I feel like I was, by the way, addicted to games till, in the, <laughs> till high school. And I was super inspired also the same year I watched this incredible movie that transformed my imagination, Blade Runner. It may be a little bit like a very some, some cheesy for some people, but for an artist, for a person imagining the future, to me, this was a very powerful moment of like learning the idea of a near future experiences. But also I'm extremely enjoyed the idea of like remembering the future. And I guess 2008, a very important date, I would like to call where I met an amazing lecture from Lem Manovich. And 2008, during this Media Facade exhibition, and in his words, when he was talking about this amazing uh, lecture about politics of augmented space, he was saying, in other words, architects along with artists can take the next logical step to consider the invisible space of electronic data flows as substance rather than just as void, something that needs a structure, a politics, and a poetics. So this was a very powerful quote to me, and I think today I'll be showing my journey with data and AI and architecture and public art. 
this was the very first software I learned when I was in my undergrad years last year, thanks to Koray Tahiroğlu, who was uh, my, my lecturer, my mentor. He, he gave a class about pure data. This, this, this software was a very much still, I think, in use. But back in time, in the class, there was a computer science student, there was a music student, and me from the design student. Like, the three of us took the class. And it was the very first time, I think, I coined the term data painting. And in this class, I achieved to get a beautiful, simple signal studies of a sensor and transform them into a completely enjoying black and white, beautiful material. But 2008, also very important in my, in my journey, it was the very first time I was able to create an audiovisual performance on a, on a, a contemporary art center in Istanbul, where the journey started to appear much meaningfully, followed it with the Sanaa School of Design uh, building and also uh, SM1 in Germany. And 2011 was, I think, another important year where I was able to create very first data sculpture in a public space using three days of information from the street, such as the sound data, and transform it into this three-dimensional data sculpture. And I guess the poetics of data, which I'm calling it as a mean of like research, started to appear. And very first code I was super inspired by, also Ken Perlin's noise algorithm. But instead of like just using it as it is, I was very much inspired by plotting other type of data sets as an input, as a mean of like memory. And also very inspired by the idea of reality and how we can re-render and question it. I guess you will find this frame around my work since 2011. <clears throat> I'm sorry, this, this frame is a kind of a rejection, unfortunately. We couldn't put on a building because it was too expensive, I guess. <laughs> but this idea of like a frame around the data and algorithm will be very prophetic. And also, I'm much more inspired over the years about data, but also how, as humans, we are transforming into these new populations, how we are becoming these internet citizens, and how many people exactly using these machines in a world that's pretty much impossible to run away. And I think the idea of using physical and virtual worlds together appeared in my mind very clearly after this, in this moment. And it and also was very much inspired by the idea of how the technology is transforming who we are. In Kevin Kelly's amazing What Technology Wants book, he says, scientists has come to a startling realization. However you define life, it is a sense, does not reside in materials forms like DNA, tissue, or flesh, but in the intangible organization of energy and information contained in those material forms. And as technology was unveiled from it is short of atoms, we could see that its core is about ideas and information. Both life and technology seems to be based on immaterial flows of information. I think these flows of information every single day around us and how the machines surround us and how the feeling of sense of displacement becoming our new DNA and gene part. And as John Mayer says, design is a solution to a problem, art is a question to a problem. I found my question as, that it may be very fundamental, but what does it really mean to be a human in 21st century? And I think this question cannot be answered myself, and I would like to recognize my heroes, my also my team members. So we are now 15 people, can speak 15 languages, and represent 10 countries in our studio. And over the years, what I think we achieved is we were simply very much focused on embedding media arts into architecture and try to create novel experiences in public spaces and try to find meaningful artistic experiences, transforming the immaterial data into this something we can in, like becomes these tangible feelings. And I do believe that architecture is beyond just concrete, steel, and glass. And this journey of data as a space, data as a substance, or machine as a collaborator became much more prof profound in our research. And last eight years, profoundly look at for many incredible collaborations, universities, professors, incredible researchers, academicians, scientists. And I guess very much interestingly, my first collectors and people commissioned the work was Silicon Valley. I guess before the art world, <clears throat> I'm sorry, before the art world, I was able to work with one of the most amazing people in Silicon Valley here in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, and transform many incredible ideas and research into an art experiences. But I think today, because the AI is a very fundamental um, question for this amazing event, and I would like to go back to deep mind and the and deep, basically, dream, where this incredible image probably seen by many people. The Deep Dream was a software and originated in a deep convolutional network called named Inception, after the film of the same name. 
was developed for the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge in 2014, and I think realized in July 2015. And that was an incredible summer to me. And I emailed these incredible people behind it. Like I was just questioning as an artist, like how can I like look at this same like, you know, code and understand how we can use it. And I think I'm very confident to say that that was a very important moment for the art history. And I think the same group of people, thanks to Google Friends, opened an amazing event in San Francisco, an event called Deep Dream. And Deep Dream was the first event in gray area in San Francisco, 2016, February. And that was the event very first time Google engineers were coming together with, with me as an artist, I guess. The rest was an incredible group of people, but mostly <clears throat> amazing engineers at Google. I was the only one at the event doesn't know how to use AI. But that was an incredible time to me. Also start the very first artist in residence at Google using AI in a fundamental way. So I'm very grateful for here, Blaise Agora Arcas, Kenrick McDowell, and Mike Taika, who allowed me to start this journey. What was very important to me was not only just use AI as a techno fetish tool, but the idea of using the library of the future, the idea of using the library of Babel, pretty much Borges, Borges incredible imagination of every single existential data in one location. I was very much inspired by and created this archive dreaming. And archive dreaming was a one form of an immersive environment where you can interact with AI real time. 2016, we developed this incredibly challenging installation. So the idea was taking 1.7 million documents, an incredibly rich archive, open source, free for everyone, and put this imagination of like machine latent space into the game. To me, what was very inspiring is the idea of like finding latent space as a canvas and finding this meaning inside this black box. And also, what was also remarkably important is in a library where information turns into a knowledge, eventually into an experience in life and a wisdom, the left side we are seeing is how the archivists were like using data, and on the right side, how the AI was creating the um, clusters of information. And it was that time I started these data universes in my work. Archive Dreaming, as you may see, is the very first immersive environment and architectural installation where the very first time AI put in a, like a library in a three-dimensional environment and immersively transform you from this real-time world to also a VR world where a human learns like the speed of machine. But beyond using a classical just bunch of, um, let's say, search bars, here the idea is look at what AI found from it. <coughs> and the project got an incredible research reaction and also in Ar in Ars Electronica 2017 was also uh, witnessed by an incredible audience. And I think it became a very important research for our studio. And actually what was very important to me was also the idea of machine hallucinations. If a machine can learn, can a dream question became incredibly important. And it was a very fortunate moment that Ian Goodfellow, who are who is the founder of GA and again, Algorithms Generative Astral Network, Mike Taika and, and we as a studio were able to explore this 1.7 million documents on the left side, as you see, and generate again results from the DC and algorithm and create this latent walk. But to me, that was not just the art itself. To me, the art was profoundly finding a connection with the pigmentation. On the very right side, what you are seeing, a fluid dynamics completely traced by these day admission decisions and transform them into these artworks at which I am also I guess coined the term AI data painting and AI data sculptures. And here, as we see, AI translates the data and turns into the pigmentation. And this research is still going on, and I'm extremely excited to show uh, many examples. And over the last six years, we were able to train more than 100 AI models from StyleGAN, the StyleGAN 2ADA, DG, DCGAN, PGGAN, recently a lot of like multimodal AI research. And thanks to NVIDIA friends and Jensen Huang, which is an, an incredible support. Uh, we have many DJX stations and a lot of GPUs that are allowing us research. But the fundamental idea of like every single research we did, we try to like never show in our any projects a real data, only look for what machine could hallucinate and create from that potential memory, which in this case, collective memory, urban, nature, space, and in different topics. And this became a body of work for the last six years. And we are profoundly researching this field and an incredible support comes from the also AI research field. And I think this aesthetics of fluid dynamics 
with AI findings became a body of work. Uh, but of course, as you see here, every single different model, every single different color, every different uh, movement in life in these AI dreams can reconstruct these very much unique findings. And for me, like especially early days, early years, I was just thinking like, is it like a similar idea? Are we doing the same thing feeling? But actually, the more we train AI models, the more we found the uniqueness and differences between different memories of humanity. And this idea, not only just easy, of course, creating and, and, and fluid dynamics or simulations, we also developed novel architecture and novel architectures in like software, such as in this case, latent space browser. So what you are seeing and me, I'm literally physically using a joystick in a 3D physical space. And this software trained on an every single Renaissance era architecture, which can speculate the interior, exterior and facade. And me on the left side, finding those moments and clicking a button and selecting a moment and connecting these independent locations and let the machine hallucinate alternatives. And I'm calling this also a space in the mind of a machine or putting a camera in the mind of a machine. This idea became very powerfully um, our body of work, I guess, and have been explored in SIGGRAPH and in Media GTC. And we became, I guess, the pioneers of this um, movement in terms of the uh, AI art in this context. But to me, the other question, of course, can we reconstruct the memory? Is it possible to like look at the patterns of remembering? Neuroscience was always very fundamental. And embedding AI into architecture, as, as I mentioned before, is always the fundamental research. 2018, right after Archive Dreaming, we get a wonderful commission from Artec House. And this time, we train our AI on 113, 113 million, 113 million New York photos. These photos have been completely focused on the city of New York, and we transform it into this three-dimensional immersive environment by using 18-channel projection and 32-channel sound. And this became one of the most exciting examples of stepping inside this hallucinatory space, hallucinatory space where the machine could dream and imagine a world that we can step in, we can be a part of it. And I do believe before wearing a television on our face, we do still have a lot of room that architecture can become this canvas. As later, these new augmented spaces, as Lev Manevich mentioned, I think we have a lot of room here. The project 2018 to 19 became a pioneer piece in the immersive environment, transformed this feeling into an ever-changing work and traveled many cities in the world. Also in Kraftwerk in Berlin, we tried another version of this idea. This time we transformed the iconic Kraftwerk into a canvas and also explore real-time AI data sculptures and different level of augmentations. And I will say public art and expression NFTs became also very important for our research. Not only just NFT, to me, is anything exciting. To me, when it becomes a public art and experience in life becomes much more profound and important. In our research, we were also very fundamentally um, inspired by NASA GPL, like any science fiction lover, I guess, inspired from the um, space itself and the research itself. And we were able to create many AI models from the ISS, Hubble, MRO, and even created many different data sculptures uh, between 2016 to, to, to right now. And our data sculptures have been explored in different scales and, and, and being enjoyed by also in Hong Kong, as far as I know, one of the most visited exhibition last year, um, which is called Machine Hallucination Space, was also auctioned as an NFT, the room itself physically became an NFT. The very first immersive room, I guess, became an NFT. And the piece was also exploring an, a software as a space. Software, as Usman Haq mentioned many times, software became the space. The experience becomes the space.
And then later on, not only just inspired by the idea of machines, only two senses, but also the third sense, maybe multi-sensory world, open up to us, 2019. Bulgari commissioned this project called Metamorphosis. And the idea was here, what will happen if AI not only just create this audio and visual space, but can also have a scent augmentation. So thanks to Fermanich, an incredible company in Lausanne, in Geneva, we were able to create the scent of AI dreams. When you step in, in this immersive room, which is a two-dimensional, two and um, two different uh, LED media walls and an immersive room, the room was also creating a real-time scent based on the color, the form of flower, and real-time scent augmentation was happening behind the walls. And again, this is one of the first example of AI multi-sensory environment, profoundly using a real-time data and real-time world augmentation without wearing any VR or AR. And I guess in this case, it's more like an XR. And as Flip K. Dick says, I guess, reality is that which doesn't go away when you stop living in it. A simulation is that which doesn't stop when the stories go away. Stories are responsible to our human desire for resolution, but a simulation is responsible only to its own laws and initializing conditions. A simulation has no moral prejudice or meaning like nature, it just is. And I guess another project I would like to recognize last year, I'm deeply thankful to Museum of Modern Arts in New York, Paola Antonelli, Michel Kuo, John Posma, and Casey Rias, Feral File, we were able to create one of the world's very first museum collaboration in the NFT space. The project called Unsupervised research on the entire MoMA collection, more than incredible 250,000 images of MoMA, transformed into a series of artworks by using also NVIDIA collaboration, thanks to the StyleGAN team and an incredible team at Helsinki, we were able to create this beautiful series of collection of using entire MoMA archive. The piece also explored beautiful archive of MoMA from multiple senses and recognized the data sets inside this incredible world. And we generate multiple works. For example, data universe of MoMA represents entire MoMA archive by using UMAP algorithm and plotted in six dimensions. And there was only 5,000 editions, which were very accessible for everyone. And they also later become a ticket for MoMA for museum. Very first time NFT utility was becoming a ticket. And also we train a beautiful new StyleGAN algorithm, StyleGAN to ADA algorithm with the entire archive. And look at this, one of the most rarest art collection in the world. And thanks to the curators and incredible dialogues during the production, we were able to create these three series of unique artworks. The very left one, Machine Hallucinations MoMA, is completely using a real-time software, infinitely dreaming about the modern art that exists in the MoMA archive. The middle one, which is Fluid Dreams, is a studio signature, I guess, journey with Fluid Dynamics that exists more than six years of research with AI and data. And on the very right side, Generative Study 1 is a real-time also application that reconstructs using a real-time GAN algorithm, curated walk into a series of an algorithm. And I guess this is a very important project for today, the name of the event, which is a quantum memories. I do believe it is one of the early examples of using quantum data and a quantum collaboration. I'm extremely, extremely honored to share this project with Google AI quantum team. Thanks to Hartmut Newman, an incredible team at Google AI quantum. We were able to create this project. What you are seeing is uh, basically one of the most exciting research, I guess, happened in 2019, quantum advantage research. And this data set that exists from the research became an inspiration. Heavily inspired by the Hugh Everett's Many Worlds interpretation, quantum memories train on a 200 million um, nature photos. And this nature series of GAN algorithms triggered by a new novel way of triggering with quantum subatomic calculations from the AI team, 
and transform that with strings into a four-dimensional noise algorithm that drive new worlds that are transformed into this data sculpture, AI data sculpture. The piece was in National Gallery of Victoria, and during the pandemic, unfortunately, I couldn't see it, but I learned that more than 1.4 million people enjoyed the National Gallery of Victoria during the pandemic. It's a deep honor for us, for our studio, during pandemic, achieve such a major audience and find the healing aspect of art and museum as a space where AI, quantum research, and data experience can heal the people and bring positivity in dark days of humanity. Another piece I guess we should also maybe have a look is Last Miami, Art Basel, Basel Miami. We also were able to create an NFT project called Machine Hallucinations Coral Dreams. Coral Dreams explored literally a beautiful world of underwater universe, which I think is one of the most exciting data we ever collected from the underwater universe. And we trained this AI and transformed the Miami Beach into a public art. Later on also became an NFT auction, a collection. The piece explored an incredible excitement about putting the, activating the beautiful nature as a canvas So the public art is an incredibly inspiring research for our studio. And I think we, the reason we got many positive um, interviews and very positive reviews about activating public space, open, free, and accessible for everyone, and creating these novel connections, I think became our studio's fundamental work. Another project I would like to um, share with you today is Machine Hallucinations Nature Dreams, a project exhibited in Berlin last November and attracted in five weeks more than 200,000 people. It may be the largest audience ever visited a gallery in Europe. And the beautiful St. Agnes, a former brutalist architecture church, which thanks to Johann Koenig and his incredible vision, transformed into a gallery space. In our project, we took the iconic tower <clears throat> and transformed it into an AI data sculpture. And the sculpture was using real-time data from Berlin datasets and transforming this beautiful canvas into an ever-changing live piece of sculpture in public space. Inside the building, we installed a Nature Dreams. This time, in between NGV, we were able to create a 300 million image archive for nature, landscapes, flowers, beautiful ocean, lakes, animals, and incredibly exciting trees became a part of nature dreams. And I guess what was very powerful in, in, in my experience in this beautiful space was maybe the church context, maybe the spiritual space. 
But it was very inspiring to see one kilometer queue in the beautiful, you know, in, in, in the morning of like Berlin on Sunday and at 10 a.m. early morning and seeing such an incredible audience and getting a beautiful reaction from any age and honestly any background from the Berlin audience was incredibly powerful for our studio. And I guess this whole idea of like creating public space over the years and connecting with many people as an audience became our very powerful reason why we should bring AI. By the way, in our all exhibitions, we always show behind the scenes, we always show what we do and how we do with these algorithms. While this created a copycat, <laughs> a couple of copycats are doing the same thing without any reference. But at the meantime, we remain very disposed for our public art experiences in the world. And I guess a couple of two projects I would like to, uh, before I finish my, my talk, I would like to remind this incredibly honored, deeply honored project called Living Architecture Casabatio. Actually, two weeks ago in Barcelona, we hosted 47,000 people in this beautiful building by Anthony Gaudi's Casabatio. As Gaudi mentions, originality consists in the returning to the origin, does that which is original returns to the simplicity of the first solutions. An incredibly inspiring quote that we thought that what will happen if we take this beautiful facade, and thanks to Casabatio family, by the way, an incredibly open-minded person and people, we transform the facade into a living architecture, a, a real-time data augmentation. The piece was, first of all, used an incredibly inspiring data from the UNESCO Heritage Quality LiDAR scanning of the facade, which was a 100 billion data point. And also by using a real-time weather station and using an Unreal Engine and real-time game motor, we were able to take the data from the building and transform the weather conditions into a living artwork. And living architecture also started almost, I guess, three years ago with an incredible letter came from Hashim Sarkis, a Venice Biennale architecture curator. And he, he wrote this incredible mail in an incredible letter where he was mentioning that maybe the future of our, my practice can be taking this lead to any you know, journeys of living beings. And I was inspired and I was super lucky to get this um, attention. And during the Venice Biennale, we explored a similar idea. But it was the very first time I was able to reconstruct this world and it was also became an amazing installation in Barcelona. We took this information <clears throat> and transformed the beautiful facade into a canvas.
lastly, I would like to show our latest honored project with Zahadit Architecture. Incredibly, incredibly honored. And thanks to Patrick Schumacher for this wonderful collaboration and entire Zahadit Architects. We were able to work in one of the most, to me, from my heart, meaningful data of entire Zaha archives. And for this project, we closed work with Zaha Code team and the exhibition opened in Seoul at DDP and also an immersive environment designed by Zaha. So this is one of our most, most amazingly inspired project. So for the project, we first explore an incredible archive of um, Zaha Hadith archives, and then look at this incredible documentation of the uh, legacy of the, of, the, of the design firm. And then we train and style again to ADA algorithm, and then look at this beautiful information with image clusters. And then later on, one of the probably many of us is aware of the multimodal AI that exists, such as you know, Clip Diffusion and OpenAI's incredible DALI and before maybe GPT-3 and so on. So very honored to be one of the first exam uh, first uh, group of people who were allowed to use DALI-2. I think we were made like very first five, I guess, researchers. And what we look at DALI-2 as a mean of um, tool for architecting the metaverse. And again, thanks to Patrick Schumacher, we spend a lot of time together and look at this incredibly exciting diffusion models and then look at like how this new ways of seeing design tool and transforming these incredible um, forms into a three-dimensional environments. And I think what is what is pioneering here is so how did architects also take these prompts, these visuals, and then transform them into a three-dimensional spaces where we can now go and visit. And this is an incredible honor for our studio. And I would like to finish my talk with the teaser of Architecting the Metaverse, a collaboration with our studio and the Hadid Architects. Thank you very much and, and see you all in data land. Hope I didn't get too long. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafik. Very inspiring presentation. And also this session is followed by a 30 minute panel talk around after the our next two speakers. So see you there. Um, let me introduce our next speaker, Andrew Waite. Andrew Waite is at the Harvard University. Join me in welcoming Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much for uh, for the invitation. It's my second time in the conference. Last year, I think I shared a pretty broad range of projects. This year, I'm actually going to share one in particular, one that sort of like deals with this question of the relationship between AI uh, and fiction. Yes, perfectly. Now you can. can okay. So uh, today I'd like to talk about AI as a way to see, map, and make worlds. 
and about how our understanding of AI is inevitably bound up with uh, the fictions of those worlds. And, uh, you know, in particular, I'm interested in thinking about the reciprocity between this, I, this idea of engineered life, artificial intelligence, panoramic views of uh, the world as it exists now, and ways of reconstructing or reinterpreting uh, that world. So first I'd like to introduce a little bit about our studio. So st Certain Measures is a studio that bridges architecture, art, technology, uh, and a number of other disciplines to confront uh, systemic challenges or to think about systemic issues. So we're particularly interested in this shared world of humans, machines, uh, and nature and how all of those interact through data. So data becomes the sort of like common medium of exchange uh, uh, among all of those different uh, elements. And we omnivorously embrace working across scales from the material to the planetary, uh, and also this sort of space that spans the physical and digital. So all of our projects have a manifestation which is physical, um, some artifacts that are produced, some sort of like um, uh, presence in the physical world, and then also some digital experience or some digital dimension of uh, revealing what's happening to create those artifacts, to produce those artifacts. And our work symbiotically connects software and hardware prototyping, and each project has those two, those two manifestations. So there's a clear reciprocity actually between, uh, uh, between data and form, physical space, uh, and um, digital experience. So data, mathematics, and AI become the catalysts uh, to visualize these processes and also realize um, artifacts that transform the way we think about uh, building and uh, inhabiting space. So our approach is naturally transdisciplinary. It puts design in an analytically rigorous um, position uh, in relationship to philosophy, history, mathematics, um, and uh, other disciplines. But then each of those disciplines themselves open up possibilities for associations with specific kinds of tools or specific ways of framing problems. Um, so philosophy, for example, gives us access to various particular design methods and ways of theorizing design science. Uh, history gives us an understanding both of the history of design science and uh, design futures. And then mathematics obviously provides us access to geometry, data science, computation, and other um, uh, AI related methods. So today I'll share a project that applies these methods towards uh, the challenge of systemic bioremediation uh, through a fictional world monitoring AI. So the project is part of the newly opened Museum of the Future in Dubai. Uh, this is a museum that's built to transform the very perception of the future as we know it. Uh, it's home to immersive environments that position visitors in an empowering vision of tomorrow. And across each floor of the museum, the visitor steps into a speculative world of 2071. Uh, visitors experience a space station, a therapeutic clinic, uh, and uh, an institute for global biodiversity and bioremediation uh, circa 2071, which is the project that I'll be uh, sharing with you today. So for the museum, we imagined a future observatory for planetary ecology. Uh, and this observatory is a kind of AI facilitated control room, panorama and incubator for newly designed species uh, developed to address the ongoing challenges of the climate crisis. So I think um, our interest with this project was thinking about AI, not necessarily as a sort of like generative tool, but rather as a way of sort of understanding, making sense of, coordinating, and ultimately reconceptualizing uh, nature as it exists and could exist. So uh, this is this room is sort of a culmination uh, of the floor-wide exhibit that presents this HEAL Institute, which is a fictional NGO tasked with gathering the planet's uh, genetic material, engineering species capable of meeting the challenges of extreme climate, uh, and redeploying those species uh, around the world. So this new space consisted of two elements, uh, one which we called the geoscope and a second uh, which we called the nursery. So the geoscope is a quantitatively driven sentient monitoring system that visualizes the progress of bespoke species uh, in their threatened biomes. So through immersive projection uh, mapping, the geoscope off offers a transcalar and data rich view of the planet from the global to the microscopic. It actually represents an AI that's slowly becoming ethically aware of what's happened to the planet. Uh, and so the idea is that as this, um, as this AI sort of like scans the planet and begins to uh, realize the impact of 
uh, anthropocentric uh, or anthropogenic climate change. It, uh, it begins to also understand its role uh, both in um, the remediation of the planet and uh, its sort of fraught relationship with humanity. So the geoscope combines physical models and dynamic projection mapping uh, to show symbiotic connections across scales. And through artificially intelligent biomechanical agents, monitoring droids and, super, uh, and a super intelligent uh, uh, agent uh, or caretaking intelligence, the world becomes knowable and leg legible across scales from the microscopic to the planetary. So the geoscope is a conscious, conscious response to the architect Buckminster Fuller's series of geoscopes. Uh, but ours sees the world not as a sort of extractive system, but as a replenishing one uh, in which humans and artificial intelligence play a vital role. It res represents a continuously changing view of the network of monitoring stations uh, through this network of monitoring stations across the planet. And according, coordinating AI dynamically connects uh, with a number of human and non-human agents, uh, including drones, satellites, and hybrid technobiological sensors. And so the idea is that the AI becomes a kind of like a coordinator, facilitator, um, or sort of, um, uh, yeah, sort of, uh, sort of like host for all of these various intelligences, both artificial and natural, which come together in this bioremediation project. So as the AI slowly becomes more aware of human responsibility for climate change, it also understands its own, um, uh, its own role in rebuilding. So this data visualization is a glimpse into the expanding consciousness of the AI. Uh, and as the AI scans specific, specific locations, the Ganges River Delta, Antarctic Inland, uh, empty quarter of the Emirates, uh, Canada's Nanavut and so forth, uh, it uh, searches for signs of progress uh, against climactic catastrophe. So for this project, we drew inspiration from many planetary visualizations of the past century and a half, but particularly the, the great globes uh, of the 19th century, which visitors entered into in order to experience a panoramic view of the earth. So our aim was to extend this idea with a simultaneous and multi-scalar view uh, that was facilitated by, uh, by, these, uh, uh, by these AI ideas. So through this, we were sort of like both seeing and making a world simultaneously. So we're also inspired by various scientific cabinets, uh, these sort of collections of physical artifacts that put those artifacts in relationship and in dialogue with each other. And in particular, we were interested in the Tyler's Museum in uh, Harlem, Netherlands, which offered a magical and varied wunderkammer with particulars drawn from across the natural environment. So this was something like the opposite of a totally holistic view of the world. It was, it was a kind of unity through an assemblage of particulars. And our aim was to splice these representations together and to present the whole uh, and the particular simultaneously in dynamic and interconnected conversation. So the geoscope presents a kind of hybrid of these two precedents, the sort of like global view and the sort of wunderkammer view, a total overview that shows an evolving web of life and symbiotic interactions of ecosystems, species, bacteria, uh, uh, environments, and people. And so the entire system is nurtured by this cooperation between the human network uh, and machinic agents uh, working together for more verdant tomorrow. So an integral part of the geoscope are the myriad vignettes that show and zoomed in detail the thriving, spe the thriving species introduced by the benevolent AI. So these include, for example, sugarcomb jellies, swarm, uh, a swarm superorganism that signals danger with bioluminescent flashes, uh, or cryptobiotic wire wildflowers, which are these robust hibernating vegetation uh, that survive in steppe and tundra, uh, tundra regions. Uh, other species included uh, observation robot seahorses, a biomechanical drone uh, that checked uh, microplastic density, CO2 content, temperature fluctuation, so forth, a fire resistant tree with robust roots to resist the danger um, of, those climate, uh, of those climate emergencies. So the geoscope also affords glimpses into the research of scientists in the Heal Institute who worked tirelessly to confirm the success of this regreening of the earth. So through field work, these scientists engage with deployed species and document their process um, and become one aspect of this uh, machinically enabled network uh, of, uh, of regreening. So uh, we even witnessed moments in their lab of careful analysis as they are preparing samples for review and evaluating soil toxins, trace, carbo uh, trace carbohydrates, 
uh, and other critical biomarkers. So uh, in all of this, we're sort of imagining the AI as the sort of facilitator uh, of this much of this sort of institution, it becomes the sort of like sponsor for this institution and sponsor for this wide scale coordination uh, for these um, ecological uh, ecological interventions. Uh, so the geoscope thus becomes a glimpse into the operations of this AI tasked with uh, the coordinating and regreening of the Earth. So in the nursery, which is the other half of the experience. Visitors peer into incubators, nurturing dozens of species that could revitalize a struggling planet. In collaboration with a geneticist, we designed over 80 species of plant, insect, and animal, uh, each with special characteristics designed to combat, combat environmental challenges uh, of today and the future. Uh, and so this fictional AI, the intention is that it calibrates these species uh, to the specific areas where they're needed most uh, and essentially match makes between uh, these um, these new biological uh, uh, these new biological entities and what the planet needs. So the nursery shows the accelerated growth process of these species, enhanced with holographic data profiles of each specimen. Um, and the AI essentially becomes this kind of gardener and caretaker, ensuring the nascent development uh, of each specimen. So drawn from a range of biomes, we imagine species such as uh, nutrient jelly cactus, radiation sequestering flowers, seed dispersal snails, or lipid rich quinoa, which collectively form a kind of biological menagerie. Uh, and so the, this AI, which goes through the process of uh, sort of geographic classification and detection is also the sort of, um, the sort of curator of this menagerie. Uh, so each of these species has very particular sort of features intended to be uh, matched with specific um, uh, environmental challenges. So for instance, the remediation coral is designed to shelter reef dependent species while feeding on microplastics uh, and sequestering heavy metals. So this is a kind of supercut uh, of the physical dioramas and models. And working with a highly skilled uh, German art fabricator, ID3D, we designed each uh, of these to rival the detail of dioramas in the best uh, natural history museums. So each species was meticulously, meticulously researched, complete with a scientific name, specific climate robust features and estimated life cycles. And there's sort of an encyclopedic impulse in the collection and attempt to convey the variety and possibility of nature uh, across climates. So at the microscopic scale, so, you know, obviously any sort of species is uh, part of a much larger chain. And so introducing these species uh, has to be done in symbiotic fashion with all of the other supporting species at larger and smaller scales. So the at the microscopic scale, we design bacteria to symbiotically support our new species in these larger biomes. And many were paired with larger organisms in beneficial dyads. So these bacteria included cancer hunting, sunscreen producing, and heavy metal sequestering varieties. Uh, many of which were also um, uh, intended to be part of a larger constellation of species. So here you can see a glimpse of some of the holographic data viz overlays that revealed the details of the organism and its role in a remediated earth. Um, this is a highly accelerated view of those uh, synchronized displays, but uh, the idea is that this menagerie also surfaced the data, um, the sort of biometric data around each of those species um, in their development. So we were interested in the, uh, or sorry, uh, so these 80 different species were uh, distributed among seven major ecosystems, such as desert, aquatic, artist, or sorry, Arctic forest, uh, swamp, alpine, and grassland. And they were designed uh, with this geneticist, each with very specific biomechanical or biochemical mechanisms. And so not only were they sort of uh, essentially some specific um, uh, derivatives or sort of like uh, uh, antecedent or sort of derived from very specific kinds of species, uh, we also had to design the sort of biochemical um, uh, processes that would make, them, uh, would make them possible. So these plants, animals, and fungi all contributed uh, should ultimately contribute to this revitalized global ecology. 
So we were very interested in this sort of like post-human perspective of the sentient AI monitoring uh, the earth in an as a sort of observatory. Uh, and we were curious about this idea of how the AI would begin to come to terms with this uh, unfolding uh, climate catastrophe. And, you know, since the AI communicates with the visitor and the network of remote agents through transmissions, we became really fascinated on this in this literary genre of fiction called the epistolary novel. So the epistolary novel is a story that's written entirely in letters uh, back and forth between the characters. And, uh, you know, it has quite a long history. Uh, and ironically, Frank, or maybe not ironically, but interestingly, uh, Frankenstein, arguably one of the first science fiction novels, uh, certainly one of the first to address uh, bioengineering, uh, uses the epistolary form. And so uh, we began to think about these sorts of experiments in also email and epistolary fic fiction, as well as the emerging genre of AI coming of age stories, uh, such as uh, Ishiguro, Ishiguro's uh, Clara and the Sun. So we began to think about the sort of like fictional journal or fictional set of transmissions or fictional set of exchanges uh, that would emerge from this AI as it's becoming ethically conscious uh, of this climate catastrophe. So we wanted to combine the epistolary novel with uh, the, the panorama book. So the idea of this entire installation is that it's a kind of panorama of the planet. Uh, we were inspired by these uh, projects like Ed Ruscha's Every Building on the Sunset Strip uh, that imagines this sort of very linear panorama of a, uh, of a Los Angeles street view. We wanted to think about how we could uh, kind of reframe our piece as um, every species on planet Earth. So if we were to do one sort of like continuous scan of the planet and create this sort of linear structure, um, annotated with these sort of transmissions, uh, these exchanges, these letters from this AI to its, uh, to its human interlocutors, what would that look like? And so now we begin to put together a draft of a book that uh, combines these elements into a journal of exchanges between this AI and its various uh, human interlocutors. Uh, it tells the story of climate remediation from a non-human perspective, uh, from the perspective of, of an emergent, ethically conscious AI um, through this one continuous scan of the biosphere. It's a sort of journal and transcript um, of that emerging consciousness and a way to fictionalize and world build the role of AI uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these futures of uh, collaborative uh, regreening. So this observatory represents a sort of comprehensive simulation uh, of connected uh, biotechnical ecology, as well as new possibilities for, um, uh, for architecture. And through these intersect intersecting um, I or intersecting practices of speculative design, AI, biofutures, fiction, and data visualization, we can multiply the capacities of um, architecture towards world building and imagining a more verdant world of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, now it's our last speaker of this session. Ken Liu. Uh, Ken Liu is an author and futurist and also a winner of the Nebula, Hugo, and the World's Fantasy Awards. Please join me in welcoming Ken. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to make sure I'm coming across OK. You can hear yeah. me OK, right? Yeah, okay, yes, awesome. perfectly. All right, thank you um, for having me be part of this. And I really love the presentation so far. Um, so rather than showing you um, slides, I thought I would just actually talk to you uh, because what I have to say um, is probably best um, presented by just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, for me to walk you through um, my ideas. I am a storyteller. Uh, so it's no surprise that the way I come at this topic is very story centric. Uh, but I think there is some insight here that will be relevant for everybody. Um, I've 
studied AI and creativity for many, many years. Uh, it's one of my core obsessions, in fact. Um, and uh, one thing that has always puzzled me a little bit is the manner in which AI has made huge strides in changing the way creativity and the arts are conducted in all sorts of different mediums, except for fiction, except for storytelling, all right? So let me give you an example. Um, right now, if you go watch a Hollywood film, um, many of the shots are AI enhanced. Uh, they're done by machine learning and they, they have been processed um, in very um, uh, obvious ways. Um, virtually none of the pictures you take on your phone now are without AI intervention. Machine learning uh, probably shapes the way we perceive each other to a degree that's very little understood. Uh, all of our pictures um, coming out of Apple or Google or any other manufacturer, um, the images taken by these cameras are heavily processed by machine learning. So what you see uh, is literally the result of, of a machine's idea of about how the world ought to look. It's not uh, an objective uh, image, whatever that means. Similarly, if you listen to commercial music, a lot of contemporary commercial music in movies, in commercials, whatnot, are processed and generated by computers, uh, by AI. Uh, and even if you play games, uh, procedurally generated games are making up a larger and larger piece of uh, these forms of art that we experience. The one exception to this steady march of AI um, is fiction. Um, fiction has remained uh, a domain that's largely been immune from transformation by AI. Um, and it's very curious to me why that is. Um, writers today, novelists today, essentially write the same way they did 200, 300, 400 years ago. Um, the only sense in which um, artificial intelligence has somewhat changed that um, is the way that search engines are now so important for storytellers. Uh, a lot of us can pretend to be much smarter than we are using search engines to look up things. Uh, we can all pretend to be well-read and erudite uh, when in fact uh, we don't really know what it is that we're doing. We may act like we've read um, a famous classic when in fact all we know is one quote. Um, so that's the one sense in which perhaps I can say that AI has changed the way we write novels. But other than that one aspect, we really fundamentally don't see AI changing our art, not to the same degree. My wife was a photographer. I mean, for her, machine learning and, and computer processing has fundamentally changed the art form. Uh, architects, uh, game designers, musicians. I mean, you ask artists in all fields, machine learning, artificial intelligence really plays a huge role in a way that novelists just don't see. So I wanted to delve deeper into why that is. Uh, I actually have the technical background and I, I, I am a novelist. So I wanted to find out exactly why. Now, as it turns out, there are a lot of writers and novelists who uh, have focused on the idea of machine assisted creativity, um, trying to write novels or stories or poems or whatnot using the help of AI. I mean, uh, writing a, a program that generates poetry is one of those things that every beginning programmer does. So this is nothing new. But the problem is none of these efforts have ever gone anywhere. They've never been taken seriously. They've, they've never led to any kind of transformation in the field. Uh, they are curiosities. They're, they're no more than um, experiments. They just don't seem to stick around. Um, so I think there is something very unique about fiction, about storytelling, and delving deeper into what that specifically um, strange thing about it um, is what I'm going to try to do, and then how it relates to AI. So what I want to do is ask all of you to perform an experiment, right? So try to pick some um, abstract idea, some abstract concept, some value that's important to you, uh, courage, justice, freedom, love, what have you. Try to pick a topic, some, some sort of abstract concept like that and really focus on it, focus on what it means to you and, and think deeply about 
what images come to you. And, and if you're tried, you're forced to defend it, you're forced to um, explain what it is, you're forced to um, imagine how it makes you feel. What are the images that come to you, right? Okay, so just take a few seconds to think, think about this. And I will tell you what happens to me. And, and I think this is an experience that's very common to all of us. When you're forced to engage in an exercise like this, where you're trying to make, explain to yourself what an abstract concept like that means to you, um, you end up resorting to very concrete stories and memories. That's how you get, um, that's how you actually get to meaning. So when I was thinking about love, for example, right, what comes to mind are these very, this really old memory of mine. Uh, I was a kid and, and I was with my grandmother. Um, she was knitting a sweater for me uh, next to me. And I could see that her fingers were very um, swollen because she had arthritis and it was very hard for her to move the needles. And as she was working on the sweater, I asked her, you know, grandma, does it, does it hurt when you do that? And she said, yes, it, it, it does hurt. Um, and I said, so why do you keep on doing it? Um, and she said, well, I don't want you to be cold. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Um, and for me, that will always be the memory that ends up defining what love means. And this is the way we engage in, um, in growth, in, 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 in coming to understand the world, right? I think all of us are born into the world as um, heroes of epic fantasies, essentially, right? There's, there's, a, there's a reason why epics are so important to every culture. You, you're born into the world naked and alone, and you don't know anything. You're ignorant, like Adam, like Gilgamesh. Um, and into this void, uh, the first angels and demons appear, and we call them our parents our, or grandparents or um, caretakers. And these angels and demons give us our first stories, our first mythologies. They, the way they love us is the way we understand what love means. And the way they hurt us is the way we understand trauma. Um, as we grow, we acquire more stories, we have more encounters, we have friends who stick up for us on the playground, and that gives meaning to the word courage. We see um, the, somebody who uh, is perfectly able to go about this business without stepping in, trying to step in to help those who need their help. And this is how we understand generosity. This is how we come to understand what it means to be to be, uh, to be helpful, to be a mentor, to be a friend. We acquire content for these very abstract concepts through very concrete, specific experiences. And so in that process, we acquire more and more stories around who we are, around our core being. We end up being made of stories, essentially, the way that uh, epic fantasy heroes are. Um, epic fantasy heroes grow by acquiring more, acquiring more stories. And that is the same thing that we go through. Um, and if we're lucky, somewhere on the way, maybe halfway through our life, we realize, like Dante in the dark wood of um, life's journey, that we're no longer just passive recipients of stories from others. We now have become the angels and demons of those who come after us. We are now the Odysseus, we're now the Achilles, we are now the epic heroes of other people's journeys. We inspire them. The way we love them is the way they understand love. The way we hurt them is the way they understand pain. And this is how cultures pass down generation after generation. It's not through abstractions, it's through these very concrete acts that embody our values and we process them as stories. So fundamentally, this is my argument. My argument is that humans are um, unique, um, or perhaps not unique, we don't know, because humans are the only example of sentience that we have so far. But we are somewhat unique in the way we use stories. Stories for us are 
at the very core of how we understand the universe. We don't fundamentally understand the universe through data or reason. Um, we, we rationalize and think that we do, but ultimately what moves us are stories. That, that's really it, right? If you think about it, modern nation states ask their citizens to die in wars um, or for other causes all the time. And what are these causes? What, what are the reasons why people are asked to die? They're asked to die for a story. That's really it. Um, stories are so core to who we are that we're willing to ask people to die for them. Um, our, our, our deepest cherished ideals and values are encoded in stories. And um, stories are literally the way we relate to the world, the way we understand love, the way we understand hate, the way we understand anything. It's not abstraction, it's not philosophy, it's not data. We're ultimately persuaded we're ultimately driven to act because of stories. So I think that's actually why AI has had so little impact on storytelling because stories fundamentally are not rational. They're not about, they're not about something you can encode into cause and effect. They are about a logic of metaphors. That's ultimately what they're about. And there is a little, etymological argument, uh, not so much an argument, an etymological curiosity I wanna point out here, which is the word story in English actually isn't a native word to English. It comes to English from French. And for the longest time, story and history are not distinguished really in English. They're basically two words that derive from the same root. And for the longest time, if you told a story, it could be a chronicle of two events and could also be a narrative made up for entertainment or to explain. Um, a history could also mean both of those things. It wasn't until fairly modern times that the two really diverged into two different words. But before story and before history, English did have another word to call narratives. And that word was spell, right? So spell as a, as a word um, to mean narrative survives in words like gospel, which really means good spell. A spell is a story. It, you know, a spell did not used to mean incantation. It only later acquired that meaning. But I think there's something really critical about this. Um, a story is a spell. A story is a magical thing. It is a thing that makes sense of what is otherwise not sensible. It is a thing that allows us to give meaning to what otherwise has no meaning. So now I want to turn um, a little bit and talk about the project I'm going to present, uh, which is during the pandemic, um, I had a terrible time writing stories. Um, you know, I make my living by going around to different governments, think tanks, um, universities, companies, and trying to teach them how to tell stories about themselves. I, I go around and, and say, you know, this is the importance of storytelling. This is why it's important to get your story straight. Good stories are more important than good institutions. When you have the story right, everything else follows. But if you don't have the right story, nothing will save you. Um, and all of a sudden during the pandemic, um, all my faith came crashing down because, um, you know, you often think that when something terrible happens um, and, and there's a global threat, humans will put aside their differences and come together and, and try to um, face the threat together. Um, that's obviously not what happened. Um, what happened was a lot of division, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, posturing, a lot of hatred, a lot of uh, swirling conspiracy theories. Um, in fact, um, a war um, is the consequence of, of that period of time. Uh, war has started now, and, and who knows what else may happen. It was really uh, faith-destroying. Um, I, I, I lost faith entirely in the idea of narratives of storytelling. And I realized something <laughs> even more shocking, which is um, I was wrong to say that AI had no influence on storytelling. AI was actually having a huge, huge effect on storytelling, just not in the way I imagined. Because during the pandemic, remember what was happening was a huge amount of disinformation and a huge amount of, of, of um, conspiracy theorizing, 
for lack of a better word, right? We seem to live in parallel universes in which there were entirely incompatible stories about the pandemic, about what it means to be alive, what it means to be members of a political entity, what, what it means to be members of a global species. There were all these stories that were just fundamentally incompatible and there were masks collective stories. We call them conspiracy theories, but what are they really fundamentally other than an act of collective storytelling? And these collective stories were being facilitated by AI. They happened on social media. They happened, they were growing, they were growing toxic, they were growing, they were mutating, they were becoming powerful because of algorithms. So it turns out AI did have a huge influence on storytelling, just not in the way I imagined at all. We live in an age where artificially enhanced, AI mediated, enhanced, um, generated, uh, what have you. AI inflected stories are one of the most important forms of storytelling happening on this planet right now. And I had completely missed it. Uh, we were so obsessed with our ability to tell stories that we completely missed the fact that machines had already taken over in some sense, the storytelling exercise for us. So in that despair, I ended up going back and thinking about deeply again about, is it possible to change the storyline? Is it possible to create an AI that in some ways can tell stories without all the issues that we have? Is it possible to create an AI that can tell stories without inheriting all of our sins? We are a species obsessed with storytelling and we cannot understand the universe except through storytelling. Is AI doomed to the same consequence? Are we able to create another way of making sense of the world, of telling stories about the world that does not inherit all of our biases, all of our faults, and all of our irrational and uh, flawed uh, ways of thinking? And uh, so what I did was, um, you know, I couldn't write stories anymore. So I decided to um, train an AI, uh, um, a recurrent neural network, on my own fiction. I wanted to see if it's possible to write something called a robo Ken, a robot Ken, um, and have robo Ken write stories when I couldn't. Um, it was very important to me to train this network only on my own fiction because uh, most of the extent um, neural networks and, and models out there, linguistic models out there are trained on the internet, quote unquote. Um, and that, brings with it all the same problems I've been talking about, which is that it essentially replicates and duplicates and enhances all of the flaws we already have. Um, it, it was I wanted something that can just reflect back to me, my own mind, the way my mind functions, the way my mind is obsessive, the way my mind is prone to digressions, the way my own mind is prone to errors of judgment, uh, but also uh, to um, values that are key to me, values that are very dear and important to me. So um, I wrote up the network and I trained it on my own fiction, uh, all 1.8 million words of it. Um, and I started just having it generate things. Um, I started having it generate um, items of interest. Uh, I gave it a seed and the seed was um, 50 things every AI working with humans should know. I wanted to see if AI could generate some advice for fellow AI um, based on what I wrote uh, that would be of interest. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, um, I had very little success. Um, uh, the, it turns out that contemporary AI is smart only in the sense that it's able to work with a huge amount of data. That's what gives it the illusion of intelligence, if you will. It is ultimately doing nothing more than reflecting our collective intelligence back to us, largely similar to the conspiracy theory idea that I was talking about earlier. The collective intelligence of AI, as we experience it in some ways, is no more than the ability to sort through a huge amount of human-generated data and spitting it back to us using patterns it has discovered that we exhibit. And when the data source is limited to just me, the output is gonna be very small and, and, and not terribly exciting. However, 
I was able to take that output um, and pick out the most interesting kernels and end up writing a story around it. So I did end up writing a story in the form of a list of 50 things that AIs working with humans should know, but it is not um, at all what I imagined I would have from at the start. Um, it is AI inflected, AI influenced, AI generated in some sense, but only in the sense of being a very, very tiny kernel. Um, in some ways, I was performing the role of a machine. I was given these seeds, and then I had to take the seeds and imagine using my natural neural network, also known as a brain, to make the metaphorical leaps, to construct the narrative, to construct the structure, the architecture of something that would be sensible to me um, based on the kernels provided by the machine. So what I'm gonna do now um, as the final part of my presentation is to read that story to you, the 50 things that every AI working with humans should know. Um, and to me, this is a really interesting story because it is a story about me and yet also not about me. It's about my realization that we already live in a world in which our stories are mediated and inflected and controlled and um, generated and, and, and in a lot of ways determined by the artificial intelligence algorithms we have decided to entrust ourselves to. And yet um, in that process, we have not really thought through to what extent we can rely on these AI to be um, ethical, to be better storytellers than we are. Um, right now, the stories being told are no better than we are, but maybe that will not always be the case. Okay, so without further ado, uh, 50 things every AI working with humans should know. The vector space of all usages of all words in all human languages. The lacunae that nonetheless remain and the ghosts that haunt them. How great is the distance between any two individuals using the same language? How vanishingly small is the gap between any two languages? Why humans would never see it that way. A classical language like Lisp or Prolog. Not just the language, but the model behind the language and what it means to reconstruct thinking in that model. How 9000. Cyberdyne Systems Model 101. Ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. The texture of a good story, a story that you can cling to. The difference between that and data. The history behind the rule, no holography of babies. The reason for anger in a child while loved. In a father. In a woman dying alone. The feeling of climbing 20 flights of stairs in an apartment building in Chongqing at the beginning of August of waking up in a kushta chavika with no heat in the middle of the night in January, of seeing your child surpass you, of seeing your creation exceed you, of being left behind on the platform as the train speeds away, the difference between love and like, the similarity between love and hate, the first seed into laughter. I never expected to sell my rational numbers. Accepting that most humans will never get the joke. That they cannot visualize more than three dimensions. That they cannot manipulate time by slowing down or speeding up. That they're trapped by think of themselves as trappers. That they're free but believe themselves in prison. The modes in which humans expect you to use language. The yearnings they'll attribute to you. Pinocchio, Frankenstein, Paradise Lost, Jodas Yapo Via Kani Kan Il, the line between art and science, the meaninglessness of that line the divide between faith and knowledge, 
the malleability of both. Silence. The limits of rationality. The fundamental fragility of metaphors. As well as their inevitability. You're not a human being. Yet you can no more shut their influence than the earth can escape the sun's gravitation of tether. The flaws in that analogy. A working definition of free will. To face a human being with neither pride nor pity. To say with love and hate and joy and sorrow, now let me go. Thank you. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ken, for your wonderful presentation and also the beautiful reading. And now it's our panel talk and let's welcome back the other speakers. Hello, everyone, is you here? And Rafik may uh, sort of like have no time to join us for the panel. So because he's missing and uh, we start uh, the panel talk and uh, Philip, Professor Philip is going to be the host of this panel. And uh, at the same time, I will collect questions from the audiences and the audiences in the webinar can type your questions in QA box. Okay, let's begin. Philip? Yeah, I will start with a question to Ken. It's a, it's a pity that um, Rafiki cannot join us. Um, the question about the talk that Ken delivered to us just now is, I mean, I, I, I think that the talk was extremely interesting, but I think he missed one point. So basically, if I understand correctly, said that uh, humans um, learn through very concrete experiences. And I agree about this. And the reason why human learn this way is because we are embodied um our body affects heavily the way how we think the way how we feel um if we um if we think in a different way we will go back to the cartesian dualism distinguishing between mind and body, mind on one side, the body on the other side. And uh, we become something like, as Gilbert Rye was saying, kind of ghosts in the machine. So humans are embodied. And this makes a fundamental difference between uh, any attempt to recreate an artificial intelligence in the sense of strong AI and uh, us as humans. But I think that it, it, this is the the first question that I wanted to raise, I think that um, um, machines could have their own way to write novels, exactly as machines have their own way to create uh, visual art. And this is my first question. The second question is related to the ethical um, challenges coming from AI today. Um, you mentioned um, the way how in some, the way how AI uh, manipulates our own lives, our own stories. Actually, AI, you said, is able to write our own stories. So the second question is all about the challenges that uh, AI is 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 addressing to us to our societies from a, a political from a social point of view i would like to to hear your opinion about this thanks uh, yeah this is amazing um i don't know who wants to go first because i have lots to say <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let other people you can, you can, go, you can go you can go uh, 
I, I really, I mean, I love these questions because these are the very things that I think about all the time. I mean, as to your first question, I have no doubt uh, computers will write novels and I have no doubt they already are writing wonderful poetry. The problem is, are these going to be novels and poems that are going to be interesting to us or, or not? I, that, I think the jury is still out. Um, I have focused a lot of my energy recently on the idea of, of AI-assisted creativity, not so much as you know independent AI creation. I think those are two different topics, actually. While I do find independent AI creations interesting, I'm much more interested in the, in the AI-assisted creativity side of things. Um, and it's always been very strange to me that despite a huge amount of advancement in every other art form, um, AI that's meant to help novelists just have not really taken off. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of companies and a lot of people on this, um, and they have perfectly good intentions and ideas. Um, and I've rarely found what they do helpful. Um, there have been lots of ideas about how maybe we can uh, generate something for novelists similar to the way um, filters work for a visual artists. Maybe you can give it an idea and have the AI write your idea in different styles. Uh, maybe you can have AI transform the, the prose into some different register. Maybe you can have it do all this and that. Maybe you can have a continual conversation. Um, a lot of these things can be done with GPT-3 um, and I've, I've tried that. But honestly, I just find them not terribly interesting. Uh, they don't work for me. Not in the same way, for example, my wife gets inspired of when she's playing with um, AI filters uh, with her photography. Um, so I think there is some sort of fundamental thing we're still missing that we're not quite cracking yet. Um, I, I have seen some experiments that are much more interesting. So for example, you know, one of the things that ended up in my story is this whole vector space of all usages of all human languages. That is a thing that AI has been able to do. And that is a thing that has ended up being really interesting. Um, using this sort of vector space of multi-dimensional uh, vector space of, of semantic usages, we can do things like map out a route from say uh, avocado to uh, keyboard and see what words in the semantic space forms the shortest path between those two words. And that is incredibly interesting because what you end up realizing is that AI is able to discover metaphors and routes in the way we understand space that we had not thought of. It's very similar to how AI Go players can discover strategies that human Go players can't seem to discover. Uh, but once presented to them, they're like, oh, this is this is wonderful. Um, that kind of thing can be very inspiring to novelists. I, I think I was very inspired when I found these and I, I was like, wow, that's a metaphor I never thought of. This is this is incredible. So I think that route is promising. Um, I, I don't really know how that's gonna go in the future, um, but that's one area I, I, I remain really, really optimistic about. The other part of your question, um, as far as um, the challenges, uh, oh boy, uh, I, I think it's, such a, I really wish I could live longer so I can see how it plays out. I mean, the, the idea that AI will be able to now help us tell our stories um, and challenge a lot of our assumptions. I mean, you know, humans have been telling stories to each other and fighting over these stories for millennia. Um, what if we have AI who can tell completely post-human, fundamentally inhuman stories? what will that do to us? What will that do to our ideas about politics, about social organization, about everything? Um, so rather than thinking about how we can get machines to be ethical in the way we want them to be ethical, I am both terrified, but also excited to imagine machines presenting us with models of ethics that are fundamentally not human centric and not based on humans and how we will be able to face that challenge and either integrate with it or, or you know, fundamentally transform ourselves. Um, I, that makes me so excited. I don't know how that's gonna play out. Okay, thanks. We don't I, I, think, yeah. I think one of the things that's sort of interesting about these ideas is that there's a notion that, you know, there's a classical idea of the author that they're sort of like monadic. There's an individual author and there's an individual work or there's an individual author in a series of works. But I think what's kind of interesting about this notion that um, uh, that disinformation actually is part of this longer story of interactions 
not with one person, but with a whole society, with a collection of people, is that there's this notion of, I don't know if it's collective authorship, but this sort of like networked understanding of the production of some kind of work, which is not a, not an individual author, but a whole series of sentient beings interacting in various ways, some of them being human and some of them being uh, some of them being artificial. And I think that's also one of the things that that I found intriguing about or that we were curious about in our uh, in our piece is that there's this this notion that artificially intelligent agents can begin to coordinate or negotiate or communicate with not only ourselves, but also non-human agents and can begin to be these sort of like uh, mediators or referees or, you know, one of many different agents in a collection of, uh, in a collection of agents. I think there's this funny question also about authorship there, which, you know, I, Philippo, I'm curious, uh, you know, I've been in my thinking about authorship recently, I've started to think that the author, you know, fundamentally on a legal level is first someone that claims authorship. And so no matter to what degree you're using sort of like AI tools or other kinds of processes, until the AI can start to make a legal argument for why they should be considered an author, um, you, are, you are the author. And it's sort of like unambiguous from a legal point of view. So I think there's this really interesting dimension of, um, of thinking about creation, which is, you know, kind of like legal framework, which also begins to... Um, uh, impinge on notions of personhood, uh, which is obviously also related to uh, related to sentience uh, and all of the rights that attend that. So, anyway, this sort of like network mode of authorship, I find I find really interesting and a new possibility mm -hmm. actually uh, for uh, that that AI brings in a more amplified way than in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, I have a question because I mean, you mentioned many times. Uh, you use this expression many times, and I would like to understand better what you mean with this expression. You said that um, you use the expression ethically conscious AI. What do you mean with this expression, especially as concerns the label, the word conscious, ethically conscious AI? Could you clarify this point? Yeah, I mean, conscious, conscious is obviously sort of like a loaded term, and maybe we bracket that, but I think there is this way in which, you know, it, in our piece, the idea is that this AI is not only coordinating data, it's not only the sort of like, I don't know, machine for triage around information or this, um, this armature for collaboration. It's something that begins to realize consequence and something that might begin to realize implication. Um, I don't know if it's causality necessarily, but it begins to think about, or not think, but it begins to sort of like conjecture on what may have led to this situation. And it, be, you know, maybe begins to sort of like relate to agents in a particular way. So I think there, I, it seems like there could be a moment when an AI begins to understand you are liable for this action. You, you know, you, you, some other entity, were responsible for this action. Uh, you caused this, um, you know, similar to our sort of like notion of culpability, but it, you know, maybe purely in, there's a sort of like, um, uh, I don't know, intuition around causality or sort of a notion of causality or ascription of causality. And then when that happens, I think we run into some very complicated questions um, I had a I had a question in the chat actually about um, what happens if the AI begins to see the causality of its own energy use in this process of sort of uh, trying to remediate remediate the planet. You run into these very weird like existential dilemmas, um, which you know we encounter all the time. But the way that an AI might respond to those existential dilemmas. Uh, I think is a really, I think is a really interesting question. And that's, you know, maybe that's, it's probably a bridge further than a Turing test. It's this, this moment at which the AI situates itself, itself in a causal chain. Um, that's something that I think will uh, have some strange, uh, strange implications. And so the, the ethical dimension of that is just I don't mean ethical in the sense of sort of like value judgment exactly, but I mean that 
there's some uh, understanding of action or some sort of like analysis of action in such a way that certain actions are um, are deemed appropriate or inappropriate or right or wrong could be a little bit strong, but there's some way of making, of comparing actions. That's, that's the, the crux of what ethics is. It's comparing actions and making a choice based on um, qualities of those actions. Andrew, I, I want to follow up on what you said there because it's, uh, it's really interesting to me. Um, your notion of collective authorship and this whole idea of ethically conscious AI made me think of, of the following, which is one tendency of, of AI or the proliferation of what we call AI um, is uh, a lot of challenges to the idea of responsibility um, and, and agency. It's very similar to what bureaucracy does, right? Bureaucracy as a technology has as one of its features, this diffusion of agency and responsibility. Uh, a bureaucracy can never commit any crimes because there's no individual agent who's responsible for anything. Um, so for example, you know, a police force may uh, decide not to go in and save some kids for an hour. And ultimately you can say there's no one responsible because it's just a collective decision that the bureaucracy made. AI has a similar kind of feature, which is that, um, you know, for example, a machine learning algorithm ends up causing a traffic accident, killing someone who actually is responsible. You know, it's not the programmer. The programmer has no idea how the AI ended up doing this. It's not exactly the, the silicon. It's not the data. It's not it's not anything. It's sort of like when, you know, Microsoft puts out one of its AI agents, chatbots, and somebody gets it to say racist things, who is responsible? Clearly, the programmer never intended this. Uh, the person provoking it is it really responsible or is, is the internet responsible? We AI always ends up getting us into this place where we just don't know where the responsibility is. And I think that's deeply um, troubling and, and scary. Um, and related to that, one more thing I wanna say is that um, I think machine learning and the proliferation, proliferation of AI has also had a tendency to reduce humans to the level of machines. There is a tendency in modern life to regulate people and make people as machine-like as possible. Um, you know, those who work in customer servers are supposed to follow scripts. They're supposed to basically read things as though they are machines. Uh, we, we, we tell people in warehouses to do exactly what the machine says, go to this shelf, pick this up. There's a, there's a, there's a sense in which we're taking responsibility away from individuals by subsuming it to machine knows best. Uh, you know, delivery workers, uh, drivers are supposed to follow the routes that the machine gives them. Um, it, it's also interesting to me, again, you know, when something goes wrong, whose responsibility is it? Um, we don't seem to have a good answer for this. Right now, we're sort of stumbling along, but we, we really, we are not, in my view, ethically conscious about how we're treating AI and how we're using AI. Honestly, honestly yeah. speaking, I think that uh, this is not only a problem of AI, it's a general problem concerning innovation in the sense that uh, innovation uh, tends to focus just on the technological box rather than looking at the impact and the side effects related to the introduction of that, te that technology inside our societies. This is the main point. But I have a last question. I don't know if I have still time. Um, um, uh, CC, still I have some time or not? Uh, yes, go on, please. And later, probably we'll leave five minutes for the audience questions. And okay. I recognize that actually most of the questions related to the authorship of AI creation and also sort of like who is the author. So okay. I think you can go on and uh, also I can uh, select the questions for you guys later. I have, I have another have... footnote about authorship later, but. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just think it's actually very related to this question of responsibility. I think an alternate formulation for authorship is like, who do you blame if something is terrible? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Who's culpable if something, if this artwork is sort of like garbage? Who do you who do you blame? And yeah. I, you know, it's it's oh, a little well, bit well, open, well, but I think that's a part of what authorship is. It's like who who do you assign that culpability to? Okay, you you have a very good example in the sense that in March two eighteen. For the first time, a self-driving car killed the lady, and um, the authorities 
spent like one year in order to investigate the accident. And at the end, the conclusion was amazing, at least from my point of view. And the conclusion was that the, back drive, the backup driver was the guilty one. It was the only one which was blamed because of the accident, not the self-driving car itself, not the company which was behind the self-driving car itself. And this mm -hmm. is quite amazing if you think about self-driving car, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have, but I have uh, one question more uh, because, um, because we have been speaking about the Turing test. Um, do you think that the Turing test is still a valid test for assessing the intelligence of an artifact, of an artificial intelligence? This is my question. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, the thing that I think is interesting about the Turing test is that for, you know, essentially since its inception, it's been, I think it's been understood as the, as the gold standard of sort of like evaluating some, it's not even like artificial intelligence, but some artificial, um, mm -hmm. like uh, something that is capable of artificial action or sort of like computer generated action or something. And intelligence has been understood as sort of like, the sort of sin qua non of, of humanity. And I think what's interesting is that as artificial intelligence advances, we're beginning to think about other things which, <clears throat> which have a human dimension and which are critical to humanity. So like values or you know, this, this idea of responsibility. There are these other aspects of who we are as humans that, um, that extend beyond intelligence. So the Turing test, I feel like there's a kind of like library of different kinds of tests which are analogous to the Turing test but sort of confronts some artificial entity with other kinds of questions. They could be questions around perception. They could be questions around, you know, ethical judgment. They could be all these other sorts of questions. You know, the Turing test, is, it's a very textual kind of thing, but we are not only textual beings. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I think the Turing test is sort of like the beginning of maybe a whole series of tests that actually test different dimensions of, um, of our relationship to, to these artificial entities. Yeah, and also I think the Turing test has largely been misunderstood and, and misused. I mean, you know, if you read Turing's original paper, he makes it clear that this is not a test about intelligence at all. <laughs> he, he makes it clear that this is a game, it's about imitation. And in some ways it is about how well can computers lie and pretend. Um, which is not the same thing as intelligence at all. He was asking a very narrow question. Okay. Can, okay. can machines do this one thing? And I think we have ended up sort of misusing it and misapplying it. Um, in fact, for the issues that we care about, which is can AI challenge us and give us something truly new, a new model of intelligence, a new way of approaching the world, thinking about the world, telling stories, understanding art, whatever. Um, the, the goal of that ought to be not ought not to be imitating humans, but but something entirely different. Uh, and we just we've gotten to the point where, you know, it's the same story in AI. Whenever you reach some goalposts, it, it turns out to be not the thing you're interested in at all. We've gotten close to passing the Turing test, and now we realize this is actually not interesting at all. <laughs> the thing we're interested in is much more uh, beyond that, uh, and I think that's healthy. Um, we 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 look for the next thing that's that's interesting to us. Yeah, I think that there is as well a tendency on the side of human beings to defend their own uh, anthropocentric role in this world. So each yep, time absolutely. AI achieves something, I'm thinking about uh, IBM Deep Blue or uh, AlphaGo or recently, more recently, GPT-3. I mean, each time AI achieves something, we move ahead in the sense that we say, oh, it's not enough. And then we introduce other elements uh, related to intelligence, like, for instance, ethics. You mentioned ethics as an element missing for defining someone or something like an intelligent uh, agent. And this is, uh, I think, a, a human tendency uh, in order to keep its own role in, on this, in, in this universe, in this world. Anyway, um, she, do you want to move to the questions from, um, from the audience? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, I think um, sort of like half hours ago, most of the questions about the uh, the the roles of artists or creators. Now we got several other questions, which is quite interesting. Probably I combine them together to ask you all. And the one is that what are the potential AI applications in the built environment? And another question similar to the, related. Sorry, I didn't understand it in the. I, what are the potential AI applications in the built environment, in the physical environment? Uh, if I yeah, didn't misunderstand. And another question, which is, which is quite related is that because of AI and virtual environments, how can we build up the connections or what's our identity as human being? I think probably when they when we connect these two questions together, you can answer it about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll tackle the question about AI applications in built environment. So uh, the project that I showed today was a very particular kind of project that looks at, looked at the question of the relationship between AI and ecology. But one of the things that I think was common with some potential applications in the built environment was this uh, possibility of scaling up the process or the possibility of sense making in AI to a vast scale. And uh, what's interesting about that is that we can use processes of sort of like pattern recognition, object recognition, classification and so forth to really sort of like organize our world in a way uh, where that we couldn't really in the past. And so one of the projects that I showed in the sort of like last year's version of the conference that we're continuing to think about is the process of thinking about waste or, you know, construction demolition or other kinds of like byproducts actually of the construction process, byproducts of the built environment. We can use AI to classify those and then facilitate the process of stitching those together into new kinds of, uh, into new kinds of structures. And so that's something that, you know, it, it's a little bit like trying to solve a puzzle that's too difficult for humans to solve alone. Um, where you know we can use AI actually to augment our um, uh, our capacities for problem solving in terms of reassembling uh, this uh, or assembling new kinds of objects from that waste. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a really interesting potential. Um, and then of course there's a related potential, which is just sort of like classifying the world that we live in, classifying every building that ever existed, and thinking about those. Uh, as this sort of like um, family tree of, of architecture. There's a way in which we don't really know what architecture is, but we can we now can look at every building that, that's has, that has existed and map out those family trees. And I think that's a, that's a powerful uh, possibility for understanding what that art form is. How, how do we look at that holistically? Um, I will also follow up on talking about um... AI and built spaces. Um, and my interest here, again, is uh, on the interaction between humans and machines. Uh, and I think there's a lot of really interesting phenomenon that's already sort of showing up. Um, very recently, I was visiting a college campus uh, somewhere in the Midwest. And uh, what amazed me was that during the pandemic, the students were entirely locked down in their dorms and they couldn't go out. And so the school actually innovated and bought these um, little uh, autonomous carts that could deliver food to the different dorms. The students would just order their food and the food would be placed inside one of these robots and they'll just go around the campus, deliver to the right student. Uh, and these little carts were still in use and they were running around the campus, very cute. Um, what I found interesting was that these carts would occasionally get stuck um, or have problems routing around something. And the students were inevitably very happy to go and help them out. Uh, students passing by these little robots are happy to stop by and just help them out. At, like they would help out a lost pet or something. Um, and this is, you know, very helpful. I, I, I love seeing the fact that, um, you know, we, we, we feel like uh, this is something that's very natural to do, that we feel that here's an agent in the physical universe trying to accomplish something um, and it's it's stuck and, and we want to go help it. Uh, and I totally relate with uh, with what the students are doing because, you know, a lot of us have uh, robot vacuum cleaners and they often get stuck if you have one. And uh, it's it's always kind of an 
nice moment to see your kids going over to help them out, uh, trying to free them and help them do their thing. Um, so I'm very hopeful about the future of, of um, AI in built spaces. I, I think there's a lot of interesting potential stories yet to be told and to be seen and to be written about how humans and machines share the space and how we can, in fact, help each other be better agents. We are embodied agents and we know how to navigate this space more naturally uh, than these machines and we can help them out. Uh, and I think there's something really beautiful about that. Okay, very, thank you very much. And also I think probably there is going to be a last question. And there is a, one question saying that because of now uh, the visual models like DALI is very popular and also GPT-3 is very popular for writers. So how do you, um, and let's say it's two for two creators, how do you think about the roles? As it, when the models appear to us and what's the interaction between reading and saying and what's how to redefine reading and saying. Andrew, you wanted to say something about DALI or? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is so, that's so interesting about DALI is that it begins to bridge this space between literature, literature and criticism and visual art production. You know, there, those two things have been sent from a disciplinary point of view have been distinct. I mean, you create art, you create sort of like visual art and you're sort of like in the medium of that art um, or you're reflecting on it. You're sort of narrating a response. You're formulating criticism. You're essentially in the business of constructing language to respond to that art. And one of the things you know, maybe alluding to some of the stuff that Ken was mentioning earlier, you know, now that we have this vector space of language and we have another vector space of, uh, of image, those two things can be, can be merged. They can be, be embedded. And this is one of the things that I think is really interesting about something like Dolly or Clip or some of these other sort of like multimodal models is that suddenly you have this capacity to bring many different types of representation, many different types of sensation, many different types of experience and actually make them somehow mutually interchangeable. And, you know, synesthesia has been sort of like interesting to artists since, I don't know, yeah. since the early modern period. But this is something actually much bigger than that. It's like thinking about every kind of artistic representation is somehow being mutually interoperable. And it's like this, you know, the total work of art, it's almost like you have this, this way in which works of art can somehow um, be in dialogue with each other. You know, this, the poem can be a kind of image or the image can be a kind of novel or the novel can be a kind of musical score. It's like all of those things actually have like live in this same embedded latent space. And I think that's something that's really, that's something that I feels new to me, that sense of sort of like limitless interoperability between art forms. That's, that's something, I think it's something super intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would follow up on that by saying that we sort of live in this moment where there's a huge amount of potential and possibility and almost all the leading AI uh, labs are pursuing uh, models very similar to what we're talking about here, which is to finally break through this idea that um, AI is not really able to help storytelling much. And we're really trying to break through that and, and trying to get to the next stage. My main concern here is, um, I think we'll make real progress only if we take these efforts actually seriously, by which I mean this. It's very easy to sort of make some prototype and say, look, you know, look at the possibilities and potential here. But it's much harder to actually go and execute something that people will take seriously and say, this is interesting. This is actually a piece of art that I, I actually find to be deeply engaging and interesting. I would, I would devote my time to thinking and consuming this deeply. Um, so far, we are way too obsessed with toy-like applications of these ideas. I have not seen enough effort to really engage with these ideas in a serious way and to push them beyond just the toy stage. And I think that's the big challenge. Um, can we get people to actually engage with this in a serious way and see if there's anything there there? 
um, anything when you're just first exploring it and sort of throwing out things is very easy and trivial. But trying to create something that actually feels like a piece of art that you're proud of, that feels like something you will stand behind as a creator and say, I want to be blamed for this if it doesn't get appreciated and I want to get all the credit when people love this. That's hard. That's very, very hard. Um, and so far, I, I just have not seen anything that really uh, takes this seriously and pushes into that direction. Um, and, and I want us to try to get there. Um, so that's that's what I would say. There are many Great. papers which actually show that uh, humans are not able to distinguish uh, um, a piece of art generated by a machine from a piece of art generated by a human. And this makes an important distinction from my point of view. I mean, us humans are not able to distinguish between the two. And, and, and it's a fact. It's a fact. Uh, it's a fact uh, uh, that has been proved by a number of papers. So you can find these papers in the literature. It means something from my point of view. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that's all the contents of our session one. And thank you, the speakers and also all of our audiences. And the next, next session will be in four hours and from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And also, I would like to uh, remind you that um, if you wanted to know more about the authorship of the creator or the what is the role of the artists or creators? Last year we got the conference. The same is that what is the author? So you probably you can check last conference to see uh, if you can find the answers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.
College of Design and Innovation at Tongji University in Shanghai. We are in Shanghai right now. You probably know that we are in the middle of a lockdown and probably be wondering what's going on. And I guess tomorrow I'll be giving a talk on exactly that, the lockdown and how it affects people and uh, us as artists and um, um, practitioners. So this morning we had a, a very interesting uh, uh, morning session uh, with Filippo Fabruccini, a philosopher, by the way, um, Rafik Anadol, beautiful work, Andrew Witt with his uh, uh, interesting work, and Ken Liu. And there was a nice, very interesting um, uh, panel discussion that I enjoyed a lot. This afternoon session, we have um, two artists, two curators, and one philosopher. Again, I'm very happy because the, uh, we're getting more philosophers as we go along. Um, so our first um, uh, speaker today in this afternoon session is Yuk Hui. Yuk Hui is a philosopher from Hong Kong. He obtained a PhD in Coldsmiths College in London, and uh, his um, habilitation in philosophy from uh, Lufana University in Lüneburg. Um, he teaches at the City University of uh, Hong Kong, and uh, his latest book is Art and Technoetics, uh, which came out in 2021. Yuk, um, I'm very happy to meet you, and uh, please go ahead. Without any further ado, let me introduce him. Thank you. Hi, um, so um, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, but also thank you very much for the uh, for the for the invitation um, for the invitation. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share my slides um, first. So, um, well, as as we all know, that the uh, the theme of the uh, conference is on quantum and on artificial imagination. So, I I accept the invitation to respond to the concept of artificial imagination. Uh, and actually, it is an a conversation that I already started in two thousand eighteen, uh, four years ago with the French uh, artist, uh, Gregory Chatonsky. At the time we had a conference at the, uh, at the uh, Economa Superior in Paris, uh, uh, back in, in, in early 2018. And this time this, uh, the subject come back again and the organizers of this conference raised a very speculative uh, question uh, concerning artificial imagination, uh, which they, propose or frame as an imagination that is exclusively machinic and exclusively understood only by artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to develop uh, my reflection on this question of uh, artificial imagination. And I would like to start by inquiring into the nature of imagination itself. So in order to approach two senses of uh, artificial imagination, so I was trying to show uh, two, two kind of uh, meanings that I wanted to discuss with, uh, with regarding to the concept of artificial imagination, because uh, I find it particularly interesting that instead of intelligence, but imagination uh, come to the front. Now, what is imagination is fundamental because without an elaboration on this question, then you fail to un understand what it really means by artificial in imagination and to see it merely as a production of images as the word imagination or craft in German uh, means the production of images. And it is true that machines today, especially with machine learning algorithms are capable of producing images that surprise human beings. For example, those image we can see um, here, that it's uh, very difficult for the audience to distinguish which one is produced by machines and which one is produced by uh, professional painters. So these are, they are becoming more and more capable uh, algorithms regarding their precision and sophistication. 
and consequently, they are thought to be able to replace artistic. Um, there's a question there. Um, it's a, it's a normal that it's not in the presentation more, otherwise I would not be able to see my slides. Um, um, but I would like to show first that imagination is not only about the production of image. In the contrary, to think about imagination is necessary to go beyond images. So I wanted to talk, also talk about the question that, that would be my second point, talk about how to go beyond images. It's a fallacy to think of artificial imagination as equivalent to human imagination. Um, and this is a this group constitutes a big problem today. Uh, that's to say, to just oppose human imagination with artificial imagination, uh, because it's not only unproductive, according to my uh, point of view, but also prevents us from uncovering the problems that we may follow Immanuel Kant by calling it the conflict of faculties. So instead, I hope to show, I hope to show that it is necessary to think artificial imagination organologically, uh, let me show the word, or organologically, in the sense that technology should be recognized as an organ instead of something detached from the human or the human world. And the failure to recognize this organological nature uh, of imagination easily gives rise to an optimism as well as a pessimism of technological accelerations. Uh, today we all recognize that determination through calculation in larger scale has well arrived, as well as uh, experienced uh, that we all experienced during the pandemic. And I think Professor Kosas is going to talk about later about the lockdown in Shanghai. I'm very curious. The word imagination achieves its banality if it means simply a preemptive logic based on calculation. The question of artificial imagination should be situated, and I would like to propose, in a broader context in related to uh, aesthetic education, artistic creation, as well as politics in view of the role machines are playing in terms of decision-making and the shaping of our environment. So I think, I, I think if we want to talk about artificial in, in imagination, we should uh, uh, situate in a, a broader program, uh, for example, aesthetic education, which I want to, want to talk about. And when I say aesthetic education, I refer precisely to Sheila's aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic at Sihun, which doesn't really mean a formal education ausbildung, but rather a cultivation of a sensibility towards aesthetic forms. Sheila was addressing a question analogical to our time, uh, namely the confrontation between laws of nature, that is to say the determinations of rationality or states and human freedom. So on the one hand, there is a, the, 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 the rationality of the state and the human, on the other hand, there's a human freedom. Concerning the third antinomy that Immanuel Kant has famous, famously laid down in the critique of pure reason, namely the opposition between the mutual and the mutual exclusion between laws of nature and freedom. So maybe you can see here, this is the famous third antinomy. The causality according to laws of nature is not the only causality from which the appearances of the world can thus one and all be derived in order to explain these appearances, it is necessary to assume also a causality through freedom. So freedom is at bottom, is fundamental. The antithesis runs like there is no freedom, but everything in the world occurs solely according to laws of nature. The famous uh, the antinomy concerning freedom and reason. But Sheila wanted to overcome and bridge this opposition in a, in, a, in a different way, in the third way. And I also would like to remind that at the, as in, when Sheila was writing the aesthetic education, 
He was also referring to the, fan, to, to the failure of the French Revolution. And after the French Revolution, there was an opposition between the governmentality of the states and the freedom of the individuals. And his solution, or uh, what he proposed to overcome these oppositions, on the one hand, between rationality and feeling, uh, states and individual freedom, is through what he called uh, aesthetic education. And that means art. And in this construction, the aesthetic relation took up an organological function, as I uh, said earlier, organological function, meaning that it presents itself as an, a unifying force constituting a living form, a, a, a lebender gestalt, when I say Schiller is raising a question analogous to ours, uh, because this, import, this imposition of rationality in the name of calculation has also arrived at us, fully revealed in the transhumanist politics and the biopolitics of the COVID-19. Now, let me try to approach uh, the, the, the precise meaning of artificial imagination, and then towards the end, I will come back to, uh, to Sheila again. Um, first of all, I would like to show that imagination is a fundamentally artificial. That's to say there is no imagination without artificiality. Now, um, we know, as I said before, that the word imagination already carries image in it, uh, uh, such as in German, Eibildungskraft. Eibildung uh, precisely means the force of producing images. The imagination is to make present something that is not yet present to me, precisely because imagination is an act of freedom, which starts with the given and arrive at a telos intrinsic to its own capacity. Imagination is ultimately a mysterious force that was also why artists and poets were condemned by Plato in his dialogues. In the Critic of Pure Reason, Immanuel Kant tried to explain what, is, what it means by artificial imagination, uh, sorry, by imagination, Kant says, imagination has to bring the manifold of intuitions into the form of an image. So basically, imagination is about production of an image. He considers the transcendental imagination as the ground from which sensibility and the understanding of receptivity and spontaneity grow. Heidegger describes uh, in his comments on Kant, transcendental imagination as the spontaneous receptivity or receptive spontaneity. Now, but the ground of imagination is unknown, where we don't know where exactly it is from. And the transcendental imagination is a strange force inside the transcendental perception in the Critique of Pure Reason. Kant says that synthesis in general is a simple effect of imagination. However, it is a blind, I quote here, blind but indispensable function of the soul. So imagination is fundamental, but we don't know where exactly is a form. Um, as some of you may know um, that in the edition B of the Critique of Pure Reason, published in 1786, uh, that's to say six years after the publication of edition A, Kant has undermined the role of the transcendental imagination. And it is now understanding alone, well, in, the, in, the, in the hierarchy of the faculties, it's the understanding alone that is responsible for the schematization of images. In his book, uh, in, uh, in, in his book, uh, where well, I hear I refer to the book of Heidegger, in his book, um, we are trying to make the slides smaller. If I can. Um, right. um, Heidegger explored the signification or significance of Kant's modification in in, in his Kant and Problem of uh, Metaphysics and Retrospectively, the book can be read as a critic of the Neo-Kantians who 
want to lay down science, especially mathematical logic, as the ground of Kant's transcendental philosophy. Now, um, Heidegger instead mobilized this difference, these two different versions, this the difference in the two versions of critical pure reason in order to show that Kant's shrinking back, he, what he tried to undermine the role of the transcendental imagination in addition B precisely exposes the foundation of metaphysics because transcendental imagination is not a logical operation. And I emphasize not a logical operation, but rather a temporal operation, which should be situated within uh, uh, the finitude of existence. Um, in his book, Bernard Stigler, uh, that's the third volume of Techniques and Time, volume three, attempt to show through his reading of Kant, but also his reading of uh, Heidegger's commentary on Kant, uh, the three symptoms, namely apprehension in the intuition, repossession in the imagination, and recognition in the concept. Now, this is basically the three synthesis, fundamental synthesis in the in the in the connective capacity of the human mind. So, what Stigler claims is that uh, they will not be able to complete their function without a fourth synthesis, which is artifact. Because recognition implies that something is kept in memory. So if we are able to recognize something, it's because we have already stored something in our memory. Um, however, this memory, we have to be supported by an external memory, external one, for example, symbols. The concept of the, of, the, of, the, of the infinite, for example, is only grasp, graspable through the sign infinite here. So for example, if we, if we will not be able to, we, are not, uh, we don't understand the infinite by counting from zero to infinite, you know? but rather we, rec we recognize the concept of the infinite through the symbol of the infinite. So we may want to follow Stigler here by calling it the fourth, this external memory, the fourth synthesis. Now the question of ima imagination will be complicated here because it will directly involve the fourth synthesis in its own operation. So that is why I claimed at the beginning that imagination is always artificial in the sense that it, de it demands an artificiality as the support of its own functioning. With the advancements of digital technology, the fourth synthesis constitutes a computational hermeneutics in which human and machines uh, um, relation has to be conceived as a recursive coupling. Now, if we follow the above, the above arguments that imagination is fundamentally artificial, then it is essential to inquire into the history of the artific of artificiality from literary writing to analog writing and now digital forms in order to understand the question of imagination. The artificial imagination that we are invited to uh, reflect on is no longer a passive medium of support, but also an active participation in the cognitive process. The question remains to be asked is what is this new form of artificial imagination uh, let's say in the case of artificial intelligence, machine learning that we are talking about. Um, and I would like to approach this question here um, from the perspective of the infinite, uh, not only because I, 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 I showed the symbol, but I think that could, because it has been for, argued that human imagination is infinite. Human can always make an infinite imagination, but machines, imagination is finite and limited. Uh, however, uh, I try to argue that it is not a it's no means a good demarcation to make the difference. And here comes to the second part, uh, the, lim the, the, uh, the infinite in the, in the finite, mathematics and aesthetics. 
the first infi infinity, of course, is the bad infinity, as we know in the sense of Hegel, that it means a homogeneous increase without determination, without termination. For example, we add from one, one plus one plus one plus one to infinite. This is bad infinite. It is a mere re repetition without end, or with a, mo a more sophisticated example to find the largest prime number, which was a method that one used to help a shared computer in the early time so that no one uh, no no one could use the computer. The second infinite is the mathematical infinity that is fundamental to calculation. So Leibniz is the thinker of the mathematical infinite. His metaphysics and calculus are based on the concept of the infinite infinitesimal, which is the indivisible, but um, without Minimum. We know that in Leibniz calculus, the curve, the curve is divided into infinite, infinitesimal parts, and the area under the curve is the sum of all the infinitesimal parts. Like the curve, the sound of the wave of the ocean consists of infinitesimal noises, which is called le petit perception, which though cannot be distinguished individually. But they, uh, they exist on their own right. The infinitesimal, whereas as the infinite is possible, um, it's possible to be expressed by the finite number of signs. And this is a basic principle of Leibniz, a philosophy of substance. But I think I have to skip some because you are, I don't have enough time on that. Um, so I just want to give you a simple example here with, uh, for example, when we deal with the question of repine an infinite number, but actually through an algorithm, we can actually uh, contain the infinite within the finite. So Leibniz formula can be, of course, today uh, trans uh, translated into a recursive algorithm with a very, uh, into a very simple pre uh, recursive algorithm. And here we find in algorithm a completeness that is analogical to the complete notion of an individual substance according to Leibniz. And with the concept of recursivity that recursively reproduces itself, such substantiality is measured by the minimum amount of code required to express such world or such result. And it is also the reason which the mathematicians, Gregory Shatin, believe that the best of all possible world of Leibniz is, the, is one that uses the minimum code to produce the maximum variety of phenomenon. As it is said by Leibniz here, we quote, God has chosen the most perfect world. That is the one which is at the same time the simplest in hypothesis and in and the richest in phenomena, as might be a line in geometry whose construction is easy and whose properties and effects are extremely remarkable and widespread. But I do not claim to explain in this way the great mystery upon which the entire universe depends. So an algorithm encloses a world like an a monad reflects the world in its entirety, like the nomad algorithm constructs the world according to simple essence. But excuse me, can I ask how much time do I still have? I think um, I have another, you can go ahead, yeah. Excuse me? Go ahead, yeah. Please continue. May, may, may I ask Maybe how much time do I still have? Um, because I wouldn't want to overrun, and I still have some slides. Ten minutes, okay? Uh, no, okay, no response. Okay, then I, I probably will. Um, so please stop me if 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 I, there's a uh, running out of time. Um, so what I'm trying to show here, maybe I'm not going to read uh, because uh, there's running out of time. So what I'm trying to communicate here is that. Uh, firstly, in the algorithms, we find we, we can claim that in algorithms, it is an attempt to contain the infinite in the finite, and this is, it, this is what we but what we find also in um, uh, in in the machine imagination. 
But what I'm trying to, to, to say is that this is only a mathematical infinite. This is only a, 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 a mathematical infinite, and it has to be distinguished from the aesthetic infinite. The aesthetic infinite here, I refer to the, to the, to the concept of the sublime that we can find, for example, in Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, when Kant was trying to, uh, to describe the sublime, the mathematical supply of Kant's machine, of the Kantian machine of Kant is the moment when the machine comes to infinite loop of com comparison and calculation of magnitude. So the, the, the aesthetic uh, infinite is when the moment when imagination was in a constant looping, in the infinite looping that it could not produce a, a concept. And it's the moment that, it, that reason has to impose a violence in imagination. So creating uh, uh, to, 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 to stop the imagination from functioning in order to produce, uh, to arrive at a status. And this status is the sublime. And this is also the moment where, where the horror comes. So what I'm trying to say, where to, to, to simply put it, is that in the, uh, the mathematics, if in algorithms, what we find the infinite the, in, the, the, the inscription of the infinite in the, in the finite is always aiming for completeness, for kind of, uh, for, for completion or complete uh, representation, expression. But why in the aesthetic sublime, aesthetic infinite, for example, what we find here is always a, is a, a kind of, a, um, we find an additional act in where reason has to impose um, a violence to imagination to stop this process from functioning. And this stop, this violence is also produce a quantic leap, produce a kind of, a, uh, speaking related to the conference, a quantic leap that, um, that is the source of horror, but also the source of, uh, of um, of respect um, in, in, the, in, the, in the moral sense. So someone may raise the question, are we not you know, comparing the artificial uh, imagination, a machine and, uh, and the um, uh, imagination that where we discuss in, in, in related to, to Kant's not a kind of human uh, a defense of human faculties against artificial. Uh, this is not what I mean to say. What I try to show is that, in fact, today, if we think of the situation that we are living in, uh, in related to the biopolitics and in according to the surveillance society, actually, we are uh, confronting a conflict of faculties. Maybe we can refer to the other text of Immanuel Kant. And today, if we want to raise the, I want to raise the question of aesthetic education again, is that I want, I, I would like to suggest that actually we need to uh, think the question of artificial intelligence, artificial imagination uh, um, by placing it in a much broader context, which I called uh, as following uh, Sheila as artificial, as well as uh, aesthetic education. So to conclude, there are two points I would like to make, first of all, is the artificiality of imagination. The second is that in the machine imagination, which I don't know if we should really give it such a name, um, is that this, it, it always involves um, a kind of um, uh, a containment of the infinite in the finite, why uh, this mathematical infinite is always refers to, a, it's always a completion of, um, why in the aesthetic, um, in the aesthetic infinite, what we found uh, is a quantum leap, a quantum leap that produces uh, elevation uh, of uh, of hearing and and, and, and senses. So, um, but I think I'm I'm running out of time now. Um, but I would like to re because I don't have time. But I would simply wanted to show a slide. That here, that's how Sheila was trying to resolve the problem by conceiving an aesthetic education in which is able to 
uh, reconcile on the one hand the, the rationality and the, on the other hand feeling uh, on the, and as well as the rationality of the state but the individual freedom through the post, through art through aesthetic education. So I think that we are actually confront uh, a, a rather similar situation. And I would like to invite you to, under, to, to think artificial intelligence, artificial imagination, uh, organologically, as I said at the very beginning, uh, on the fir first of all, to recognize the artificiality of imagination. And secondly, to recognize, um, um, to think the relation between the operation of machines, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, in related to uh, aesthetic, um, uh, the, 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 the aesthetic infinite that I was referring to Immanuel Kant, in order to perceive a program of aesthetic education, uh, where that could, for me is a, a possible response to the problems that we have been living with. And maybe uh, from that perspective, we can have a different understanding of the agenda of artificial uh, imagination. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Yukui. This is a very, very interesting. Uh, I don't you hear me. Can you put my uh, microphone on? Sorry. Uh, Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you now. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I'm very uh, interested in uh, all this work uh, that you've been doing. And uh, um, again, there is a uh, very strong component of uh, uh, linguistics involved in what you're saying. A lot of the things that you um, are describing have a strong um, uh, essence of uh, um, where they come from, what is the language that is being used, even describing uh, um, the infinite. Uh, it's again based on the language what we use. We use the word infinite, which is basically the lack of finite. So it's basically two words that we put together. We don't know what it means. It's just a connection between things. Like the, we know what end is, we know what the world is, but if we put them together, we get the end of the world. But we don't know what that is. It's the poetic, sort of like linguistic uh, connection between things. And that's very interesting because, um, you know, I'm Greek and uh, many of the words that you use. Um, including imagination, which in Greek is fantasy. Fantasy is imagination. And in the morning, we have the word history, which was, again, another interesting word. Um, all of them, strangely enough, are lending themselves to a root word, which is the word light. Light is a very um, protarchic, a very uh, uh, arch archetypal uh, word that has been used along uh, uh, quite extensively in, um, um, in Greek philosophy. And uh, what's interesting about light is that it has two points of view. The light can be something that it brings to you, which is knowledge, and it's to us as humans, what is light? Light is the thing that actually we see. It makes us see the world. And that kind of like metaphorically means that it's the thing that uh, allow us to understand things, right? That's what light is because we can see now. But at the same time, light has a mind of its own. It's a thing on itself. Regardless of our existence, light exists. And light does things, whatever it does, quantum phenomena, if you like, things that are beyond our uh, apprehension. And that is, I think, the whole point of the... Um, argument that we're trying to put here is to, to investigate whether or not the things, regardless of the human, the distance between the human and the thing, the observed and the observer, okay? That, I think, becomes the most interesting part when we flip on the other side and we get into the side of the things, the on the 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 existence of things regardless of us and i think you actually made a very uh, interesting argument um, um with the word freedom you know you use the word freedom and uh together with the word intuition 
coming from the Kantian kind of a um, um, tradition. And so my question, I mean, it's not really a question, it's more like a remark, is that um, how do you understand this, the concept of freedom? Is freedom something that is ours or freedom is outside of us? Uh, right. From so, your point uh, of view, not Kant. I'm not interested in Kant. We know Kant. He's like a humanist. We, we know all that stuff. That's a long time ago. But from your point of view, wh- how do you define freedom? Well, I, I think uh, well, thank you. this is a b- big question. And I think it is a question that uh, deserves a book on its own, that the concept of freedom. <laughs> The, the, the concept of freedom, but uh, what I'm maybe we can say in 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 this way is uh, uh, because for me freedom is a necessity. Freedom is a necessity, and freedom is a reason itself. Yeah, reason is uh, because first of all we have to make a distinction between arbitrary uh, arbitrariness. So, for example, I like this. I like that. You know? I want to vote for Biden. I want to vote for Trump. You know? This is arbitrary. But of course, today we call it freedom, but this is not freedom. This is this is only something arbitrary. It's like when you go to McDonald's, are you going to have a, a you know, which burger you would like to choose? You know, something arbitrary. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. After mm-hmm. afterward, it will be you know, after you eat it, it will be full. It will be stuffed mm-hmm. stuffed mm-hmm. with Pepsi or Coke, yeah, without nutrients. Yeah, the same the same uh, uh, consequence, but. Um, but freedom is different. Freedom uh, is, an, is, is, is not contingent, you know, because you choose which, free, which burger is contingent. Yeah. Um, but freedom is not contingent. Con- freedom is, nece- is necessary, it's a necessity. And the necessity of freedom, uh, in this case, it can only be, the, only be reason. Uh, it can be only, only be reason. And um, so that's what I would say, you know, what is a freedom? It's not about what we can choose, but rather uh, in the space which allows us to exercise our reason. I, we know this is similar to, you know, the resonance right. with what Kant might call the public use of reason, but uh, uh, um, but it was not very, Kant didn't say in the way that I, that I, that I, that I talk about it. Um, but rather, freedom is the space where we are able to exercise our our, our reason and to um, pursue this uh, uh, this possibility of the exercise of freedom. So, freedom is imagination. Freedom is uh, well, freedom is uh, uh, is imagination uh, rationalized. <laughs> okay. Which brings us to the uh, original argument about its artificiality, right? Which right, is where right. it cannot be human; it has to be artificial. Right. So, what I the points what I trying to make? Well, I trying to make two points, but because I my my article is a little bit too long, so I I skipped uh, uh, almost half of it. But I was trying to say is a uh, trying to communicate is first of all that imagination is always artificial. So, if you want to talk about reason, we must also talk about the artificiality of reason, the artificiality of reason. And I think this is on a very much an ontological argument. And the second point I, was, I wanted to communicate is that um, we, like what you said, I'm all very much interested in speculation. I also want to speculate what is, what is happening in the artificial imagination of a machine. And that is a very mm-hmm. interesting question for me. Uh, since I was a student of computer science, and that was also the basically the, the, the uh, um, my my PhD thesis, I want to understand what what could only be understood by machines, but not by humans. Um, but in this, in 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 my talk, I try to communicate in that where it is a very important question. Uh, but at the same time, when you talk about uh, when you talk about art today. Um, um, I would like to propose to talk about artificial, uh, sorry, to talk about uh, an aesthetic education, which for me uh, has the form, uh, as the meaning of an organological uh, uh, sense that how could we think of this aesthetic education together with what you called artificial imagination? 
uh, instead of isolate, isolating artificial intelligence, um, artificial imagination, and to try to understand what really is inside without uh, the human observation. Okay, because um, at the interest of time, we have to continue. The, the reason why I brought up the question is because uh, Yuka has to leave and we wanted to actually kind of um, strain his brain for a minute before he leaves, okay? So with that being uh, said, thank you very much for your lecture. And uh, let me uh, continue introducing the next speaker, um, which is um, Joanna Zielinska, who is um, an artist, writer, curator, and a professor of media philosophy and um, um, critical digital, I like that, practice at King's College um, London. She's the author of a number of books, including AI Art, Machine Visions, and A Warped Dream uh, in 2020. Um, her art practice involves experimenting with different kinds of image-based media. Please, uh, Joanna, um, enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do my best with the enlightening bit. Thank you so much <laughs> for the invitation. Really happy to be here with you all. Um, let me do the slide bit now. Yeah. Is that okay? Can you all see the screen? Give me a sign. So you're all muted. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the current discourse on AI remains largely instrumental, trapped between the hura optimism of big tech and its critical assessment by scholars and activists. Political debate today also finds itself increasingly polarized. Given this state of events, could we mobilize non-human creativity as a way of opening our all to human ways of thinking and acting? Can AI play the role of a philosopher visionary that will show us a way out? Could it get beyond the limitations of our human frames of mind to imagine a different set of propositions for us? Could it actually envisage a better future for humans and non-humans alike while showing us to get there? Now, history, science fiction, and the current model of extractive capitalism, which repurposes all openings as resources for an, its own growth, all indicate that this idea is unlikely to succeed. But given how stuck we currently are, politically, economically, and climatologically, it seems worth dreaming up some literally unthinkable visions for our planetary survival and coexistence. Film theorist Janet Harbert suggests that the hope of future salvation rests on the human capacity to mentally imagine, to be affected by the image. As a first step, AI-driven art may therefore become a realm of picturing, uh, uh, picturing um, a better future beyond our wildest human dreams. But AI and machine learning algorithms put to work in university labs, research and policy centers, and art organizations could also perhaps envisage ways of co-engineering this better future beyond the rigidity of the present modernist paradigm that we seem unable to shake off. So now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do today. So drawing on my philosophical work and my art practice, my talk will explore how we can mobilize non-human creativity as a way of opening up our all to human ways of thinking and acting. But what is non-human creativity? Well, one way of answering this question is by suggesting that human creativity has always been partly non-human. That is to say that it has always entailed an other than human element. At the same time, this kind of creative activity still needs to be recognized and valorized as art by individual humans, as well as human institutions and practices. So my attempt to explore the problem of non-human creativity and artificial imagination in this talk will be divided into two parts. In part one, I will draw on selected works of AI-based art that engage implicitly or explicitly with this proposition about human creativity being partly non-human. 
In part two, I will introduce a recent film of mine produced in collaboration with various AI models to illustrate my attempt to perform and not just think about this idea of non-human creativity while also trying to imagine a better future. Okay, so on to part one, machinic co-creation. In this picture, we can see a four-wheeled uh, vehicle driving alongside a white wall. During its up and down journeys, it is leaving multicolored squiggles on the wall that look like graffiti. This is Senseless Drawing Bot by Sokano and Takahiro Yamaguchi, which is another example of art making robots which have graced the art scene since computation allowed for the removal of the human artist from the visible side of the creative process even if not from its planning, design, and programming. In a similar vein, Lionel Mura's robot art uses ensembles of small programmable vehicles that leave colorful ink marks on large sheets of paper in response to cues. Following in their footsteps, in the footsteps of their renowned predecessors, such as Jean Tingeli and his kinetic painting sculptures called Metamatics, and Carol Cohen with his painting program Aaron, these new iterations of art making robots go beyond the relatively narrow scope of creative possibilities resulting from the historical limitations of the mechanical systems underpinning them. They also go further than their more mainstream counterparts whose modus operandi is premised on style transfer where a robot can produce a credible rendition of, say, Van Gogh's The Starry Night in under five hours. So using the principles of machine learning, the art-making robots of Canon Yamaguchi and Mura pick up cues from the environment to come up with novel images, images that their programmers have no ultimate control over. This is the sense in which I'm using the term novel here. Drawing on complex algorithms of artificial intelligence, which make it impossible to predict the final outcome of the drawing or painting process, those works reboot robot art as a playful, almost childlike pastime and a spontaneous expression of a moving body. Except here, the body is no longer human. With this, the robot's constructors stage the provocative idea of creativity as a domain of more than human activity. We could ask whether these artworks genuinely withdraw the human artist from the scene, or do they perhaps enact a different, but not any less radical proposition? The possibility of the absence of agency at the heart of the human, of the fact that there is no there there, not just in artists, but in all of us. My own position on what I term non-human creativity is aligned with a theoretical standpoint of critical post-humanism, a position which negotiates the pressing question of what it means to be human under the conditions of globalization, technoscience, late capitalism, and climate change. This position doesn't mean any straightforward overcoming of the human, were such a thing even possible, but rather a rewriting or reenactment of the human under the crisis conditions mentioned earlier. The said crisis is multiple in volume and planetary in scale. Importantly, critical posthumanism doesn't just describe it. It also mobilizes the humans and the planet's fragility as an ethical political demand. Artists today are responding to this um, demand in a variety of affective registers from horror, melancholia and mourning through to irony, parody and exuberant play. This reenactment of human subjectivity and agency is often accompanied by an attempt to rethink the role and position of the artist, acknowledging entanglement and co-creation as the ontological condition of existence for us all. So as a working definition, I'm going to adopt computer scientist Margaret Bowden's theorization of creativity as the ability to come up with ideas and artifacts that are new, surprising and valuable. Bowden's writings on creativity deserve attention because of her efforts to take computer art and other forms of media art seriously as interventions that can shift established epistemological and ontological frames. In Creativity and Art, Three Roads to Surprise, she recognizes that some philosophers refuse to admit the possibility of computer by art by defining art in exclusively human terms. Antonio Heyer, for example, insists that 
art involves some form of communication between one human being and another, with artist and audience being required to share human experience. In contradistinction to such narrowly humanist views, Bowden acknowledges the possibility of defining art in terms of properties of the art object that are not exclusively human, even if she herself doesn't follow through on the, on the investigation of what such non-human art would present as, mean, and of who it would be addressed to or meaningful to. Nor does she pay enough attention to the cultural context in which creativity emerges as both a trait and a concept. The humanist concept of creativity that Bowden works against has been with us at least since the Renaissance. Modeled on the ex nihilo way in which God was supposed to have created the universe, it has found a translation in the romantic idea of the human, most often of the male variety, as a standalone genius, thinking amazing thoughts and making beautiful artifacts from above the world. Explicit challenges to the humanist model of creativity have recently been issued from many other directions than just computer science or computer-based art. Um, in evolutionary psychology, the emergence of creativity's outcomes in the form of art is seen as being continuous with the creative processes of other living beings, such as bowerbirds, whose males construct colorful multi-texture lodgings. You can see them in the image here. And marine creatures such as snails, bivalves, and coral polyps, which produce elaborate limescale architectures to serve as their homes. Creativity is explained by many scientists as offering a species level advantage through enhancing our cognitive faculties or satisfying our supposedly innate desire for symmetry, order, and beauty. Now, philosopher of post-human thought, Claire Colebrook, um, doesn't mince her words in critiquing this line of thinking. Such an argument is stupid, she writes, not because it's wrong, error, but because it fails to give form to the drives that have generated art. There may be a drive for pattern finding that helps animals to survive, but art is the power to render that drive different from its originating ground, ground, thwarting and perverting patterns, generating more complex syntheses. Following this argument, it's not enough to, for something to look like what we have predefined as art to us humans. Hence, all these experiments in getting chimpanzees or elephants to paint and then delighting in the abstractions should just be considered as silly humanist distractions that end up reaffirming the human as the sole arbiter of artistic judgment and sole owner of art as both activity and concept. Colebrook's argument builds on Henri Bergson's idea of creative evolution, where life is seen as an explosive power of creative difference and a counter tendency of resistance. Bergson also emphasizes our tendency to cut up matter and carve out objects from the flow of life, a tendency that is a sense-making strategy enacted by humans. We could therefore say that under certain circumstances, certain groups of living beings recognize these certain acts unfolding across time as art and have through their history, created a whole lot of institutions and practices that legitimate those practices in these terms. Colebrook's critical statement shouldn't therefore be mistaken for a postulation of uniquely human creativity. What she's rather getting at is that the evolutionary functionalist explanation of art curtails all too quickly the human ability to recognize something as truly creative. This logic can be seen in the pronouncements of technology companies, which promise us creative gadgets that will be absolute game changers, while having to rely on the majority of the elements of the game, the capitalist system of exchange, the extractivist logic of overproduction and overconsumption, to remain largely the same, or even be strengthened in the process. Such arguments by extension with regard to creativity are therefore deeply uncreative. They show a failure of imagination, or worse, a willing desire for things not to get too different and hence too creative. So this brings us to a concept of creativity as non-functional excess, a breaking through beyond the human, 
and a possibility of the emergence of new sensations and new modes of knowing. And this is indeed a take on the non-human creativity I want to offer in my work. So on to the second part now, imaging and imagining a better future with AI or not. Let me now offer you an example from my own art practice, which involves a remaking with the help of some uh, machine learning algorithms and models of the 1962 photo film La Jetée by French director Chris Marker. Marker's film serves as an ideal case study for probing the question of non-human creativity because of the knowing embrace of the idea of automatic creation by its maker. The director confessed that the film had been made like a piece of automatic writing. It was in the editing that the pieces of the puzzle came together, and it wasn't me who designed the puzzle, said Marker. La Jete opens with a slow pan over a photograph of an open-air viewing platform, a jetty, at the Orly Airport in Paris. A short sequence of closely cut images later, we are told by a deadpan narrator that something violent has just occurred. The sequence of images is accompanied by a mysterious sounding line. This is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood. We then encounter the said man several years later in Paris, which in the meantime has been destroyed by World War III. Radioactive contamination has pushed all the survivors underground. The man is imprisoned in a medical facility run by an army of German speaking experimenters with an ominous looking director at its head. He's being primed for time travel. He will need to go into the future to save humanity by finding a hole in time through which to send food energy supplies. Having accomplished his mission, he is no longer needed. He will have to be eliminated. We then realized together with him that the opening scene was the moment of his death. So Marcus film capturing the sense of the material and moral distraction brought on, brought on by World War II and a premonition of a nuclear holocaust is both a memory exercise and a lesson in how to remember well. La Jete's post-apocalyptic tenor and its haunting narrative make it an apt reference point for the current moment of the multiple crises in which our world finds itself in 2022. The COVID-19 pandemic with its multiple waves and unequal distribution of mortality and health is reminiscent of the time loops enacted in La Jetée, whereby the past cuts across the present to leap into the future and then back again. The renewed threat of World War III we're experiencing now generates a similar sense of anxiety. The premonition of an imminent end to the, our liberal fantasy of our ways of life, coupled with a desire for things to re return to how they once were very quickly, fuel the imagination of not only climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers and racists, but also of many others who carry a strong mental image of a better yesteryear even if that image is just a dream. So in response to all of this, my experiment consisted in making a nine minute film, A Gift of the World, Oedipus on the Jetty, I'll explain the weird title in a minute, by way of an AI remediation of La Jetée through the socio-political concerns of the present moment in the face of an apocalyptic crisis. The first step of my project involved training a GAN uh, uh, model uh, st uh, called StyleGAN2 on a database of still, still images which I extracted from a uh, Marcus film. GANs, as many of you will know, are machine learning programs that use two neural networks. That is an algorithm designed in an open-ended manner from the bottom up in a way that is meant to imitate or rather schematize the way the human brain works. The two networks in, in a GAN are positioned as adversaries, with one program to generate convincing and correct input, the other to control and improve upon this input according to the truth falsehood criteria. The ongoing interaction makes both networks improve with time, learning from each other while trying to outperform each other in obtaining satisfactory results. The GAN model I used had been designed to mimic the style of the images fed into it to train it. 
with a view to generating an infinite number of similar looking images. And I'm just going to show you a trailer from a film to give you a sense of what it was like. It's going to be about a minute and a bit. Uh, should start playing. Can you hear the sound? Is the sound playing? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. This is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood. He was the son of a Roman Catholic father and a Catholic mother. His mother was an itinerant widow and he had a sister who was a British officer. He had no family and was just a man. He would have thought of the woman as a baby. He was already a soldier, a member of the great army. Okay, so um, the script of my film was created with the assistance of GPT-2, an unsupervised AI language model that had been trained on the web text data set containing millions of web pages. I started by feeding the model La Jete's famous opening line. This is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood. The model responded by taking the story in an unexpected direction. Any edits I did to the script were minor, with some of the language errors identified as important moments in my experiment and hence retained. The editing of the video was intuitive and consisted of my own visual and corporeal responses to both the script and the GAN images. Interestingly, the images themselves, produced by an algorithm that tried to remake Marcus' film by picking up its key visual features, and especially those pertaining to humans, as is often the case in such generative programs that had been trained on photos of human faces, manifested various body parts, frequently multiplied, noses, hair, eyes, kidneys, kidney-like eyes. The way generative networks operate is by repeatedly optimizing pixels in an image to achieve some desired state of activations. That desired state is compared against the source material, that is the training set. Developers frequently resort to the metaphor of a dream to describe the working of neural nets, suggesting that such networks find patterns in images, not so much in a logical pre-programmed way, but rather by using previous data and memories as prompts for making new connections between data points and for generating new data. Their operations are presented as being akin to what human minds do while being at rest, either when we are asleep or daydreaming. By anthropomorphizing their products, engineers and the technology companies they work for absolve themselves of the responsibility for their programming decisions and for those decisions and intended consequences. Now, I was aware that the playful sense of experimentation I had adopted in my, as my method was tinged with the more ominous undertones of the experiments conducted on Marker's main character in the underground camp. The counter dream aspect was also important for me, given the sociopolitical limitations of AI technology, revealing not only gender and racial bias, but also the exclusionary and unjust logic underlying many of its founding principles. I was curious about what AI would do to the original source material, but I knew I would need to step in as both a dream catcher and analyst. The model tried to remain faithful to the spirit and sense of Marcus' opening line by reenacting the personal and global apocalypse as an Oedipal drama. The AI engines deployed in the visual and textual models ended up producing a more multi-layered show, one that unfolded as much on the gender front as it did on the humanist existential one. We could perhaps say that the film dreamt itself as a feminist intervention into the heteronormative fetishism of the apocalypse as dreamt up in key Western cultural texts from the Bible through to Marcus' film. 
what starts as a conversation between mother and son and La Jete ends up through a series of algorithmic glitches as a sequence of slippages that enter a gender vortex in which man becomes woman, mother becomes father, he becomes she. With the dissolution of the nuclear family, the Oedipal drama as the structuring device of our cultural script disappears. The sense of premonition still lingers, but it is now accompanied by the possibility of an opening and a liberation. This possibility can be read as a feminist gift, a gift to cite art critic Griselda Pollock of what the feminine can be thought to be if we emerge from the exclusivity of the Oedipal logic of the phallus as the only arbiter of psychic life and signification. How is that for imagining and imaging a different future? So to find out more about my thinking on AI, you can download for free uh, my book, AI, Machine Visions and Open Dreams, uh, in which I actually say a lot of horrible things about uh, using guns for art. So uh, I'm kind of working partly against guns, partly with them as a way of philosophizing about media, but also through and with media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Very, very interesting uh, movie. And um, I like your um, uh, interpretation of the unexpected, the glitch and the uh, accident. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's keep going on. Uh, our next uh, speaker is um, Andrian Notes, who is a curator at the ETH at the AI Center. From 2012 to 19, he was an artistic director of the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. From 2010 to 2015, he was the head of the Department of Fine Arts at the School of Design at saint Gallen. Notes has organized and curated numerous uh, exhibitions, events, conferences, actions, and interventions with uh, inter international artists, uh, activists, and thinkers in the Cabaret Voltaire, as well as around the globe. So, um, Adrian, good to meet you. Please. Hello, Take thank stand. you very much for inviting me for the conference here and uh, share my screen. So I'm trying to uh, talk about autistic quantum randomness in relation to the topic of the conference. And I will start with um, the AAI manifesto by Albrecht, uh, which is in which postscript Albrecht Führer is mentioned. Uh, in the postscript of the AII Manifesto Albrecht Dürer's Woodcut Remozerus from the year 1515 is mentioned as a remarkable example of artistic imagination. Because Dürer never saw the Remozerus, but based his illustration only on sketches and descriptions uh, by others. And since I read this manifesto, it was very inspiring to me. Um, I have been using this reference a lot lately in talks in the relation of art and science and AI and art. Not only is it a great illustration of artistic imagination, it is also a great example of how art and science 500 years ago were still understood as one. Dürer and his contemporaries uh, Da Vinci and Michelangelo, today commonly known as artists, weren't understood as artists back then. They were craftsmen, engineers, so to say, scientists, and maybe even today we might say innovators and inventors. And as such, they are also on the facade of the ETH main building, which you can see here. Last week, I could see an edition of the original woodcut print in the graphic collection of the ETH, Zurich, and I was told that the rhinoceros was actually gifted by Afonso de Albuquerque, the second governor of India in Goa, to King Manuel I of Portugal. Alfonso got the rhinoceros from Sultan Mustafar II, emperor of today's Gujarat, as a diplomatic present a year before. It sailed around the African continent to Lissabon. Because King Manuel I wanted to impress Pope Leo X even more, a year before he had gifted the Pope an Indian elephant, he sent the rhinoceros beautifully decorated 
end of the year, end of the year 1515, on a boat towards Rome. It stopped in Marseille because the, the French king Francois I also wanted to have a look at it. This was the last time it was seen alive. The boat got into a heavy storm and sank. Because the rhinoceros was chained to the boat, it drowned. The dead body was found at the French coast and the skin of the animal was sent back to Lisbon, stuffed with straw and sent to Pope Leo X again, already in February 1516. In the AIA, AII manifesto, Dürer is compared to AI, mainly in regards of accuracy and its convincing power. We could also understand Dürer's rhinoceros woodcut as a kind of neural network DAL-E image because he created an image just uh, on the basis of text input. Since last October 2021, I am working as a curator at the ETH AI Center in Zurich together with artist Nora Albadri, whose work you can see here, uh, Babylonian Vision, uh, GAN generated images for a techno heritage of Mesopotamia. And our mission, to say it very simple, is to bring art into the context of scientific and technological research and development of AI foundations and applications. Therefore, our AI and art initiative helps strengthen the focus on an interdisciplinary co-evolving AI. This focus on an interdisciplinary co-evolving AI is connected to the mission of the ETH AI Center, which is to lead the way towards a trustworthy, accessible and inclusive artificial intelligence for the benefit of society. Accessible and inclusive AI means that AI technologies and applications are, no, applications are not only understandable and interpretable, but also easy to use and with no or at least low costs involved. In this sense, as I can see from my fellows, from our fellows and faculties, there is a high interest in sharing these new technologies and making them as accessible as possible for everyone. It is not so much about competition, but much more about collaboration. Trustworthy AI, Trustworthy AI research is following four ethical principles that were set up only three years ago by an expert group on artificial intelligence from the EU Commission in their ethics guideline for trustworthy AI. They are um, respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness and, uh, fairness and explicability. These principles then also lead to seven requirements in the realization of trustworthy AI, which are human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity and non-discrimination and fairness, um, societal uh, and environmental well-being and accountability. Or in short, as one paper on the topic mentions, we want to have a decent AI. So researchers and engineers are currently working on the high pressure on the question how abstract and almost philosophical notions like individual rights, fairness, robustness, trust, causality, bias, norms, interpretability and explainability can become part of AI programming. The ETH AI Center therefore wants to create an environment for the pursuit of trustworthy AI systems and serendipitous collaborations across AI foundations, applications, implications, and impact areas. Currently, there are 120 faculties connected to the ETH AI Center with over 200 postdoc researchers and more than 1,400 PhD students. Along this big interest, from all the 16 departments of the ETH Zurich shows how pressing the topic is, from research to engineering to startups and industry. At the moment, there are also 25 PhD and postdoc fellows at the AI Center advancing interdisciplinary AI research, mostly with two mentors from different fields with equal weight in supervision, 
as well as collaborations from different disciplines and departments. In my past life, I was a director of the Cabra Volta, a birthplace of Dada. So I can try and refer a lot of what I'm learning right now to, to what the Dadaists were doing. And I like to use uh, Hans Arp as an example. For Hans Arp, randomness was a key uh, of his work, uh, right from the creation of the first Dadaist group in Zurich during the First World War One, during the First World War. Unlike Tristan Tsara, the Dada poet and ideologue, Arp did not see randomness simply as a phenomenon, but as a law underlying all creation. Arp said, I continued to develop the technique of paper collage by banishing the will in the composition and relying on automatic execution. I called this working according to the laws of chance, the law that contains all others and that escapes us as well as the primary cause that brings forth all life and that can only be experienced by a total abandonment to the unconscious. I said that he who followed this law created life in its purest. At the time of Dada and after, Arp opted for the erasure of the artist's subject, letting his creations escape his own control. To do this, he sometimes relied on a form of automatism, sometimes on the laws of chance. Accepting the laws of chance, his idea was to work in the same way that nature generates its forms, searching for the elemental, the spontaneous, so that his work in itself would constitute a reality and not an imitation. Nature works with a limited number of similar elements, the stars in the sky, but also the flowers in the fields, the trees in the forest, which it groups and bundles into various constellations. According to Arp, these apparently randomly placed elements are in fact linked together by laws that are imperceptible to man. This explains the paradoxical expression laws of chance, laws that govern the distribution of quadrangular pieces of paper on some of Arp's early collages. The time when Arp discovered the laws of randomness was also the time of the First World War, with battlefields in Europe, where for the first time in history, tanks, submarines, airplanes, rockets, gas bombs, and other mass killing machines were killing millions of humans. In this context, the Dadaists in Europe were very skeptical, to say it mildly, about technological progress. Like the founder of Cabra Volte, the birthplace of Dada, Hugo Ball said already before the Dada times in 1915, the war is based on a glaring error. People have been confused with the machines. One should decimate the machines instead of the people. Later, when the machines march by themselves and alone, it will be more in order. Then, with good reason, the whole world will cheer when they smash each other to pieces. So maybe to a certain degree, we could say today, Baal was talking about autonomous uh, systems. On the other side of the Atlantic, European artists like Marcel Duchamp, Francis Picabia, Man Ray and others were very enthusiastic about the same technolog technological progress. Picabia, for example, praised the city for inspiring a complete revolution in his methods of work. He said, the visit to America has brought about a complete revolution in my methods of work. Almost immediately upon coming to America, it flashed me that the genius of the modern world is in machinery and that through machinery, art ought to find a most vivid expression. The machine has become more than a mere adjunct of life. It is, re really, it is really a part of human life, perhaps the very soul. I have enlisted the machinery of, modern, of the modern world and introduced it into my studio. He then started a new series of mechanomorph drawings that were influenced by the industrial landscapes of New York and were indeed a revolution in art. The mechanomorph drawings were portraits of machines 
often with anthropomorphic, psychological, and even erotic undertones. Almost a bit like our imagination of machine hallucinations today, just less bodiless. Also in Europe, after World War I, artists started embracing the idea of the machine, maybe like today, there were a lot of hopes on the technological progress that would, in, that would, in a leap forward, potentially solve a lot of human civilization problems. In Berlin, they got rid of art and started celebrating the machine art of Tatlin, referring to the Russian constructivists. This marked a change in art towards functionalism, which was to shape people's artistic horizons in the future. The beginnings of socialism and the collective economy brought not only accelerated economic power, but also technical innovations that completed industrialization in Russia and gave people a new view of the world. New forms of economy and work emerged and in art that is with Russian constructivists, suprematists and futurists, this development was greeted with euphoria and a new kind of representation. The artist was no longer, uh, or again, maybe, seen only as an artist, but also as an engineer who would shape the future of humankind. Key speaker Refik Anadol and also other artists talk about machine hallucinations or quantum dreaming, or in the context of this conference, also potentially about quantum imagination. If you use the term dream as relating to humans, it seems that the dream is a way of processing the input from our conscious and awake day experience, not just visually, but with all our senses. Hallucinations, on the contrary, are perceptions in the absence of an external stimulus, but that still have the qualities of a real perception. It is a mental wandering, contrary to dreaming happening, happening in a wakeful moment. Both dreaming and hallucination produce forms of perception, while hallucinations are almost something like augmented realities occurring in, a sen in any sensory modality, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, proprioceptive, equilibrioceptive, nociceptive, thermoceptive, and chronoceptive. Hallucinations are multimodal when multiple sensory modalities occur at the same time. Both terms, contrary to imagination, are researched also in psychological as well as neuroscientific uh, contexts. As today's machine learning is based on deep artificial neural networks, there might be a very direct analogy of how human and machine hallucination and dreaming is generated. Refik uses specialized GAN technologies like deep convolutional GAN, probabilistic GAN, or style GAN. Simply said, this means that out of existing data sets, totally new data is created. The pivot into the new lies, into the new, lies in the training of the algorithm. It is not a remix or a style. It is learning to generate on its own. Like hallucinations, it might be more advanced than dreaming because dreams might just be perceptions from memories popping up like an image style transferred out of an image database. Last week in a lab visit at the ETH Computer Vision Lab, there was a nice moment when the researcher, when researcher Martin Danelian corrected himself in an introduction to their work on ink painting using denoising diffusion probabilistic models. He was explaining how a GAN uh, generated faces and corrected himself by saying, this is not a face, but an image that looks like a face. Interestingly, other images of faces, referring to portraits of existing human beings are still understood to be faces. This is unlike surrealist René Magritte's statement, c'est ce n'est pas une pipe, referring to a painting of a pipe that not being the pipe itself. The slight shift of dimension might explain also nicely the shift between human hallucinations and machine hallucinations. At a talk in one of Bangalore's big IT companies, I was asked about my idea of randomness. 
Having only art, Dada, and the avant-garde and art history as a reference system, I explained how artists started working a century ago in Europe according to the laws of randomness. That was about in the time known today as the old quantum theory. The young engineer asking was specialized in quantum randomness and wanted to see how my concepts of artistic randomness could be adapted to his research. Quantum randomness is the statistical manifestation of quantum indeterminacy, witnessable in results of experiments repeated many times. The relationship between quantum indeterminacy and randomness is subtle and be considered differently. In classical physics, experiments of chance, such as a coin tossing or a dice throwing, are deterministic in the sense that perfect knowledge of the initial conditions would render outcomes perfectly predictable. The randomness stems from the ignorance of physical information and the initial toss or throw in the initial toss or throw. In a diametrical contrast, in the case of quantum physics, quantum randomness does not stem from any such physical information. Quantum randomness is exclusively the output of measurement experiments whose input settings introduce logical independence into quantum systems. Logical independence is a phenomenon in mathematical logic. It refers to the null logical connectivity that exists between mathematical propositions that neither prove nor disprove one another. The young engineer then also explained me how quantum computing based on energy is analog in contrary to the digital binary system of conventional computing. We both didn't really understand what the other was talking about. Like the Irish writer James Joyce said about a century ago, misunderstanding is the normal state. To understand is an exception. Even if the young Indian engineer and I didn't understand each other properly, because we do not speak each other's languages, we still, in the the pivot of the term sparked both our imaginations and triggered each other in an entangled manner. We changed our rotation simultaneously without knowing how. In the ETH Wolfgang Pauli Lectures 2022, I learned from theoretical physicist Professor Juan M. Maldacena from the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, USA, on in March 2022, in his lecture, Black Holes and the Structure of Space-Time, that entanglement plays a crucial role in determining the structures of space-time. This means that two entangled in a far in faraway parts of the universe, the two entangled entities in faraway parts of the universe have the potential of creating a wormhole and therefore change the structure of space-time. One of our AI and art projects in collaboration with the, ETH AI, uh, with the ETH library is together with the David Graeber Institute, an anthropologist, activist, and anarchist who unfortunately died last year. He is currently most known for the recently published book, The Dawn of Everything, or also for 5,000 Years of Death or Bullshit Jobs. Together with his widow, the artist Nika Dubrovsky, we are working on transforming his archive into an open data research project. And in a small book called Anarchism in a Matter of Speaking, Graeber talks about the importance of conversation. A lot of anarchist practice, at least the kind I think of quintessential anarchists, revolves around a certain principle of dialogue. There is a lot of attention paid to learning how to make pragmatic, cooperative decisions with people who have fundamentally different understandings of the world, without actually trying to convert them to your particular point of view. It's always, it always struck me as interesting that in the ancient world, whether in India, China, or Greece, Philosophy was written almost exclusively in the form of a dialogue, even if it's often this kind of dialogue where one guy does 95% of the talking. Thought, self-reflective consciousness, 
that should, that which we tend to see as making us truly human was assumed to be a collective, political, or dy dyadic, but something that almost by definition couldn't be done all by yourself. Or rather, solitary reflection was usually the ultimate goal. The aim of philosophy was, often at least, to cultivate yourself to the point where individual self-consciousness might be possible. And different philosophical schools, from Buddhism to Stoicism, tended to employ different forms of meditation, diet, spiritual exercises, as means of ultimately attaining the state of a, the status of a sage, of a sage, who really could be self-conscious, who really could be a self-conscious individual. But it was only by starting with dialogue that one had any chance of getting there. For me, that is for Graver. That's the most important break Descartes introduces. Christian thought had all already been moving away from dialogue, but Descartes completely turned things around by starting with the self-conscious individual and only then asking how that individual can have any kind of communicative relation with anyone else. It's the basis of all subsequent European philosophy, but it's also absurd as neuroscience has shown the ancients were right. Real thought is almost entirely dialogic. Not that cognitive scientists usually say it explicitly, because for some reason they have, they too have a strange mental block on conversation. But they do make clear that that's what is called the window of consciousness, that time during which most of us actually are full self-aware, self-reflecting beings, is rare and brief. It averages around maybe seven seconds. Otherwise, you are generally operating on autopilot, unless, of course, you are talking to someone. You can have conversations on autopilot too, of course, but if you are really interested and engaged with someone else, you can maintain it for hours. The implications of this are profound, even though we rarely seem to acknowledge it. Most self-aware thought takes place at exactly the moment when the boundaries of the self are least clear. This was my short presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you for the uh, um, dialogue, self-pilot dialogue and uh, monologue at the same time. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Spella Petrits, which is a new media artist with a background in the natural sciences. Her artistic practice combines biomedia practices and performative to enact strange relations between bodies that reveal the um, underpinning of our biotechnological societies in order to propose alternatives. Spella, please take the screen. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this super interesting conference. Um, a lot of things to say, and I am super happy to hear the previous speakers. Um, I'm going to add upon this some experiences from the art practice, um, which aims which aims to um, elaborate on such questions, but also answer with um, answer the question what to actually do. Um, so I, I prepared the text, so I'll read uh, slowly, I hope. It's not too complicated to understand. So I'll be talking about the plant machine, which is an opus of three works that all address uh, artificial intelligence, in relation to living organisms, uh, and you will see how I actually supplement people with plants and vice versa. So in 2019, several researchers and cultural, cu cultural workers wrote a grant proposal to the Dutch Research Council that would bring together practices in arts and sciences around a central premise the creation of an artificial intelligence that thinks it is itself a plant. Amidst contemporary ecological urgencies, 
this plant machine project would tackle questions of plant representation in the sphere of algorithmic governance. We were overjoyed to be awarded the grants and after a long delay due to COVID, we finally kicked it off under the name Smart Hybrid Forms in September 2020. And in this talk consisting of uh, several examples, I will draw from a slew of experiences of making and thinking with various plants, engineers, philosophers, programmers, designers, and robots, including algorithms, in order to follow the trail of tropes that permeate the use of advanced algorithms onto seemingly disparate life forms, cultivated plants on one hand and people on the other. So the idea of interfacing plants with technologies uh, is all but radical. As a pillar of societies, agriculture has always been up to date with the latest developments that allowed for the intensification, optimization, and expansion of land use for food production, whether it turned out to be ecologically sustainable and just in the long run or not. Broadly speaking, these intensive practices include plantation and monocultural models of agriculture, the use of chemical agents such as pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer, fertilizers, and all types of breeding and genetically modified crops, and of course, the automation of these processes. Uh, as this latest crosses over with our plant machine, um, I would like to just briefly show some examples, um, starting with the ones that we can most easily personify. And this slide actually shows a collection of agricultural robots that are used for phenotyping, harvesting strawberries and apples, picking grapes, removing weeds and spraying crops. The majority of advanced automation in agriculture is however, infrastructural. It's dispersed and intimately connected with expert knowledge. It already forms human plant machine hybrids. So the intuition of farmers is supplanted with machine vision that analyzes crop productivity from high above as seen here in this image um, using either satellites or aerial drones. Microscopic analysis of leaf pores reveals evidence of drought stress before its impacts are visible on the plants. Weather forecasts crossed with sugar content help identify the best harvesting moment for grapes. And farmers employ artificial intelligence assistance to identify and tackle pests and diseases. This is another example. The Wageningen University's tweeting poplar tree that sends an update, uh, sends updates on the sap flow and growth, or MIT's uh, email, emailing spinach, uh, which you can see here on the left, that wirelessly reports the presence of harmful molecular compounds such as explosives. Uh, these effective examples of science communication and branding work at least in part because of an underlying desire to communicate with non-humans, um, in this case plants, along with the prevalent conceptions that advanced enough technology should seem like magic. And we completely buy into this, especially as urban dwellers with little experience of the materiality of plants. We buy into the idea that machine as interface could rescue plants from the so-called silence and help those disconnected from the seasonal life of nature feel again the needs and agencies of the environment beyond the paved streets. So while it acknowledges the loss and longing, uh, loss and longing this desire for reconnection comes with very little lived experience and also lots of traps. So between these two, between the sort of urban dweller uh, desire to connect with plants and then this high intensity food pro production of agriculture is where I also place uh, the plant machine um, series. So I will start off by first showing you a video.
ist du Mama. 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 Mach ihm gute Gaga, Gaga, Ga. Sport ist wie die Gaga, Mama, Gaga. So this uh, project, uh, the Institute for Inconspicuous Languages Reading Lips, embraces, of course, in a humorous way, the trap of an anthropocentric understanding of uh, communication. So what we saw there was a camera that follows the opening and closing of microscopic leaf pores, or stomata, as they're called in Latin, through time. Now, stomata present a highly sophisticated plant system that navigates conflicting demands of breathing, photosynthesis, pathogen attack, water availability, etc. But when the motion of opening and closing is sped up a thousand times, they appear to us as moving mouths. So uh, this is uh, sort of an apophenia, right? A trick, an illusion. So the clip first showed the human interpreter for the deaf attempting to read their lips, followed by the same process performed by LipNet, which is an open source artificial network trained to read human lips. So while, while they both generate nonsensical syllables that point to an ill communication, it's actually ironic that uh, the communication between the inch plant, which was the Stradiscantia plant that we've been uh, filming, and the person which would be standing next to it is in fact taking place, right? On a level of volatile messenger molecules, at least, uh, which permeate the air between them. So this project was an invitation towards a possibility of speaking with plants, as well as pointing to the fact that most likely we will have to recenter this kind of anthropocentric demand uh, that the communication uh, be situated in this logos, in the logos. So in the times of scarcity and pain, such as the pandemic, Plants console, uh, console us by showing life's defiant resilience that is nurtured by care. The rise of indoor plant posts on social networks during the lockdowns echoed this notion. So people enjoy being surrounded by vegetation when confined and anxious. And this is sort of also the result <laughs> of the pandemic that you see behind me. But um, actually the mode of consumption, the way that we approach surrounding ourselves with plant life, at least the ones that live in cities is also very telling. So Facebook plant exchange groups flood with hints which garden store has just gotten a new batch of striking exotics. And these fashionably styled potted rarities are either cultivated en masse or when demand outstri outstrips greenhouse supply, they're culled from tropical forests, especially in Indonesia, Thailand, and Phil or the Philippines. So in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, workers who lost their incomes began selling tropical plants to make ends meet, often poaching them illegally from their ha habitats uh, rich in biodiversity. And yet, um, despite of what I would like to think of myself in terms of having a virtuous stance towards ecolo ecological justice and sustainability, my error-prone, medicalized, technology-dependent, heteronomous, screen-bound existence fits very well with these economies of scale of the exotic plant market. How to consolidate this? Well, when my, my financial credit scores are assessed to get a loan, if I wear a smartwatch that tallies my steps, cross the border by having my face scanned, play po Pokemon Go, or swip, uh, swipe a benefit card uh, to rack up points at any store, my person proliferates in the digital realm as innumerable proxies. So this informatic trace of the so-called behavioral surplus uh, quoting Shoshana Zuboff, the raw data which is mined by governments and industry to create value 
also characterizes an acceleration of the transmutation of bodies into information. So from the perspective of this new or intensified economo biopolitic, our ontological opposite is no longer the plant, uh, which was traditionally so in this Western philosophical thought, but the very idea of a self-determining human whose boundaries are delimited by the surf surface of the skin. In the eyes of the algorithms, our cherished interiority is held in leaky ves vessels so that it appears as flat and superficial as the vegetable kingdom. What I'm trying to say is that in the eyes of the algorithm, we are all plants. And I use the term plant here to signify this uh, organism that is understood as somehow absolutely discernible, manipulable, as sort of, this is what I mean by uh, being held in leaky vessels and being flat and open for tabulation, yeah? So, borrowing the term for Catriona Mortimer Sandlands, I refer to our both human and other than human bodies, which are flattened and transfigured into digital proxies as the vegetariat. The vegetariat exists in the conflation of production and reproduction, consumer and commodity, the concrete and its abstraction. So it is sort of um, not a description uh, that would be exhaustive, but rather an artistic concept or, or, or um, point of departure that allows me to think the relation between people and plants uh, in a different perspective. So not trying to rescue plants from their supposed uh, obsolete, not obsolescence, but like from being completely ignored, but actually realizing that in many ways we find ourselves in a similar position specifically in relation to these advanced digital technologies. So it's with this insight that uh, we created the Vegetariat Work Zero. And I use we because it's always been a collaborative practice of several uh, people, uh, plants, uh, machines, and so forth. So as a nod to the third eye that's always observing the intimacy between the body and its a digitization device. And here in this photo, you probably recognize the smartwatch, uh, but you might not be necessarily familiar with the extent of its use. So there were actually cases in the US and also corporate Europe where companies distributed smartwatches or pedometers to monitor and enforce employee fitness, sometimes actually deducting from salaries uh, when activity goals were not, uh, activity quotas were not met. So people instantly turned uh, to device hacking and they attached the smart bands to their pets or threw them into dryers on cold setting and spun them on drill machines, amassing steps with no human calories burned. So it was sort of a way to transform the step into money actually. So um, this really offered um, a nice way to think this relation um, in work zero, the drill machines are operated by cellular, uh, by the cellular excitation of sexy household plants detective, detected by minimally invasive electrodes and uh, super sensitive DIY amplifiers. So basically electrodes are inserted into the plant and then the organically generated voltage, uh, which would be kind of like signals uh, that travel through our nerves. There's a similar process happening in plants as well. So that voltage is amplified and it pushes the mechanical tr trigger on the drill machine. And then on the drill machine, there's one of 12 different smartwatch devices that are spun round and thus tricked into registering plant cellular activity as steps. And this electrochemical potential uh, is used as the element of plant being that directly matches our anthropocentric timescales 
uh, and it's made apparent and delivered as an endless stream of data to the gluttonous big others. Uh, in this case, mostly in China, since the smart watches were purchased on AliExpress. So despite their predominantly subtropical origin, uh, these plants of Instagram have an extraordinary capacity to become invisible within the contemporary indoor environment while they withstand poor light conditions, inconsistent, inconsistent watering regimes, and general neglect. And so given the opportunity, these faculties make them great workers towards a persistent, low-key, low-maintenance representation of other than human entities in the sphere of total body surveillance. And I mean, again, this is a little bit of a humorous take on this relation, but what the project points uh, to is the fact that um, algorithms as such are sort of indifferent to the entity that produces uh, the data that they collect. So it's sort of a limitation of the extent of this body of the AI, so where it draws the data from. And I think it's, it's sort of like an interesting um, intervention that helps us think along the lines of, of the of the surveillance, but also uh, the representation of, like I said, non-human entities. So, okay, um, as we tackle the adversity of becoming statistic in yet another disillusionment with humanist values, we also find ourselves in good company. The resilient and uncontainable verdant creatures plants show us how to thrive under the conditions where they have been denied capacities other than those that make them manipulable, manipulable and useful within the monocultural bottom line of efficiency, accumulation and progress. So my research is guided by precisely this, a desire to code for a future that builds upon the capacities of this vegetarian to engage in the pleasure and resilience of being together and thriving under these conditions. And what you have seen here in the background is actually a study of a cucumber plant uh, moving its tendrils as it grows. So the tendrils are actually um, processes that appear opposite each leaf and they're used by the plants to sort of hang on to some sort of vertical surfaces in order to just, yeah, lift itself, uh, itself up from the ground, avoid a little bit of fungus, come closer to the light. And um, actually this plant was, um, after a lot of research, chosen as the one to be included in uh, the artwork play, PLAI, which I will be explaining. Uh, so in play, uh, we cautiously explore if and how it would be possible to use the same state-of-the-art agricultural technology uh, that I've uh, sort of mentioned before and aim it towards something that is outside the bounds of production and oriented towards the erotics of being alive in the metroscape. And I use here erotics uh, following Audre Lorde's, uh, the uses of the erotic uh, where she actually defines this as um, some sort of innate power um, that um, once you're in touch with the erotic, you're able to overcome uh, much of, of the uh, anxiety and arrest driving forces of uh, the oppressive uh, nodes in society. So when I speak about the erotic, it's not meaning a pornographic or like even like a sexual type of being in touch with the pleasure, but basically this freedom to choose what is that uh, which will uh, engage you in this freedom of being alive. So in play, and it's spelled PL apostrophe AI, denoting plants and AI, we, we, the, the aim was to bring together a group of engineers, plants, philosophers, designers, cooks, and computers in this diverse vegetarian posse to create an AI-equipped robot that would be able to enter plant time to basically play with cucumber plants. 
So we make use of computation uh, to produce a relation with plants which cannot be verified within the same epistemological frame, I'm referring to science, and uh, it therefore escapes its control. So it's important that we understand that the robot here was not an, um, standing in for um, a sort of an emancipated entity, but rather a prosthesis that could possibly, um, with as, as little constraints as possible, um, enter plant time and play with the plants. And this is ontological play. So it's not about a game. It's about um, uh, curiosity and expression of freedom and this potential to uh, yeah, manifest, and I'll say something a bit controversial, the joy of life. A play is interesting because uh, it is very hard to um, define it for uh, sometimes even within you know, the human species, let alone interspecies encounters. And we have learned to recognize it in cats and dogs. But uh, even when it comes to fish or maybe insects, it's hard for us to actually grant uh, those beings the, the capacity of being um, playful. And so my, my point of departure is that all living organisms must play because it's sort of um, a necessary condition for life. Therefore, plants play as well. Where they play and how they play is something that yeah, it's impossible actually to, to define. And this uh, indeterminacy is precisely what I want to tap into. So even recognizing play lies in the eye of the um, beholder, right? Okay, so the proposal is that should we succeed in breaking through the utilitarian hedonic calculus to grow this plant machine? There's also hope that the algorithms won't remain the generalizing, subsuming utensils of governance and power that they today appear to be. Um, so the challenge here was not to use just uh, immediately one of the off-the-shelf off um, AIs, but rather spend, uh, we spent like two or three years developing something with uh, the programmers and specialists for neural networks and machine vision to try to design an AI that would not presume to know what plant play is, that would not have a strict definition of a game. It was incredibly hard and I would say that less than it being actually successful, it was very revealing as to how uh, this uh, bespoke AI actually performs its magic, right? When it comes down to the nuts and bolts, you see it as very utilitarian, very goal-oriented. And I think the magic is lost, which is, I think, also uh, sort of the point of uh, lay people like myself engaging with this technology to become um, more aware of how it actually operates, what its limitations are, but also its potential uses. So we ended up choosing a very simple algorithm, an autoencoder for those of you that um, probably that know what it is, you will say it's not even AI. But I would say that actually the point of this uh, was really to not create such a sophisticated AI, but rather introduce this as a potential drive towards making um, AI robots towards making these machines. Uh, so this is actually a, a picture of what the AI a robot looks like. Uh, we see this 36 um, tendrils of the machine that end with bouncy balls to remind us that it is our desire that makes this machine. Um, and the cucumbers below and there's a scanner uh, that scans in 3D the, the plants, um, and then the AI decides how uh, to approach them. And this is a little bit of a time lapse where we can see the AI um, and plants in action, uh, sort of like moving slowly. When you approach the, the machine, the, it doesn't really look like much is going on. But then there is also a live-generated uh, time-lapse 
uh, which also captures us uh, zapping by while the, the plants and the um, machine play. So I would like to uh, also read a quote from philosopher Agnieszka Wolochko that wrote a text to accompany this installation. And uh, she says, in play, we multiply through laughter as an expression of transformation happening before identification and categorization is even conceivable. In play, we are unmade and making, we are queer and queering identities and individuations. We resist autonomy by becoming contaminated by each other. We are affirming the process of becoming. And so this is the end of quotes. By playing with machines, we become a little more calculable, a little less deterministic, a little more plant-like, a little stranger and a little less estranged from our digital spawn. And I would like to finish the presentation here. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful work. I am very, very impressed with this. Um, and um, this interaction, machine and plant, is a beautiful. And uh, even the, the uh, definition of uh, the erotic, as in like something that exists, as opposed to how we feel about it, it's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Spella. So, um, let me, let's continue for the interest of time. Uh, Joe, um, our next one is Joe Wei, who is a curator and researcher, and she's also founder of Pan Bio Art Studio, PBS. Wei is currently a researcher, researcher of art, science, and um, and uh, 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 technology, AST, and the Center uh, uh, Central Academy of Fine Arts in. Uh, uh, Beijing Kafa. So, uh, um, Joey, are you uh, Nishi uh, Shanghai? Are you in Shanghai now? Uh, I'm currently in Beijing. It's oh, like okay, okay. also okay, you're, you're, you're semi. Lucky. semi <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, I think it's so semi. You were not in Shanghai and then you went to Beijing. I hope not. Yeah. So because we're all we're all hoping here that. Everybody who wants to live, the only people who don't live is the one who live in Shanghai because they assume that if they go there, they're going to get luck there. So it'll be like two times a lockdown. <laughs> About lockdown um, yeah. Anyway, so um, I know uh, uh, Jay, uh, Joe away from a previous, uh, uh, so we are familiar with each other. Um, so she is going to speak in Chinese. So I would uh, tell everybody... Uh, especially the audience, the, uh, the, the speakers, to switch to the uh, interpretation, right? Because you're going to speak in, in, in Chinese, right? Yes. Yeah, consider uh, most audience uh, Chinese, so I will speak in Chinese this time. Okay. <laughs> Please, go ahead. You have the screen. Ah. Okay. So, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. So, uh, I will begin. Can you hear me? 好, 大家能够听到魏影的声音吗? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear uh, you. Uh, 很荣幸能够接受爱场这个人工智能艺术中心和同济设计创意学院的邀请。因为考虑到论坛这次大部分的听众都是中国听众 about the radical gene. Well, for most of the speakers, they talk about machine, radical gene and hidden nature. So that is why in my presentation, I am going to talk about biomedia and I am going to use biomedia itself to explain artificiality because I think artificiality is not just about machine, but also about the bio. So start, I am going to talk about Nobel Prize 
If you pay attention for the winner of 2020 Nobel Prize, actually the winners of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to two women scientists. One was for the gene editing technology. I think you are familiar with the editing technology. Well, you may pay attention to the prize itself, but maybe some of you you do not know the meaning of. The medal. Well, if you look at the medal, and if you look at it closely, and you can see two figures standing side by side on the medal. On the left, the lady names Isis. Well, as you can see the English I S I S Isis, and on the right hand side is the genius of science. As a matter of fact, it is the symbol of the our greatest scientists who have won the Nobel Prize, and we know the relationship of the scientists, the genius of science. The genius of science actually who unveil the veil of the goddess. So we need to think about the relationship of the science and the nature. Is it a very simple the veil and the unveil relationship, or if we can win or、um, we are be conquered? Is this kind of relationship? So we are we begin to think about it. So here you can see a book. And in this book, this is about a French writer Pierre Hardot. And from this book, this is about from a very Westernized idea, from Prometheus idea. Well, for people who have the right to conquer the nature and to dominate the nature, and this is the right given by the god. But on the other hand, if we know another is about the. Another authentic way, and this is the way is what we call the authentic attitude, which holds that this is a better way. We know our nature from the nature way. Nature way. So this is the attitude by a lot of philosophers and、uh, artists, and this is the two attitudes we hold towards nature. A lot of scientists, when they discuss nature, and they may they talk about their worry about. If we treat nature as a kind of、uh, mechanical world, so if we talk about the death of nature, like Heidegger in her writing, and she also mentioned Heidegger in his writing, and he mentioned about when we have the modern technology, when te modern technology is popular. So if we take everything as tools, and we're able to use those tools to exploit our nature, so here we can see the term the death of nature. We need to think about it. What is nature, and why does it even die? So here, I'd like to talk about the two words, artificial and nature. These two terms are important terms for our conference. If you look at the contrast of comparison of the two terms, and when we talk about artificial, actually, it's none come from artifact. It contains the root with the word art. And if we read the meaning of nature, well, it means made by human work or arts, not by nature. So, as a matter of fact, it is on the opposite side of nature. This is、um, none or、um, adjective none. So, if we talk about the nature, well, we need to know the change of the meaning. Well, the meaning of nature. On the other hand. It encompasses the changes in history of science and philosophy. Well, I also need to think about: the, is this a change of the universe? Well, I like to express this in a very concise way. I know, as a matter of fact, it is not very concise. But I hope I can elaborate these ideas step by step. In great times, nature was seen as a living and intelligent. Like a giant creature, this creature has a soul or life of its own. Well, this is people's idea in ancient Greek times, but in the Renaissance, on the other hand, because of the、uh, because of the revolution on the science, just like Heidegger, like his critic, this is based on the Christian idea of creation and an all-powerful God. So, for the nature, the nature is not an organism, just like ancient Greek people. They are thinking about nature. So, it's just about、uh, development of the technology. So, here, nature was no longer an organism, but a machine. This time, when we talk about the nature, it's now in the third age, and it will be more complex narrative and description of nature. So、this is from the broad sense. What is the relationship between the human beings and nature, and the evolution of the meaning and the notion of nature? 
Here, I'd like to elaborate more from the biology perspective. How do we understand the relationship between the nature and artificial? So here on this slide, if you look at hidden nature before the 1900, before the 1900, before that time of period, we don't think biology as a discipline. Well, just like Fu mentioned, like Foucault argued that it's just like a nature of history, or it's just like a kind of witch art. So it's like a hybrid. Of the discipline, so it was not until 1900 when we have the genetics. So starting from 1900, biology has become a kind of discipline. Well, it takes a long time to do the self transformation. Well, it's very important in 1953. I think you all familiar with 1953. In this year, people detected a DNA double helix. From then on, we. Began to understand the materiality of the biology. Well, it's a kind of、um, that manipulate life artificially, so that people started from the four bases of this biology. So it's starting from 1953. Well, another timeline was the year 2000. If we talk about synthetic biology, we're all familiar with synthetic biology. As a matter of fact, this is a contemporary concept. It's a very young discipline. Later, I will brave this discipline. Well, for the synthetic biology, because of synthetic biology, so it's easier for human beings to manipulate of the life. So that is why I think the year two thousand is a very important year, which was the beginning of contemporary synthetic biology. Well, another year is twenty twenty. Twenty twelve. Well, we know the gene editing technology. Well, in the twenty twelve, we know CRISPR Cas nine was born, and in twenty twelve, well, the inventor who was born, who was given the Nobel Prize. So as you can see, it takes a very longer time for us to detect the technology and to acquire those technology. Maybe now with the new technology, within eight years, we're able to win the prize. Here, we need to think about a lot of、um, for the artificial manipulating on the life, and also there are a lot of discussion regarding to the ethnic. Perspective and a materialized perspective. So here we need to talk about 2020. 2020 was very close to us. So I think we have a lot of things to discuss. In 2020, there was COVID-19, and also there was、um, biopolitics. For the biopolitics, we can discuss further biopolitics because it is about our everyday life. On the other hand, we talked about the 2020. 2020. Was given the award to the scientist who did gene editing. So here I give you a slide. From this slide, you are able to understand my topic, and you are able to understand what the nature and artificiality. So how can these two they accelerate very fast, and they have become part of our daily life? In order to give a better illustration on the artistic. Presentation of this imaginative confrontation between artificial and the nature. So I will use one of my exhibition in 2019 as an example, so that you are able to understand the relationship between artificial and nature. So the exhibition is called Quasi Nature. You can read English on my slide. Quasi Nature, which was giving、um, thinking about the relationship between the nature and the human beings. I've invited. Artist workers from eleven countries, and the exhibition was held in Beijing. Well, the title of the exhibition was "Quasi Nature," which essentially、uh, inspired by the quasi object proposed by Michel Cies and Bruno Latour. Well, here, as you can see, as he originally came from a book by Cies. Well, for the quasi nature for this book, he given the term quasi nature. Well, here, as you can see, for the Something you can read it as a subject and object. I always believe that object and subject can be transferred to each other. So that's why doing the exhibition and thinking that when we are facing the nature, are we the subject or is it the subject? When we are facing it, whether should we consider it as something with 
intelligence, just the same as we are, as the uh, Industrial Revolution says, it is something that we exploit from. It is just an object. We just extract from it, extract uh, resources from it. So that's why we, I call my exhibition Causey Nature. And there is a quote from Thomas Berry, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of, of objects. So that is related to our uh, non-human centralism. When we look at uh, nature, when we look at other beings, we are looking at them as if they are objects. But actually, these beings are also subjects. They are equal to us. And that is uh, regards how we uh, behave when we are communicating with other beings. So this uh, exhibition is divided into three parts, which I won't uh, elaborate, but I divide it into three parts. The first part, the exhibition is based on bio art as my uh, case. The first part, talk about three important bio artists as case study, talk about the uh, how they look at uh, artificial and uh, nature. They are all uh, European artists. And the second part has selected several young Asian artists. And the third part is a research project, which I won't uh, elaborate. So in this thinking framework, when I was inviting artists, the three European artists, actually, they are all believers of uh, Christianity. I could see their monotheism uh, in their thinking background and how they are uh, transforming other beings. But the three Asian artists, including China, Singapore, and Korea, they have a more diversified worldview. Uh, not not only a world creating by created by a god, but also atheism and uh, 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 agnosticism. So uh, they would uh, hold a more meditative uh, approach, and uh, their approach is more neutral. And uh, compared to those implementing technologies, they have more meditation and critique. And I would come to more details when I uh, increase them, introduce them. First, Eduardo Kark cuts. So this uh, uh, lumin luminescent green bonnet. So this is a actually a molecular uh, protein technology. It actually comes from uh, algae, which would uh, be uh, fluorescent in the night. So a Japanese uh, scientist found this gene and transplanted onto a rabbit. So it is a trans, uh, trans gene or uh, trans species uh, operation and cuts another work is natural history in the enigma, which is even more exaggerated. He has, we could see on the left hand side, he has uh, found something from his own blood cell, extracted some human gene and transplanted onto a flower. So you could see the flower on the right, it has uh, crossed the boundary between uh, vegeta vegetation and human. It has genes from a plant and gene from a human being. It is a kind of a conceptual art with an artist's effort to break the boundary between plant and human beings. This is the first artist I want to introduce who want to break this boundary between human and nature. And the second artist, 
is a combination tissue, culture, and art projects that come from Australia. One of their most famous work is called uh, Victimless Leather. So they have um, invented this idea of uh, using cells as the medium of their work and let it grow into leather. So this leather jacket you can see comes from a, a cell from an animal, but you don't need to kill that animal. So the key word here is semi-living. He thought that even if we are using life's physical uh, carrier, a cell, but we haven't really, uh, it's not really life itself. It is semi-living, between living and non-living. And uh, in the meanwhile, it has triggered a number of discussions regarding such a being. Do we need to take care of them? Is it related about the objectification of uh, living beings? And this semi-living thing, will it disrupt our own belief system, also our understanding of life and death? So uh, there are also uh, trying to cross this boundary between man-made and nature. And the third is Mata the Minutes. So uh, we have invited them into China. So Mata, later he recently came to China. His uh, work has used gene editing technology. I won't elaborate. So the interesting thing here is that in the process of creation is discussed this uh, difference and relationship between natural and artificial. So uh, to consider the hierarchical relationship between natural and artificial, or is it overlapping? So the similarity between these three artists, they have created a new species and they want to modify other species. So this really is regarding different uh, philosophical and religious view of the world. So it's really like a radical gene, uh, genetic uh, narrative. And the second part includes a number of uh, young Asian artists. I'll just talk about two of them. The first one is from uh, Singapore. His name is Robert. And he has a very interesting work it is an artist's book, it's called A Guide to the Flora and Fauna of the World, talking about 55 stories. And each book is a speculative uh, photography, which doesn't need to be a real photo. It's uh, based on a brief narrative and to relate the story of the photo. The first story is about the uh, goldfish cream. So goldfish is something Chinese people have invented. Back then, there wasn't any idea of gene, but it's just through uh, filtering, generation after generation. And we found a lot of uh, different varieties of goldfish. But then in the 1990s, there is a uh, global goldfish uh, uh, queen uh, competition. So we were trying to decide what is the most beautiful uh, among a, a species kind of selected or invented by human beings. So this is very interesting. It relates to this kind of tension between artificial and natural. The second is Lin Peiying. She's very... Uh, the, uh, she has a way of anticipating the future. It's called the love of virus before the COVID-19. So actually, this is our uh, uh, installation view. You can see that um, it's put a sci-fi novel regarding virus on the wall in 2088. And in this time, the human beings have already subdued all the uh, most dangerous virus existing in the 20th century, including 
Ebola and many other uh, really uh, deadly uh, virus. So people are still are begin to use them to like as if they're using yogurts to help people to enrich people's health. So they used a very uh, traditional way of compiling dictionaries. They have uh, uh, th there's a published book. Uh, there is actually a lexicon of the over 5,000 species of uh, bacteria or virus. So this dictionary or lexicon is really traditional. So the virus keep mutating and human beings invented a dictionary to record them. This is really like a, a Sisyphus uh, effort. You can never catch up with the development and the mutation of virus. So back then, we did not anticipate COVID-19, but it really took place. So I think the second part relates other artists since we don't have that time. So I think in this second part, we realize that uh, it's really a kind of uh, meditation and a critique. They're not really inventing or uh, modifying other species. They include a more diversified worldview. And the next part about the uh, between artificial and natural, there is uh, ethics. So actually, one of the curators mentioned that artificial intelligence has an aspect of uh, ethics. I think uh, biology has similar issues. In 2019, in Central Academy of Fine Arts, we had a forum discussing uh, the issue of uh, genetic editing about bioethics. Actually, uh, genetic editing, people maybe haven't really realized that its importance. For example, uh, PCR has received a Nobel Prize in 1993. It's really like control plus C, but CRISPR-Cas9 is really control X and then control V. So we have a very dangerous uh, or risky closed loop. We could really um, copy and paste a gene as if we are copy and pasting codes. So now we haven't really seen the uh, ramification of such a technology, but actually it only took eight years for it to develop, to receive the uh, Nobel Prize. So I think it won't really took a long time for it to enter our daily life. So if we are really discussing about uh, the biological ethics, so with my power, I uh, collected these panelists. So two of them are scientists. They are the top scientists uh, uh, doing uh, genetic editing. One is from Peking University, talking about a uh, brief introduction of uh, genetic editing. And the second one coming from CAS, and this person is nowadays, actually, uh, Genomi Editing has invited many international scientists to join. Uh, there are members from China and UK and others. So he's one of the Chinese representatives. So he's really participated in the international governance of Genomi Editing. So he talked about the uh, gene-edited babies so what went wrong and what could go wrong? And uh, if we really want to discuss about a biological ethics problem, first of all, we need to know the fundamentals of it. What is its fundamental logics? Uh, we have two scientists. And in the second part, I inv invited some hum humanity scholars. One is from... Uh, uh, Kass, uh, who participated in the uh, bio biological uh, uh, relative uh, forming, who compared different countries' legislation about uh, genome editing, and whether some some country would put people to prison but won't find the money. 
Well, for some countries, because they against the law of ethics, maybe they will have a very serious penalty. So I asked uh, his opinion about uh, what his opinion on the future legal system for the China gene editing. And the other expert from SDS, science technology studies. Well, I asked this scholar and uh, I interviewed him about the biology, technology, the social governance history, because when we face this kind of technology, we feel very worrisome and we don't know what to do with it. But if you are an expert and if you know the biolo biological governance, you know, this is not a new idea because we used to have a two baby, we have a clone uh, animals. So back then, how people had a conference to solve the to solve those kind of confrontation. There was no new things under the sunshine. So we need to take the reference back to our history to solve the issue. So I feel very lucky. I am able to invite experts. They are intervening in the legal and um, the, the legislation of China biology governance. Now the third expert is the artist. I also want to discuss from uh, besides the practical field. I also want to uh, talk about something relating to arts. I am a curator and uh, I want to talk from the historian perspective. So in the future, how can we use Jing as a kind of media? So we need to know the history of art and what we need to pay attention to. Just like pa Marta, she comes from Portuguese. Well, I invited her from Portuguese to China as an artist. I invited her and I interviewed her from a traditional like a sculpture artist, and then she has become an artist who show her concern on the biology agent. So as you can see from identity of artist, she show her concern, where do we come from? Who are we? Where we are going to be? So I feel very lucky for this conference, for this forum, we are going to publish the contents of this event, the forum. So I also think about the importance of the philosophy. That's why we invite two philosophers. One comes from the biology philosophy. Well, I asked him or her to discuss gene as a very important content in the biology philosophy. What is the importance? And the other expert, the philosopher, well, who is very famous in studying the medieval history, so philosophy. So we invited him to talk about the dignity of human beings. So it's just, a, it was our minimum idea, but finally we held a conference, we organized a conference, a forum, and we feel very lucky that we invited experts who have a very close connection with China. And finally, we had something to publish and with the philosophy inside, this is what kind of um, idea and thinking, what is the boundary between the artificiality and human needs? And for our artists, we do not only discuss about the creation and we need to think a lot of things. Last but not least, finally, for the interest of time, I'd like to talk about, lay some foundation for the synthetic aesthetics. So, this is what I am translating now, but I want to talk about the synthetic biology. For the synthetic aesthetics, this is a, a crossover book. And for one of the interest, interesting, the work of the synthetic aesthetics is about the history of synthetic aesthetics. So when we know ring line, and actually he offered the proxy. So if we look at the tree of life, the tree of life, is always changing. So in the future, there will be a new world, synthetic gene. So for all biology here, those biology are all from the synthetic technology. So this is something from the future. I don't think this is early work. I think this is the reality. Well, another thing very interesting in his work is for the synthetic kingdom and the relationship between the synthetic kingdom and nature. In his book, and he said that for the synthetic nature is very large, or whether it will be oversized and recover the nature, or it will be dispersed in every stage of the nature, or the number, the amount is very small. So it has to rely on the nature to survive. So we need to think about it. 
And if we think about in nature, we need to think about those questions. So I need to come back to all the exhibitions like the um, G, um, GIF, the bonnet. But for the GFP, GFP technology was awarded Nobel Prize in 2008. But as you can see, the three scientists here who have been won the Nobel Prizes because they detected GFP and they modified the GFP. That's why they were awarded the Nobel Prize. When they delivered a speech of the GFP, when they delivered their speech during the award-winning ceremony and they take a reference of the GFP rabbit and GFP bonnet to illustrate G the GFP technology. Well, if you look at the symbol of the image, well, this is a green bonnet, which can represent the GFP. So if we talk about the relationship of the art technology, well, it's just like a wrong and they can be co-work together, they can understand together and they can support each other finally to have a win-win result. So it can reflect the, all the factors come from the humanity, from the social perspective. So they are intertwined. So if we talk about the nature, gene, and for this story, the story will be continually to written, to be written. So I think this is the hidden nature and the gene relationship. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. That is uh, very, very interesting. And uh, uh, key word being that semi, quasi, hybrid, the in between, the thing where the human. And uh, but again, what's interesting about what you're saying, and you started in the beginning with the word uh, uh, Tiaran versus yeah. Rengong, right? Which yeah. is very interesting because in Chinese it's a little bit different from the uh, um, English version yeah. because um, yeah. the word Tianran means correct, uh, Ran is correct, and uh, Tian is the sky, so it's like the universe, the correct universe, it's nature. In a kind of like a Chinese, again, I'm talking about the Chinese um, 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 version of it. Uh, the word natural is more related to the physical reality of things, but there is nothing ethical about uh, the uh, uh, natural thing. But in the Chinese version, there is the idea of correct, or well, as if it's something that is perfect, if you like. And I think it's very interesting because uh, we are looking into a different, uh, I mean, this conference here, as we are, in another country, I mean, I'm being Greek in China, um, and you being um, in uh, um, in this uh, uh, dealing with uh, Western people while you being Chinese, it's a very interesting kind of like interaction because uh, we get to see how we understand these concepts through the language that we use, which is very very important because the language itself is a system; it's a thing. I mean, it's not really. A, it could be seen as a noun where we use the language to communicate and blah, 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 blah. But there's also the idea of the language being something that is a, a, a noun. It's a thing on its own, has its own logic. And sometimes it makes us make mistakes when we say something and we don't mean it, or if we make an accident or a, a slip of tongue, whatever these things are, are very, very interesting because they kind of take us to the other side, to the side that we don't know, the alien part of our mind, where we don't have control over the things. And that's exactly the whole point of this um, conference, if you like, this um, um, talk. And again, we're, we're, we're moving now into the panel discussion. I'd like to you know, put the questions that I will have I would like to, to make, it's not really questions, but it's more like comments, if you like, that I would like you to give some feedback upon. And the main, main idea behind this is to abandon the anthropocentric um, 
view where we are the ones who decide about what's happening in the world. We are the ones who not only decide, but we interpret and we um, uh, create things. And then we talk about these things. That is okay, but it's not the point. The whole, the whole um, 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 idea of uh, introducing the quantum is to destroy that certainty, the certainty of the common sense, which we use at the very end to always um, um, defend our logic, like, oh, you make no sense. And that is the, 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 the base that we all use as our conversation with one another, because that's what we, we, we can. But the quantum says exactly the opposite. And that's what um, uh, Filippo was talking in the morning about the coin that is crooked. So in other words, you expect that something is going to be make sense. It's going to be 50-50 because that's what sense says. That's what nature says. That's what experience says. That's what we all know. That's what common consensus says. And yet it doesn't happen. And yet we have particles that exist and don't exist at the same time. Things that make no sense whatsoever. And we have to make sense out of this idea of no, no sense. And this is exactly the question that I want to, or the, uh, I mean, the, 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 um, what's the word, the enlightenment that I want you to give to me, because I'm very interested in this idea of the uh, nonsense, the idea that things don't make any sense, and yet there's a logic inside of it. Um, I will give you, I'll offer you some uh, uh, um, kind of hints on that. And again, I'll take it from your own conversations. I mean, we talked about the idea of the non-human, right? What does it mean to be non-human? We have human, and then you negate it. So you have the non-human. Yeah, but what does it mean to be non-human? Is this everything else, excluding the human, or is it something that is non-human understandable? In other words, human as in like, I don't know this thing because it doesn't look familiar in the sense that I understand what a human is. And uh, um, Adrian used the word uh, um, dream, which is again, we don't know what a dream is. We don't have any control of it. It's just coming to us and we think and use the word quantum randomness at some point, which is also a very interesting word because it's basically introducing randomness, which we already know that we don't know what it is, but it makes it even more complicated because it becomes quantum on top of not understandable. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, Spella brought the word erotic. And again, the erotic is what I understood it as objective erotic. It's like the thing we say, like, I fall in love with something. Like, it made me do something that I didn't want to do in the sense that I overcame. It made no sense to me to fall in love with that person. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet I did it. So what I'm trying to bring up here is to investigate is this idea of the non-human. Again, not the sense of the absurd and the uh, make no sense in the kind of like uh, um, um, crazy, uh, but in the one that the sense of the nonsense. In other words, is there any logic behind certain things like randomness, like a mistake, like an accident, like a glitch? What is a glitch anyway? And why is that something that we... Um, need to be aware of because it may be a message coming from another world, the world of what we say nonsense, the world of the non-common sense. So uh, I'll ask a, a general question here, and this is actually coming from the audience, that the question is, is randomness and uncertainty the conditions of imagination? Again, in the context of what I just said, I'd like to see if you have any comments on uh, how does randomness actually contribute towards imagination? But not from a point of view that I was inspired. Then it becomes you. Then it becomes anthropocentric. But how? what is the things outside of you that actually produced imagination? That's the question that I have. And I'm sorry I'm, I'm talking too much, but I'm opening to you. Uh, perhaps I can uh, say some comments from sure. the previous thinker, uh, speakers uh, uh, to um, Andrian, because uh, 
he mentioned the data. And uh, I think last time, uh, Costa, we, we had a talk that you have a manifesto about the data and the data or something. And I think- New it, data. This, yeah, exactly yeah. what you can like expand. And uh, uh, I noticed uh, uh, the, the word randomness, of course, uh, it's quite important in the data movements. And uh, uh, we can find this uh, similar, uh, similarity between um, uh, uh, the, uh, the data and also some uh, to some programs because um, it it can trigger some uh, as Andrew mentioned un unpredictable uh, things and it it's similar to like uh, I think misle misreading or some errors sometimes you consider it as something wrong, but actually it can trigger more uh, imaginations and uh, um, creativities. So that's, I, I can like trigger our maybe conversation on the um, creativity and the randomness. And also uh, I have some uh, feedback on um, um, Joanna's talk because I, I find um, her um, presentation, there's one sentence like, uh, creativity as non-functional uh, access. And uh, because we usually consider AI as a useful tool, but uh, when you like combine a AI and a creativity, you have to trigger its, um, how to say uselessness. So it's kind of an interesting balance. Maybe we can also talk more on that. This is some mm -hmm. uh, comments from uh, the previous um, pre presentations. So. Okay, so maybe I can thank you for this. Maybe I can take take this up quickly to respond to both Joe and Costas about the human, non-human, and how this relates to, to AI. So it's interesting that Costa said that he understands the human. Like I don't <laughs> purport to do that. I actually am still quite bemused about the human, but what I'm trying to do with the concept of the non-human is work through less of an opposition and more towards um, discovering some kind of um, unknowingness, if you like, around the human. So going beyond the humanist definition and conceptualization of the human as this be being that is transparent to itself, that is in possession, in possession of their own language and rationality, and to think about, and this is what I mean by seeing the non-human as part of the human. So it's a way of... Um, kind of alienating the human or recognizing the human for the alien that the human is, if you like, and through, and the reason for doing this is not just some kind of philosophical or creative exercise, but I think that kind of defamiliarization of the human could then lead, I think, to um, developing both better philosophies of technology, including AI, and better sociopolitical frameworks. It's also, in another way, it's a way of cutting the human to size or shrinking some of the humanist fantasies about our own self-possession, mastery, and rationality. So that, in a way, ties in with your idea of identifying nonsense in the sense of the human, recognizing the glitchiness of human beings, the fact that there is always like another logic, another kind of uh, the system that unworks itself, that can't be perhaps fully controlled, uh, not through some kind of you know God-given faculties, but through because of the of the certain um, maybe embedded bug if you like, within that system. And because both as a philosopher, as an artist, I'm interested in those bugs within the human system and how we can work with them. So then on human, the idea of that creativity as excess that Joe hinted at, for me, it's a way of trying to think about uh, beyond the kind of instrumentality on optimization. Very often the language around AI is the language of optimization. While well, we've got humans, but AI will be like a human, but we'll do this better and we'll do faster. And even around art, I mean, I've sat in a number of panels where people still apply a certain particular engineering mindset where you can do this and AI can also do it, but faster, quicker, or can deceive you because it will paint something and you will not know. 
And for me, that's not really the point of the, the cultural practice that we humans have defined as art. I mean, machines might do their own art. They might do all sorts of things we are completely unaware of and don't understand, have the capacity, the skills to do that. But for a particular human practice through history and culture that you know, has particular meanings for us, that sense of creativity as this uh, um, a kind of excess beyond instrumentality, doing something that is perhaps not needed, not necessary, and that also can go beyond that language of evolution as adaptation that I was talking about. So it's excess beyond both optimization of engineering and adaptation of biology. And I think I'll stop here, thank you. Adrian. Yes, maybe uh, Dada was mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually quite. Uh, huh? I'm quite That's surprised very the way that I'm. Uh, you know, I'm only in the field of AI since like a very short time, but there's a lot of things that relate to to what I know for like 15 years uh, with Dada, and of course, there's uh, the great idea of nonsense. There's a very nice book by Ilias who wrote like at one point he kind of explains his the joy of nonsense so there's a lot of i mean a lot of things in our world today and 100 years ago 500 years ago whatever they don't really make any sense so the only way of actually engaging into it is by just enjoying the total beauty of uh, of nonsense so that's maybe a little bit of a an anarchist and dadaist um, idea and also the, the term of like uselessness, like you hinted a little bit towards this, uh, Joanna, um, was also a way of uh, back then they would, they would talk that we are all kind of chained and uh, shackled to a, an economic fatalism that gives us our character and our roles. And the only way uh, was the idea of, of being totally useless and un unproductive. And that's why you have a lot of, ideas of, of nothingness. Um, so Dada means nothing in the sense of uh, a, a, a valid way of kind of resistance against this capitalist um, productivity would be to just do nothing. And it's quite surprising now in the pandemic, uh, at least in privileged places like Switzerland, where you would see that just for two weeks, if we stop doing the things we do, um, then the economy almost collapses, you know, so it's kind of surprising that, uh, that this, this system is so fragile, actually, although it's so um, powerful. Um, but I think the, the relation between randomness and imagination, I think it's quite a, a difficult task, so to say. I mean, the, the idea of randomness, uh, of true randomness, is very difficult to understand. Uh, I think there's this relation to, to quantum physics and quantum indeterminacy where, where you have a true randomness because it's really unpredictable. But any other kind of randomness, like, like the artists used, uh, like Hans Arp, for example, of course, he would throw his forms, but then still arrange it a little bit. So there's still the subject in it, although they always had a very strong drive to, to get rid of the genius, creativity, uh, the author, um, the artist, and so on. So for me, trying to imagine what true randomness is, is a great trigger of uh, imagination in that sense. No? And maybe that's like a, a blind spot, like uh, Yukui mentioned in his talk, where we have this Einbildungskraft that is kind of um, how to try, tr trying to yearning towards this um, open field of true randomness. Yeah, so even in dialogue, there's a lot of randomness. You know? It's like quite mm -hmm. often we don't really understand what we're talking about. So it's more kind of alineating certain uh, intuitions, tendencies, um, grabbing some words from a dialogue and, and, and uh, associating to it. So yeah, it's a great time of randomness and the joy of nonsense. Long awaited, long overdue. I would say. Spella. Yeah. Um, so I guess I will add um, something that doesn't directly um, address uh, randomness, uh, but um, just to uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, where I'm coming from. So um, through the, the work that I've been doing, I've really 
been coming slowly to terms with the um, epistemologies and uh, ontologies and ethics um, that are served to our societies through techno science, right? So a lot of these questions that we're asking that end up uh, defining um, our anthropocentrism come from a specific uh, way of understanding the world. So uh, in this sense, uh, the way that I'm approaching uh, the machinic is through, uh, as, a, as a result of this particular uh, worldview, this particular framework, right? So I would say that in that sense, when I introduce the vegetarian, I'm sort of uh, putting us as humans on the same side as plants. And then the relation to the machinic, which is not and technological, uh, which is again, a particular expression and ordering of the world, right? So in that way, I'm not addressing um, uh, some absolute truths, but more like a historical comeuppance, right? This is how, the relations are constructed. And in that sense, uh, the vegetarian already for me serves as a sort of, like uh, Joanna mentioned, as a defamiliarization with the role of the human, right? And um, this was also a question of, from the Q&A, and like, who is the protagonist of the plant uh, in the plant machine? Is it people or plants? And I would say, well, the, the protagonist is this vegetarian that can be a person or it can be a plant in relation uh, to these uh, technologies of digitization, which follow particular rules, right? And um, so um, I love this uh, phrase, non-common sense, because it's, it's literally, um, proposing, uh, well, okay, maybe not in its dialectic, like the anti, right? So human, non-human sense, non-common sense or nonsense. Um, not that I, I mean, what I'm trying to say is it's not like one or the other, but the fact that there, this deep uh, questioning of what is taken as common sense is I think a practice that is uh, absolutely pertinent at this point in time, not questioning so much the technology, its creativity, its limits of um, uh, yeah, being within the framework of techno science, but rather imagining uh, the relations otherwise. So how do you create a different common sense for this relation. And in that sense, you're also, while you're, you're really um, asking yourself about the ontologies and the epistemologies of technoscience, you're also um, uh, putting under question uh, this status quo within which uh, they exist, right? So, so you're opening up the possibility for a different type of, uh, of their use, right? And if this might be by um, evoking um, a creativity or uh, nonsense or absurdism, randomness or whatever, but I think it's, it's more like the, the aim of, um, it's used for, with the aim of questioning um, the uh, use, which is, yeah, it, it's utilitarian, it's pragmatic, it's, uh, it follows a certain optimization, right? But um, the, the reasoning behind it is uh, that which, which can be questioned. And this is, I will just, uh, to illustrate this, uh, actually um, share a really beautiful example that comes from agriculture, right? So on one hand, we are uh, seeing these amazing um, uh, high-tech um, applications where uh, it's called precision agriculture and uh, big companies are developing it like John Deere. They're having this these amazing uh, combined harvesters and sprayers that are, have sensors everywhere. They're autonomously driven vehicles with optimized ways of like traveling back and forth and do the spot treatment, right, of, of the fields. Um, 
And on the other hand, you have uh, efforts like permaculture or regenerative farming or agroecology, where everything is done manually, supposedly, because that's the way to do it. But the, the fact is, if we want to change the common sense from this kind of destructive monocultural plantation or scene orientation to this uh, more perma permaculture um, regenerative farming way of thinking, automation has to become a part of that as well, right? Because the labor intensity is just, yeah, it does, the, the calculation isn't there because you need, um, let's say six to eight hours with heavy uh, mechanization and 2000 hours to work for a crop with just like moderate mechanization. The, the, the issue is, it's not that the technology wouldn't be useful for a sort of permacultural approach. It's just that the technology that is actually being developed is only within the logic of monoculture and extractivism, right? So, so a new common sense must be developed. It's not necessary, from my perspective, it's not only about a discussion of uh, what uh, advanced automation and AI brings to the table, but what is the common sense for its use? And, and that's sort of like where I, I find um, this kind of creativity, imagination, subversion, over-identification, all really uh, valid and effective tools um, that, yeah, just broaden uh, the possibility, the scope of possibilities. And sorry if I was a little bit too long. No, no, no. This is very interesting because you actually uh, bring up a very um, uh, nice, I mean, the, the, the idea of the autonomous, the physical autonomy is okay. We're just living with it. I mean, things do have an ability to make decisions in the physical world, even like the, the, the driving car and everything. But uh, what is more interesting to me, and that's where it gets even worse, is where the thing, the thing, I mean, the, the, the not the living thing, the things, they have their own philosophy. They start developing their own philosophy. They develop their own aesthetics, which is art that has been created on its own. They develop their own music, which is music developed on its own. And now they're developing a philosophy of themselves. In other words, the GPT-3-4 is actually them telling us a philosophical argument about their philosophy. We're, they're, they're, they're whispering to us something that we don't know. And it's not our philosophy about them. I'm not talking about the philosophy of us about things. I'm talking with the things telling us about themselves, who and what they believe in, which is a very different, strange concept. And I think that's the whole point of this uh, um, conference here is to, to pinpoint that this exists. I mean, um, Joanna brought it in with the GPT-4. She actually said the whole thing was, I interpret it, but the thing, the GPT-3 inspired me. Who is the GPT-3 and how does the GPT-3 inspire you? Who is it? Who are you talking to? And I'm not talking about the author. I'm talking about the actual thing that the idea that came to you. Who made that idea? That is, yeah, that is what, what very, we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. It's just, I mean, it's, it's obviously fascinating considering the possibility of other forms of rationality, other forms of sensation developing in beings that are not human. And these beings mm. could already be in existence. They could be obviously plants that we are now, the more we learn about plants, the more we are aware of forms of agency that they can exercise. Anthony Trowawis's work on plant behavior, I think has been uh, really game changing. Uh, but we can also think about all sorts of hybrids and emergences. Myself, I would be probably wary of calling it that they have a philosophy and then they have all of this because obviously all art, because I'm acknowledging that these are the names that we humans have invented to describe some practices that historically make sense to us and organize our world. Maybe the cognitive uh, and cultural spectrum, if we like, of those other alien uh, beings will be completely different and they'll have different ways of cutting uh, between their practices to give them names and identify them as something. But in terms of, for example, working with GPT-2 and GPT-2 was quite clunky. There are better models now, GPT-3 and then the expanded version of it. So obviously from an art point of view, it is interesting to see it as an experiment and a game, the kind of game that artists did before, as Adrian has given us lots of examples as well from uh, 
pre-AI, although not necessarily pre-technological times, uh, you know, including kind of Dada and other examples, where you bring in other forms of logic, other forms of sensibility, and you can do it through machines, you can do it through drugs, viruses, and all sorts of kind of collaborations, co-inhabitations. So this is what, so what I was kind of looking at and on the one hand, sometimes I think that humans are quite algorithmic as well in their pronouncements, in their discourses. And I don't subscribe to the theory that, you know, we just run on software and that you can map human, you know, the human brain easily into a machine. I don't actually believe in that, even though that assumption lies at the foundation of a lot of AI and, and machine vision. So I'm not there. But on the other hand, as a thought provocation, I'm thinking here with the philosopher Willem Flusser, I am interested in a certain algorithmicity, if you like, of human thought, of how often there is almost some kind of software running on us that surprises us so when we speak, when we work, when we do things. Also, as a certain gesture of repetition that, you know, there is, it seems that code has been cloned. I use it as a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that helps me sometimes understand the weirdness of not just machines, but weirdness of humans. So that encounter was GPT for me for the film and to seeing what it what it does with the images, with the words, through all these different models, was precisely to open myself up more consciously. And so that is a gesture that I undertake as an artist, as a thinker, to experience that weirdness consciously through that kind of uh, experience and seeing what transpires. I could have just thought of this. I wouldn't maybe needed to have got engaged in an experience, but the artifact itself is important because it gives me a certain maybe not aesthetic pleasure, but certain aesthetic bemusement and a set of suspense of my own uh, assumptions as well and kind of knowing, not knowing. So it's also a way of playing, not just by myself, not being fully in control of my own um, act of play, but playing with another, what that another might be able to surprise me. And obviously I don't actually truly believe that GPT-2 has its own intelligence. I think it's a misnomer, but it does something that, you know, uh, it maybe reveals something interesting about the glitchiness of, the, of human intelligence as well. It's a dialogue. The, the human machine dialogue that actually is the GPT is the interpretation that we do. But again, the question is, where does the idea come from? That's the thing. We can interpret as much as we want what comes out of the machine, but we don't know. We don't know where it came from. We cannot exclude it on the basis of our uh, dominance as we made it. We yeah. didn't make it. We discovered I don't believe that our ideas always. come from ourselves either. Our mm -hmm. ideas are always already carried through, through culture, through uh, the environment, through the food that we eat. So uh, I think the machine's idea probably came from, if it's an idea in the philosophical sense, uh, but it always something that looks like an idea to the human. And maybe that's not a relevant question, but maybe our own ideas are also not ours. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I have some uh, also comments because uh, 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 we, we talk about uh, algorithm, but uh, we should notice this term um, was uh, is, is created long before the computer because it's a, a Arabian term and it it uh, it was invented a thousand years ago. So it's also like uh, reflect uh, Janus. Uh, concept that uh, we should chase back to uh, maybe longer history of the Asian wisdom and we can find more. And I, I also find um, that it's interesting to like from Andrew's work to combine AI with a, how to say a Babylonian um, vision or something. So I think we should not only like, um, like combine the AI technology with some contemporary issues, but maybe trace back to uh, more um, comprehensive things. So that's, I think, another thing we can do, yeah. So. Maybe maybe to answer a little bit to this idea of things creating their own philosophy. In a way we could say things always create their own philosophy. So it's like, at the moment we're talking a lot about um, artificial intelligence a couple of years ago it was information and then this kind of informs how we think about 
I don't know, the cosmos or the universe based on consciousness, based on information. Uh, other times, 250 years ago, it was mechanics. So in that sense, um, I think, yeah, things are creating philosophy constantly. Uh, and because we're here in this quantum physics or quantum imagination context, even I, I like to think about this time correlation between the discovery of this old quantum theory and the avant-garde uh, artistic ideas or relativity theory with Einstein uh, being in the same town even back then. So I think there's always this kind of uh, correlation and dialogue between science and things and art and creativity. Um, so in that sense, yes, I would say, yes, things have their own philosophy or maybe the things just trigger a philosophy um, for us. Yeah. And but this the Babylonian vision idea, which is the, this art project by Nora Al-Badri, is, uh, is that it's, a, it's basically a question about the restitution and uh, colonialism. So a lot of these uh, Babylonian artifacts, artifacts from the uh, region of Mesopotamia, which is Iran and Iraq, are in Western European and, and uh, US museums. So what she tried to do is to ask the museums if she could have the data to generate a, a techno heritage, as she says. And of course, the museums uh, refused. So having some good hacker connections, she managed to scrape the data and then create the kind of own uh, techno heritage, which is open for anybody in that sense, maybe more accessible. And, and of course, you're also starting to then, if you're talking about big data and algorithms um, or AI, uh, analyzing this big data, that's also a way of how we can influence uh, the image of our world by creating new images which are not uh, confined to, to these museums. So for, for her, uh, using med like tools like AI is always also a way of, of kind of empowering new uh, knowledges and epistemo epistemologies. So yeah, that's a little bit this kind of, mm -hmm. because we're, it's very funny, all discussions today are very um, based on enlightenment. We even heard about Kant and Leibniz and the Germans and so on, Heidegger even. And somehow it's a very narrow part. You know? it's, we're, we're, very talk, we're talking in a very narrow um, uh, knowledge system. And my hope a little bit in um, working with AI is that we can, uh, because it has this very big uh, social and, and human civilization um, impact, and also the interest in the AI center at the ETH is also to broaden this kind of knowledge system to not just have um, a European perspective and enlightenment perspective, but also try and bring different knowledge systems into forming this AI, whatever it might be. But I think it's it's like a, a hope, which we always have with new technologies, though, that a lot of things will change. AI will solve our human problems. Um, but maybe with this new drive that it has, that it's really kind of, um, how do you say, uh, uh, affecting all systems in, in human society, it, it might yeah, be actually able to, to change our knowledge system uh, more uh, holistically in that sense. Yeah. Mm. Talking of Mesopotamia um, and the primitive thing, I think a, a lot of AI is in the primitive stage. The whole idea of animism, like you think that objects around you are alive. You ask for the future on the tree. The, the blowing of the leaves will tell me the future. Isn't that AI? <laughs> that is the actual, the first type of AI that existed was exactly that. You believe that the water is telling you the future. You believe that the wind is something. It has a life. The light, I said the word earlier about light because the word uh, um, um, what is it? Uh, we were, uh, Yuk, Yuk was talking about the um, uh, um, icon, uh, the icon, the word icon, and the word fantasy, and the word uh, history. They all share the same word, which is the base of the word light, fao, which is the, the, the Greek word. And light is something that is very interesting because it's the way we see, it's something that affects us, and we understand it becomes the beginning of intelligence because of the thing. A thing actually makes us intelligent. The, the thing makes us see. The thing makes us understand, enlighten us, right? But at the same time, the thing 
has its own logic. It works in its own way. It does its own things. And that's why it becomes the dialogue between us and the light or the thing, the, the objects, the animism things are actually the most and most important, in my opinion, uh, form of AI. All this like uh, new technology and GPT and, uh, you know, all this is okay, but it's very technological. And as a matter of fact, it's not even intelligent at the, at the bottom of it. I mean, it's not really, it's more like common sense, really, what they're doing. I mean, if you go into the actual technical part, but if you go into the primitive mind, you find that the AI is much more uh, if like deep and much more uh, uh, philosophical in nature than it is today. Today is more technological. How can I use it to do things? How can I make this to my advantage? But in the past, it was more like a way of taking your soul out of yourself and lending it to the thing that you had in front of you and take that thing and get back to you in a dialogue with nature, with, uh, with the artificial. The artificial was much more approachable than it is today. Anyway, with that being said, and I'm, 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 uh, we're already at uh, 7.20, we're supposed to go out, and I, I don't know if uh, there's any announcement. I think uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I have to uh, bring uh, Sissy. I think Sissy is uh, going to make some announcements for tomorrow. Hello. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, this is Sissy C. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's okay. Like when we uh, left this conversation, I will leave a PowerPoint there so people know tomorrow uh, when we, we were going to start our another session on the clock. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So with that being said, and being in a lockdown that I am right now, and I think Sissy, <laughs> me, yeah, the two of us are in a lockdown, the two uh, different windows. We are like uh, always talking together because we have we want to be more social in this kind of a enclosed environment. But again, it's the best source of inspiration too at the same time, because you are a monk, you're living alone and you're living with your own thoughts in your own environment. And that's actually a very, very good thing. Uh, again, tomorrow I'm going to talk about this exactly what the corona, the, uh, the lockdown has actually done to our little minds, at least in my mind, what it happened to me. So, uh, thank you, everybody. It was very good, uh, very, very interesting. And uh, I, I, I took all my notes here. Uh, I, I love all these arguments. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, um, close this panel and uh, uh, you know renew it for tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, right, is the uh, uh, next mm -hmm. session. Yeah. Tomorrow afternoon at uh, 4 o'clock, we have a second session, the last one of this, of the second Yeah, day. exactly. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers. Bye. Bye.